Part 2. Everyday Life, Pastoral Ministry. 1. Elder Sophroni in Everyday Life. When some people read Elder Sophroni's writings, they perceive him as a great theologian, as he indeed was. But at the same time, they think that he was aloof and inapproachable. The reality, however, was completely different. When you met him, you saw an ascetic whose existence was integrated and whose life was simple and pure. You saw a genuine, authentic human being, free from every kind of passion, insecurity, or conventionality. Father Sofroni had many great experiences, both human and divine, during his life. He was not inclined to write about these matters, but he did so when he had to, when it was necessary. When I read the first edition of Father Sofroni's book about St. Silouan, I conceived the desire to meet him in person. At that time, he was living in England at the monastery of St. John the Baptist in Essex, and I wanted to visit him. He was in his 80s then, but he still was vigorous and strong in spite of the illnesses from which he suffered. He would receive everyone. He conversed with people. He heard confessions, though not many. He celebrated the liturgy every Sunday, and often on Saturday as well. He was writing his last books. He would eat with us in the refectory of the monastery, and he held meetings with the monks. Now and again he would travel to visit other communities at their invitation. He would visit the homes of people he knew in towns nearby, and so on. He was full of life and spread optimism everywhere. That period when I conceived the desire to visit the elder was a difficult one for many reasons, which I shall set out below. Be that as it may, I went to England to meet him for the first time in 1976, 31 years ago. Footnote, the author, Metropolitan, he wrote this, is writing in 2007. To continue, I stayed at the monastery for about a month and a half, and from then on I used to visit the monastery almost every summer for many years. And I was in spiritual communication with the great elder of blessed memory. I shall briefly describe some of the scenes that I experienced from time to time, and which all of us who visited the monastery to meet the elder used to experience. A. Welcome. Everyone who went to the monastery felt that the monks received him, on the elder's orders, as a unique personage. When the elder knew what time his guest would arrive, he would go out to meet him and greet him, or he would send one of the monks to convey his love to the guest and to express his joy that he had made such a long journey to come to see him. He instructed them to look after him as appropriate and to make him feel at home. B. Divine Liturgy. Prayer. The spiritual focal point for the monastery and the elder was the Divine Liturgy and the self-emptying sacrifice that one experiences in it. He would celebrate every Sunday and often on Saturdays as well, or in other days when there was a divine liturgy, he would take Holy Communion. When he celebrated, his whole being, body and soul, was absolutely clenched together like a fist. It was obvious that his noose was focused on his heart. One did not dare look at him, never mind speak to him. His movements were priestly and slow and he blessed the people with full awareness of what he was doing, looking at all those who were present. The intonation and rhythm of his responses was such that the noose could easily follow the words, because when someone sings very quickly or very slowly, the noose is distracted. One felt that the elder was praying with his reason when saying the prayers, but also with his noose, which was in his heart. Often in the Divine Liturgy, he would be completely absorbed, particularly when, during the reading of the epistle, he sat down on a chair for a moment to rest. This was not physical sleep, as he was aware of what was happening in the church. The daily prayer that he had instituted to be held in church, and at which he was often present, took place in an intensely contrite atmosphere 
that inspired to penitence and a sense of the presence of God. For two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening in church, with oil lamps as the only source of light, the prayer to Christ would be said out loud, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. And the prayer to the All-Holy Virgin, Most Holy Mother of God, save us in various languages. The Divine Liturgy and prayer hallowed the entire atmosphere of the monastery and produced the right climate for genuine monastic life. C. Refectory As in all monasteries, their too mealtime in the refectory was sacred. The presence of the elder was decisive. Concentrated and thoughtful, he would sustain his body with a little indispensable nourishment in a very courteous manner, but his presence was radiant and spiritual. I remember that during meals in the refectory, everyone would feel penitence and heartfelt mourning. The reading, the teaching, and the venerable presence of the elder produced a profound spiritual atmosphere. On the first day, the visitor would have the pleasure of sitting next to the elder in the refectory at mealtime, at his own invitation, above the monks, even if he were a layman. Immediately after that, however, he would take his place after all the others. The elder used to say that the first place is honorable because it indicates the respect that we show to our guest, but the last place is also honorable because it makes clear that we include him in our family. D. Hospitality Hospitality was exemplary and noble. He was moved that someone had undertaken a long journey to visit the monastery, and he would devote himself completely to him, particularly when he was in good health and understood that the other person needed spiritual help. If he could not look after him personally, he would apologize to him. He felt very uncomfortable, almost sickened, when someone visited him and stood reverently before him, regarding him as a saint. He would say, I do not want people to meet me and take me for a saint. He often told the brethren of the monastery to take their visitor for a tour of the dis district around the monastery, or even to other towns, such as Oxford, Colchester, and so on. He was extremely pleased when the visitor staying at the monastery felt at home. On one occasion, as an expression of the virtue of hospitality, he took me with him to visit a family that he knew in a nearby town. He did so mainly for my relaxation and as an expression of his hospitality. E. Love for People he had a great love for the people who visited the monastery. He rejoiced that the monastery was always open and that the monks would receive people with great pleasure and without resentment. He knew that people nowadays suffer for different reasons and because they suffer, they are sensitive about every difficulty that they encounter, so they voice various complaints. For that reason, he showed his abundant love, especially to those who were suffering and despised. On Sundays, the monastery was a meeting place for hundreds of people. After the Divine Liturgy, they would wander around at ease in the monastery grounds. They would eat there. Most brought food with them under the very tall trees. They would make their confession to the spiritual fathers of the monastery, take part in the paraclesis, and listen to the customary address. The elder would show particularly love to small children. He would take them in his arms give them chocolates and sweets, celebrate their feasts, singing many years in their honor, and generally behave like a small child himself while talking to them. He was very sympathetic towards those who were depressed or in distress due to spiritual anxieties, and those who practiced noetic prayer of the heart with a sense of repentance. He also felt deeply for young people, those who re rejected authority, those who hungered and thirsted for God's righteousness, and who were going through what he had gone through in his life. He approached them with respect and love and did everything he could to help them. F. Discussion, Confession He devoted hours to discussing various spiritual matters. There were two ways in which he usually talked to people. The first was when someone asked to see him discuss a serious subject that was troubling him. 
Usually he accepted the request, and he would call him whenever he had time. He would ask how long he was going to stay at the monastery, and he would arrange the time of the meeting. Often he would see him in the day before he was due to depart. As I understand it, this was done with a particular aim in view. He wanted to give the visitor a chance to enter into the atmosphere of the monastery, to take in its spirit entirely, to make his confession to the spiritual fathers there, so that the spirit of repentance that could be felt at the monastery would bring him to contrition. His noose would be purified, and after that, the field of his soul would be ready to receive his word. The meeting would take place in the small office at the monastery. Before the discussion began, while he was still on his feet, he would pray, saying the prayer, Heavenly King and Comforter, slowly and steadily, so that that this discussion would be blessed. He placed everything under the protection and energy of God. Next, he would say a few introductory words, expressing his joy that this meeting was taking place. And usually, without the other person realizing it, he led him to the question or problem that he wanted to discuss with him. When the one he was talking to wanted to make his confession, the elder would slowly put on his stole and read the appropriate service with a slow rhythm. Once he had heard the confession, he would say a divinely inspired therapeutic word, not merely by way of conversation, but whatever God revealed, the first word that he made known to him. He would then read the prayer of absolution slowly and contritely. If the discussion was not of a personal nature but general, immediately after the midday meal he would invite the abbot or another member of the community to join this meeting with the visitor. After the customary refreshment, he would expound various issues, usually theological and spiritual, the analysis of the person hypostases, the meaning of the hypostatic principle, the revelational words, keep your mind in hell and despair not, and self-emptying in the divine liturgy were among the favorite central issues in his discussions. The other kind of discussion was unpremeditated. It was unpremeditated from the visitor's point of view, but for the elder it may have been premeditated. He would meet the visitor somewhere in the monastery grounds and say to him, Let's go for a walk, often, so that he would be steadier in his movements, particularly when he had problems with his back, but more as a sign of mutual fellowship, unity, and love, he would take the arm of his companion. He would begin the conversation, and naturally the one he was talking to, faced with the patristic, consoling, and gentle words that flowed from his lips, the distillation of spiritual experience did not dare to contradict or even ask a question or continued the discussion with his own words. It was not that the elder forbade it, but his words gripped the one he was talking to. On such walks I heard his words about the link between the divine liturgy and noetic prayer, the breadth and width of repentance, the remembrance of death, how to experience genuine ecclesiastical life, the pastoral ministry to married couples, about families, bringing up young people, the difference between academic teachers and the Holy Fathers, various theological issues, and so on. G. Visits. Because his heart was sensitive towards everyone, he would pray for people living all over the world. In particular, he played for those who were in spiritual contact with him, most especially when they were in distress or practicing noetic prayer, or were inclined toward the monastic life, or were at the spiritual stage of the withdrawal of divine grace. He was continuously interested in them with nobility of spirit. He often made visits to those who asked for his help, or whom he himself perceived to be in need. He would go to people's homes to bring them a consoling word. He would visit the sick in hospital, but he would also go to communities which were seeking to live the spiritual life. H. Love for nature. He loved nature, God's creation. He liked to see the area around the monastery well kept, and he respected every blade of grass, as it was a product of God's creative energy. 
He wanted his saplings to be planted at the monastery. He would specify the location and the type of trees to be planted himself. On one occasion he came out of his bungalow to watch us planting saplings. He was so delighted that he called us in to give us a cold drink. I. Sense of humor. The characteristic feature of a saint is said to be a sense of humor. Studies have been made of patristic writings, and many such examples have been found. We see this especially in the letters of St. Gregory the Theologian, but also in contemporary holy figures, such as Father Paisios. Father Sophroni also had this sense of humor. As has been mentioned already, he was upset and did not want to continue the conversation with anyone who approached him convinced that he was talking to a saint. If this happened, he would bring the conversation to an end and find an excuse to leave. He would use very clever phrases which contained elements of joy but also of gentle instruction. He would laugh wholeheartedly at something that he saw or heard. Occasionally, he would behave with childlike simplicity without becoming childish. He had all the characteristics of a child within the wisdom of a great man. When he was walking along the paths in the monastery grounds and met a group of adults or children whom he knew, he would approach them or they would approach him, and he would tell them edifying stories. From the joyful noise, everyone knew where the elder was. J. Taking Leave when someone had stayed for a long time at the monastery and entered into its atmosphere, he was regarded as a member of the family. So the day of departure was a moving experience. All the monks would gather together with the elder in the church of the monastery and the appropriate service would be held, in which they besought God to bless the visitor's journey and read the appropriate gospel reading and the appointed prayer. After this service, everyone went out onto the road beside the car in which he was going to travel. Everyone took leave of him. They would give him a gift as a blessing. Sometimes at the visitor's request, a photograph would be taken as a souvenir. And as the car drew away from the monastery, everyone with Father Sophroni in the lead would wave goodbye with their hands for a long time until the car disappeared round a bend in the road. Some would even take out their handkerchiefs and wave them to bid farewell to the departing visitor. It was impossible for anyone to remain unmoved by this send-off, and surely no heart remained unaffected by this warm expression of love. I was an eyewitness to the instances described above, so the description is trustworthy. They may have happened on different days and at different times, but they all might have taken place in a single day. Thus they they give some indication of Father Sophroni's daily program. He once said to me characteristically, quote, What happens in our monastery is what happens with the Tipicon of the church. There is the basic book of the Paracl Paracliti, which contains, excuse me, which contains the troparion for every day in the specific tone. At the same time, however, these troparia alternate with those of the Meneon, which refer to the saint celebrated on that particular day. This is what happens in our monastery. We are the Paracliticae, the stable basis, but every day new guests are added. They do not change our timetable, but they receive something from us, and in this way our daily doxology is offered up to God. End of quote. It makes a huge impression on me that such a great theologian of our day, one who, who, who knew leading theologians and philosophers, but most of all was found worthy, as is clear from his writings, of acquiring great experience of God and reached the point of theoria of the uncreated light, should be so near us, and that he should behave so simply and humanly. Although the comparison is not exact, it is like seeing Christ being transformed figured on Mount Tabor one moment and the next moment seeing him among people, alleviating their pain, one moment singing with his disciples at the Last Supper, and not long afterwards being crucified, teaching one moment and taking little children in his arms and blessing them the next, 
reproving the scribes and Pharisees one moment, and the next letting the woman who was a harlot wash his feet and forgiving her sins. Elder Sophroni was a great hesychist and an empirical theologian, but also a loving and genuine spiritual father. All who knew him can vouch for his wisdom, simplicity, tenderness, and abundant love, especially towards those who were aware of their poverty of spirit. Part 2, Everyday Life, Pastoral Ministry, continued. Chapter 2, Theologian and Shepherd, My Contact with Elder Sophroni and His Words. The first time that I visited the monastery of St. John the Baptist in Essex, England, was in 1976, 31 years ago. From then on, I used to go regularly, almost every year, to the monastery to meet the elder and to talk to him about various issues that were troubling me. Sometimes I would ask him, and he would reply, but mostly there was no need for me to ask him because he raised the subject and brought it to a conclusion. I would listen to him respectfully and with great attention. As soon as the conversation with him came to an end, or as soon as I heard him say something, I would go at once to my room and write it down as I remembered it. Naturally, I recorded his words, which he was accustomed to expound in a spirit of contrition, in abbreviated form. I had collected his words from my contact with him over the years in a file, which I had lost due to my frequent moves. Recently, when looking for something else, I found it. I began to read what I had noted down from time to time, and I realized how rich the words of the great elder of blessed memory were. I wrote them out to see to what extent and in what way they could be put to good use. I felt that I did not have to I didn't have the right to keep them in obscurity. That servant was punished, quote, who had received one talent and went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money, end of quote, Matthew twenty five eighteen. I too fear this punishment. For th that reason, I want to share with readers the spiritual wealth that I unworthily received. Here, I must make two essential class of clarifications. The first is, that the words spoken to me by the elder were what he had to say to me as personal guidance on personal matters, as well as on pastoral and theological problems that were of concern to me at that time. The saints, as he used to say to himself, receive assurance from God about what they should say on each occasion to a particular individual. Sometimes he would speak from personal experience and sometimes by God's illumination. I do not know to what extent the things that he said to me apply to everyone or are valid for everyone. They are set out here to show one perspective and to help to provide for anyone who needs it. The second is that the ever-memorable elder's words are recorded as I wrote them down after the conversation or discussion that I had with him. This is more or less how the collection of the sayings of the fathers... was compiled. There are very likely gaps in the expression in some places, which are my fault, as I wrote down the basic points at the time and left out the detail. So if there is any lack of clarity in the words or any misinterpretation, this should be attributed to me and is connected with how intensely I was paying attention. My memory and my spiritual state at this time is not due to the elder. Be that as it may, these words clearly reveal the elder's depth, his love, and his powerful personality. I feel that what I received from him, which formed my theological frame of reference, is equivalent to having studied at a school of empirical theology, superior to any academic faculty, with a wise and experienced professor who had suffered and learnt divine things and subsequently taught the knowledge of God, the word of God, and not words about God. His theology was a narrative. He would relate what he had seen and heard during his revelational experience. I glorify God for this gift. When someone reads the words of the elders, such as those which I have preserved and record below, he sees a man whose noose clung to God and who spoke about the spiritual life and even about ecclesiastical and social matters from this perspective. 
It is also particularly impressive that although the elder went through many fluctuations in his life, the experience of hell and paradise, the remembrance of death and his resurrection, the sense of the abyss, but also the experience of the knowledge of God, all the same, his spoken word was calm and his theology reflected peace and set the soul of the one with whom he was speaking completely at ease. In general, as the reader will ascertain in this second part of the book, his words are the crystallization of empirical knowledge of God, an expression of love, peace, and meekness, the distillation of long-standing and complete knowledge of God. Each time Elder Sophroni's words are quoted, they will be preceded by a short introduction setting out how and where the meeting with the Elder took place, and a general description of the atmosphere that prevailed during the discussion. In this way, instead of bare words, his words will be placed within the context in which they were spoken. 1976 From 1964 to 1968, I studied at the Theological School in Thessaloniki. I regarded this as a particular blessing because at that time, that theological school was regarded as patristic since all the professors were working on the fathers of the church particularly on the teaching of St. Gregory Palamas. Young academic theologians under the guidance of Professor Paniotis Christou were involved in editing the critical edition of the works of St. Gregory Palamas. The fact that Roman Byzantine Thessaloniki and the theological school were near the holy mountain helped towards this end. It was natural that I should be integrated into this atmosphere, I enjoyed the divine liturgies and the services in the Byzantine churches of the city, as well as being taught from the works of the Holy Fathers of the Church. In this context, I read nearly all the works of St. Gregory the Theologian and of St. Gregory Palamas, which introduced me to the niptic hesychistic tradition of the Church. At the same time as my studies at the theological school, I regularly visited the Holy Mountain especially during the summer. Under the supervision of Professor Paniotis Christos, I worked with a team of students for a whole summer in the libraries of the monasteries of the Holy Mountain. After work, whenever the opportunity arose, the other students and I would race like thirsty deer to other monasteries, to Skeets and the desert of the Holy Mountain. We relished the long vigils and services the encounters with simple monks, the long walks along blessed pathways. A spiritual vacuum was created within me, however, for which I myself was to blame. On the one hand, I was reading the works of the Holy Fathers with their amazing theology, and on the other, I was meeting ascetics on the Holy Mountain with great humility, simplicity, and freedom, but who did not express this theology that I had found in the writings of the Holy Fathers, at least as far as I could see. At that time, there were also various problems in the ecclesiastical administration. In 1967, Archimandrite Hieronymus Kotsonis, professor of the Theological School of Thessaloniki, took over as Archbishop of Athens. He was chosen by an unelected synod and there was discontent and reaction from other bishops. Thus I saw a divergence between the theology that I was being taught at university, the simple life of ascetic monks, and the meddlesome ecclesiastical administration full of passions. This divergence intensified in the early 1970s, when I was ordained to the clergy, I would read the niptic texts of the Holy Fathers, such as the works of St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, particularly a handbook of spiritual counsel, the guarding of the five senses, and the commentary on canons of the great feasts. However, at that time, many people's opposition to Archbishop Eronimos of Athens was growing. The culmination with his resignation as Archbishop the election of a new archbishop, Seraphim from Ionia, the enthronement of 12 bishops in 1974, the election of new bishops 
and the associated ecclesiastical conflict after the change of regime in Greece. I was living in a curious state. On the one hand, the writings of the Holy Fathers revealed a church that was the body of Christ and a communion of deification, but on the other hand, I saw a church dominated by passions, conflicts, and overbearing tendencies. All this discord caused me distress at the beginning of my ecclesiastical ministry. Certainly, my metropolitan, the ever-memorable Bishop Kalinikos of Edessa, Pella, and Almopia, restored equilibrium in very many respects, because I saw in him a humble bishop with a patristic approach and an ecclesiastical consciousness who lived like an ascetic and did not get involved in ecclesiastical controversies. Nevertheless, the whole atmosphere that prevailed in the church raised various serious questions within me. I would ask myself, quote, Where is it expressed that the church is the body of Christ and a communion of deification? How can passions be justified in a church that teaches the niptic hesychistic tradition? Why can theology not be linked with the pastoral ministry, and sometimes there is theology that does not exercise a pastoral ministry, and sometimes pastoral care that does not theologize? How is the hesychistic niptic tradition linked with theology? Why are there no fathers of the church today, as in the past, there was St. Basil the Great, St. Gregory the Theologian, St. Gregory Palamas, and so on. Has the patristic tradition disappeared? And many similar questions. At that time, in 1973, Archimandrite Sophroni's book, Start Silouan the Athenite, was published and circulated in Greek. I was given it as a gift. On reading the title, I said to myself, one of many books that are in circulation. Everyone is writing about monks and elders. Here's an Archimandrite writing about some monk I have never heard of. I began, however, to read it. It made a great impression on me. I realized that this book was an answer to the questions that were bothering me because it brought together theology and the monastic life, hesychism and the sacramental life, asceticism and the orthodox ethos. I thought that the author must be an excellent theologian and priest. I had actually heard of him in 1963, when someone I knew was studying in London and used to visit the monastery of St. John the Baptist in Essex, where Archimandrite Sophroni was abbot. Full of the questions mentioned above and impressed by reading the book about Starat Silouan, I decided to visit the monastery in Essex and to meet Starat Silouan's disciple, the author of the book about him. Naturally, when I met him, as I shall record below, I realized that he was what I was looking for. He brought together in himself all three elements. He was an empirical theologian, a great hesychist, and a discerning spiritual father, full of affection and love. After various adventures, which this is not the place to mention, I visited the monastery of St. John the Baptist, Essex, England, in June 1976. I asked the abbot, Archimandrite Kiro, Father Sophroni had stepped down from being abbot, to let me stay a few days at the monastery. He consented, and I stayed with them for about a month and a half. The day I arrived at the monastery, I inquired after Father Sophroni, and they told me that he was away from the monastery and would return in a week's time. So, before I met Father Sophroni, I spent the first week in the spiritual atmosphere which he had created in his monastery. I experienced three things with great intensity. The first was the daily services. Accustomed to the festive services of Vespers and Matins, which I had taken part in till, na until then, I was deeply impressed by the way in which the services were held there. Because the monks were of different nationalities, and because the elder wanted to introduce them to noetic prayer, the church services took the form of the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, in the small chapel in the main building of the monastery. The main building, the old rectory, was not built to serve as a monastery, but as a house. And they had bought it and turned it into a monastery. It was a building with two stories, ground floor and the first floor. 
On entering the building, one saw the kitchen to the left, the larder, and the two refectories. To the right was a hall, and then a large room, which had been converted into a chapel. Next to it was the office where the elder heard confessions and received visitors. On the first floor of the building were the cells where the monks lived, and two rooms in which guests stayed. The elder's bungalow was on the other side of the monastery, next to the garden where they grew various vegetables. Matins and vespers each lasted about two hours. The monks would say the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. Out loud in turn, each in his own language, surrounded by profound silence and in the dark. A complete typicon had taken shape with the Jesus prayer. I remember that the first time that I had experienced this service, I almost lost my bearings. When I came out of church, I did not know where to go. Every day, I would relish the Jesus prayer spiritually. I had heard on the holy mountain that monks performed their prayer rule and that we all ought to say the Jesus prayer, but it was the first time that I had experienced it in practice. I felt like a medical student who is taught theoretical subjects at university, but afterwards has to do laboratory work. I regarded these church services as a spiritual lab laboratory of theology. My second experience was the divine liturgies, which took place in this contrite atmosphere. Every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, the divine liturgy was celebrated in the small chapel of St. John the Baptist, and every Sunday in All Saints Church, which was one or two kilometers further down the road from the monastery. It had been ceded to them for that purpose, because many pilgrims used to come, and the small chapel of the monastery was too small. I experienced the divine liturgy in a hesychistic atmosphere. The way it was celebrated at the monastery bore no relation to how it was celebrated in the noisy environment of the parish churches with which I was familiar the third thing that I experienced was daily life at the monastery. I asked them to regard me as a monk of the monastery, so all week I worked with the other monks. At that time, the building that was to house a refectory and kitchen on the ground floor and a library and other rooms on the first floor was under construction. I carried cement, lugged bricks, and helped the workmen on the construction. I cut grass helping with buying provisions for the monastery, helped to make incense, and so on. In almost all these jobs, I was helping Father Zacharias. After I had stayed at the monastery for a week, Father Sofroni returned from his journey. I waited with great anxiety to meet him. I was not present when he arrived, but I saw him at a distance, standing between the main buildings and the new building, talking to the monks. I approached full of awe, and respect and asked for his blessing. The elder was very agreeable. He looked at me with his penetrating eyes and said something to Father Kirill. I found out later that he had said, He looks like Anthony Bloom. From then on, I met the elder every day in the monastery refectory, at the Divine Liturgy and on his daily walks. I always approached him respect, very respectfully, but he too, because he was distressed and if people went to see him, believing that they would meet a saint, would find ways of making the encounter pleasant by telling them a relevant antidote or saying something amusing. This is how all the saints behave. The truth is that at first I, I scrutinized him from the outside and tried to see his inner world as well. The elder was 80 years old at that time, but in relatively good health. He celebrated the liturgy every Sunday and took part in the liturgies held on weekdays, Saturdays, and feast days. He was of medium height with an upright posture, despite having a problem with his back. He held a small walking stick to help him. His gait combined majesty with asceticism. He walked nobly without affectation, but also with ascetic humility. When one saw the elder walking along the road, one saw nobility combined with the asceticism of the hermit. His eyes were blue, and his beard and his hair, which fell lightly on his shoulders, were pure white. His face was cheerful, but also pensive. 
His voice was low-pitched, and he spoke slowly, clearly, and contritely. When he laughed, he laughed wholeheartedly. However, he would stop short immediately, saying, Da, in Russian, and continue the conversation seriously. He was deeply pensive, but at the same time pleasant. These two characteristics revealed his ascetic personality and the depth of his heart, because his personality was free from self-centered seriousness and impudent frivolity. In general, his face showed the depth of his inner world. He always wore a small cross, a treasure, on a simple chain. In the West, the Orthodox clergy usually wear crosses so that people can distinguish them from Jews and Muslims. After a few days, I asked him to appoint a day when I could talk to him about various matters that were preoccupying me. The elder's basic principle, as has already been mentioned, was that the pilgrim should enter into the atmosphere of the monastery, benefit from it, and be aware of an inner change, and then talk to him. The meeting would often take place on the day before the visitor's departure. To be sure, this differed according to needs and customs. The whole atmosphere prevailing in the monastery was extremely contrite and blessed. No one could fail to be changed by what he felt. The daily services with the Jesus prayer the divine liturgies, full of contrition, contact with the monks, who never criticized anyone, but above all the presence of Father Sophroni, opened up spiritual depths. A priest who had come to visit, Father Simeon Krayalopoulos, diagnosed this from the first day and told me that it was due to profound the profound personality of Father Sophroni. One day, the elder came out of his bungalow for his usual walk. He met me on the path and said, Let's have a discussion as we walk along, adding humorously, Let's be peripatetic philosophers. We began walking along the lane from the monastery towards All Saints Church. This was a narrow asphalted road wide enough for one car. Two small cars could pass each other with difficulty. To the right and left, There was abundant vegetation, nettles, and other greenery. At first I asked a question. He gave the relevant answer and proceeded from one subject to another, as if he had taken an X-ray of the problems and questions that I had inside me. So the first lessons that I learnt from the elder were on the road, which was symbolic because for me he really did become the path to truth. As will become clear below, I found united in his person the hermit monk, the theologian and father of the church, and the man of the church. In other words, in him the niptic and hesychistic tradition, orthodox theology and ecclesiastical life came together. We spoke in Greek, which he had learnt when he was a monk on the holy mountain. According to what I was told, he learnt Greek from Metropolitan Herotheus of Melitopolis, who had retired to the holy mountain. When he began the first lessons, in his effort to remember the words, grammar, and syntax, he sensed that his noose, which had previously been in his heart through penitent prayer, ascended to his reason. Then he realized that his noose had been for many years in his heart. In fact, one day, although He could see two monks arguing. He did not hear what they were saying because his noose was in his heart. Thus he understood the movements of his noose. The Metropolitan once asked him to write something. The elder had learned classical Greek well with his aptitude for languages, but he also had great spiritual experience and a patristic approach. As a result, what he wrote resembled a patristic text. The Metropolitan thought that he had copied out something written by one of the fathers of the church and remarked to him that he should write his own text and not copy out the words of the fathers. Certainly he knew and used classical Greek very well because he had lived for many years in the West. However, he spoke Russian, French, and English more often, so he would forget some Greek words. During the conversation, he would try to be precise. Searching to find a certain word, he actually said, Unfortunately, 
speaking other languages, I forget the best language in the world, which is Greek. The Greeks are aristocrats. This is what he told me at our first meeting. The beginning of the spiritual life is a sense of sinfulness. One feels that one is worse than the animal and unworthy of God's love. This is a natural, normal state inspired by God's grace. It is an experience of hell, which is the negative vision of the uncreated light. Through the light of God we see our condition, just as the image on a transparency is projected when there is a light behind it. We should, we should be uneasy when we do not sense the passions that exist within us. The words, Keep your mind in hell and despair not, were revealed to star at Siloan. By the grace of God, we sense hell and its flames, not only in our soul, but also in our body. This is a rare gift of God. It is a, a law of the spiritual life that we first experience God negatively as fire, and then positively as light. All the great saints passed through this fire. We remain there long, as long as we can bear it on the borders of hell. When despair comes, we withdraw for a while with our hope in God. The flames of hell burn up the passions, and this fire is changed into divine light. Noetic prayer helps us descend to the depths of our being and to find our deep heart. And then profound repentance begins. Then the heart becomes very sensitive. The Divine Liturgy, however, helps us to enter into the whole tragedy of humanity and to pray for people's suffering. We live Christ's prayer in Gethsemane and His crucifixion on Golgotha. The Divine Liturgy helps us to penetrate into the whole of humankind and to pray for the departed and for sinners. The spirit of the Divine Liturgy is the spirit of sacrificial love, the depth of Christ's self-emptying and his prayer in Gethsemane, which we should imitate. The teaching about the person is important for our era. Many people talk about the person in a philosophical, psychological, or personalistic way. The person, however, is a revelation by God to man. Through God's revelation and manifestation, man senses that God is person, but man himself is also a person and comes into contact with God person to person. This hypostatic principle, which is present within us from our conception, is activated by God's revelation, by theoria of the uncreated light, and this is the basis of the ascetic and spiritual life. The fathers prefer to speak about the hypostasis rather than the person because the word person can lead to an external view of the concept of the person and to personalism. The hypostatic path is the route to participation in the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. We walk along this path with the mysteries and with asceticism. As I mentioned earlier, I stayed at the monastery for about a month and a half, taking part in all the work and services. I would often see the elder at the services and divine liturgies. I concelebrated with him, and I perceived how great a saint celebrates the liturgy. A few days before my departure, I asked him completely spontaneously to give me a piece of the relics of Star at Siloan, which Father Sophroni had taken after the exhumation of his relics and kept in the sanctuary of the chapel. It should be noted that St. Siloan had not yet been included in the Church's calendar of saints. Father Sophroni responded with delight. He was very pleased because I had told him that in Edessa we held a vigil every month and at the appropriate point in the service we would read the writings of St. Siloan. I regarded it as a special blessing from God that he himself gave me a part of St. Siloan's relics. The day before I had left, I asked the elder for another meeting. This time the meeting took place in the office next to the chapel of St. John the Baptist. With all the ritual which the elder observed on such occasions, even when there was only going to be a discussion, we would 
he would stand upright in front of the chair behind the desk, lift up his head to heaven and close his eyes, saying the prayer, Heavenly King and Comforter. And then, after making the sign of the cross, he would sit down and begin the discussion with solemnity that I have hardly ever encountered. The discussion did not take place in the usual worldly manner. Mostly, I asked a simple question, and he began to reply without me interrupting. Sometimes he would begin the discussion prompted by various things. For example, he expressed his pleasure at the communication between us and said that when this communication takes place in the Holy Spirit, it becomes a prophetic event. In this last discussion, he told me the following. Many theologians talk about deification in the abstract. What is important is to keep Christ's commandments. In this way we arrive at deification and the light. Dispassion is when Christ comes into our soul and body. Struggles and battles begin after the first visitation of divine grace. It needs a long time for someone to assimilate the first grace that he received. And this assimilation comes through patience and fortitude in periods when divine grace is withdrawn. We recognize the visitation of divine grace from contrition, the sense of repentance and weeping. Joy comes immediately afterwards. The vision of the uncreated light comes negatively in the beginning with tears and weeping, the sense of hell because we see our passions. This is the start of the spiritual life. Those with many years' experience feel the opposite after supplicatory prayer and the visitation of divine grace. In other words, first they taste the joy of the visitation of divine grace, and then come the tears and mourning. This happens after 25 years of fruitful struggle as a Christian. We must be careful about how we live in the world, especially we monks and clergy. We should pray continuously, even when walking along the road. We should say, Lord Jesus Christ, save thy world and me. We should also say the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner, for a short time in the morning and a short time in the evening. We should not, however, specify from the outset how long the time of the prayer will last, lest it become a habit. We should pray according to the fervor and appetite that is created, according to our inspiration. Then the time spent will increase day by day. When we repeat the Jesus prayer, all our passions will be revealed, because then the devil makes... 1976 continued. When we repeat the Jesus prayer, all our passions will be revealed, because then the devil makes war on us at our weak points in order to distract our news from prayer. Prayer stirs up a tempest of temptations and attacks from the devil, who attempts to distract our news from prayer. Thoughts that come during prayer indicate the stronger passions that dominate us. Subsequently, we have to struggle and strive for these specific passions to be cured. Above all, we should confess them to our spiritual father and seek guidance in order to heal them. In this way, prayer uncovers the passions and repentance according to grace cures them. In the morning, we should pray that God will give us illumination as to how to answer the questions that people will ask us and how we should respond to the problems that will arise during the day. Nothing can be done without God's grace. Then we should read the Holy Scripture and patristic books. We should read books that lead to contrition, not books that provide intellectual knowledge. Sometimes a walk or a rest are also necessary. There are people who cannot read the writings of St. Simeon the New Theologian because they become discouraged. I recommend to beginners that they read the instructions of Abba Dorotheus, which are very practical. We need to teach our noose to attach itself somewhere, to God, to our brethren, to our spiritual work, and not let it wander about as it wants under the influence and sway of the passions. Then the noose learns to cleave to God, and wherever we lead it, 
but carnal desires also wither away. As a consequence, the body is subject to the spirit. Something similar, though not identical, happens in the case of those who work with their reason, academics, philosophers, and artists. We, however, attach our noose to God. Those who do physical work, by contrast, have more carnal temptations. For someone who struggles, the battle with the flesh ceases at about 32 or 35 years of age. I do not know how this happens, but it does. Now and again there will be nocturnal emissions, but without pleasure. However, if someone has gone through various fallen carnal states, the cure will take longer and will be achieved after much struggle. Monks are forbidden to cry about matters to do with human life, death, lack of necessities. Tears are good for a monk if he weeps for his sins. Even then, however, he ought not to think about the cause of the tears, lest a hint of pride or self-esteem may perhaps arise. Through humility alone we are saved, and through pride alone we are destroyed. We understand that tears are not sentimental when they produce a sense of contrition and repentance. When pride and a vain thought come at the same time as the tears, the tears of divine grace cease. Great care is needed with regard to judging bishops. We do not know exactly the conditions under which they live. It is absolutely certain on the basis of experience that we shall be judged for whatever we judge, and we shall fall in the same way. There is a difference between judging and condemning, but sometimes they are identical. When we judge from compassion, from suffering, and not negatively, this is simply judgment and not condemnation. It is judgment and not condemnation when parents ask, Why does our child commit that sin? This is judgment because it is said with profound suffering. It is not condemnation. Psychology and the spiritual life have different starting points. Their anthropology is different. However, we cannot overlook psychology, which mainly helps people who are atheists and do not want to use the hesychistic tradition of the church. It is a remedy for people who are far from the living God and are in terrible torment. It should be used discreetly and wisely. Medication with help will may help the body that has suffered serious harm from various problems, but the cure will come through man's regeneration by the grace of God. The soul's wounds are cured by means of prayer. On the morning of the day I was to depart for the airport, the monks asked me what time exactly I would leave the monastery. At the specific specified time, the elder called all the brethren to the church, and a special service was held for a brother setting out on a journey. After that, he and all the fathers embraced me. As the car was leaving, the elder and the brethren came out onto the road and waved goodbye with their hands, some with their handkerchiefs as well, until the car turned to the right after five or six hundred meters and disappeared from sight. It was a moving scene and a set set a seal on the whole blessed way of life that I had enjoyed during those days at the monastery of St. John the Baptist. I recorded my impressions from this first visit to the monastery in an article entitled Orthodox Presence that was published in the periodical Parish Priest and was included in the book Time to Act. Reading this text, one sees the powerful experiences that I lived through that summer at the Monastery of St. John the Baptist in Essex. These impressions are also clear from a letter which I sent to the abbot of the monastery, Archimandrite Kirill, and which is quoted below. Quote, Edessa, July 22, 1976. Dear Brother in Christ, Father Kirill, your blessing with the help of Holy God, and by your prayers, I returned safely to Edessa last week. My impressions from my recent visit to your blessed monastery still remain fresh. I cannot conceal from you that I was very deeply moved. 
These are not exaggerated words or rhetorical phrases or a wrong, mistaken evaluation of things, but the reality. Among you I passed the finest moments of my life. I cannot say more, but I want you to believe me that my stay at your monastery is linked with powerful and sacred experiences, dynamic decisions, amazing occurrences. I think that perhaps it is impossible for you to conceive what you gave me and what spiritual nourishment I received every day by the energy of the Holy Spirit. Later on after my departure, when I tried to recall and assimilate your love and affection, I was stunned. On account of your modesty, you would prefer not to read the above, and perhaps you regard it as a consequence of the Greek tendency to praise. You should be aware, however, that these are absolutely sincere words, without the least hypocrisy, with gratitude, which gratitude imposes, for this is natural, Peter of Damascus, although they are based upon many phrases from Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, who was truly the cultivator of truth and loved Christ madly. Let chapter 1 of his second epistle to the Thessalonians serve as an example. Thus, I give thanks with all my heart for the love that you showed me, of which I was unworthy. Please pray for me that the Lord God may keep me in constant repentance and profoundest humility, that I may turn to good account everything that I experienced among you. I greatly desire, Father, to acquire and to retain the blessed, joyful sorrow of holy contrition, John Climacus, since I am clearly aware that it is a divine fire that melts mountains and rocks and levels all things and transforms them into gardens of paradise and changes the souls that receive it. In their midst it becomes a flowing fountain, water of life that constantly leaps and bounds, that waters them abundantly and flows down as from a reservoir to those that are near and those that are far off, and fills to overflowing the souls that receive the words with faith. Simeon the New Theologian For this reason I also fervently entreat you to pray to the Lord that my heart may be filled with this holy contrition, which is undistracted pain of soul, St. John Climacus, and that I may thus live the heaven of the heart. I thank all the brethren because they bore with me and ministered to me in the name of Jesus Christ. I must confess that I bothered Father Zosimus most of all with my sometimes excessive requests. I thank everyone wholeheartedly and I ask you to forgive me if I made any omissions or mistakes. We do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. Colossians 1, 9-11 Please give, me, give my respects to the elder and my love in Christ to the brethren. Last Sunday I was with you all day long. With the love of Christ, signed Archimandra Herothius Vlacos. Footnote, Father Zosimus is now Archimandra Zacharias. 1977 In 1977, I did not visit the monastery, although I was in constant touch especially with Father Zacharias, a brother of the monastery. That summer, very much impressed by the service with the Jesus Prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, which I had experienced at the monastery in Essex, I went round a number of monasteries, skeets and cells in the desert of the Holy Mountain, asking many monks about the power and energy of the Jesus Prayer. I had already taken practical lessons the previous summer, at the monastery in Essex. As a result, I approached the holy mountain from another perspective. I came to know the deeper aspect of the holy mountain, its secret heartbeat, which is the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me. My visit to the holy mountain after that year, after the preliminary training that I had received at the monastery of St. John the Baptist in Essex, was truly blessed. 
I met many fathers whom I asked about the Jesus prayer, the heart, the noose, the vision of God, the knowledge of God, and so on. It really was a summer full of spiritual blessings. I heard words of God that issued from the spiritual experience of the elders. I felt like those pilgrims who used to ask the Desert Fathers questions, and from their answers, the sayings of the Fathers was compiled. That year I visited the Holy Mountain three times after Easter during Bright Week, in June, and at Christmas. Bright Week My first visit took place in Bright Week, as the desire to visit the places where St. Silouan and Father Sophroni had lived kindled within me. First of all, I visited the monastery of St. Pantalemon, the Russian monastery. I had read about the life of St. Silouan in the book of Father Sophroni had written, and I had heard a lot at the monastery in Essex. I entered the Cathilokon, the main church of the monastery, where these two blessed elders prayed and kept vigil. I walked on my own, though accompanied by the Jesus prayer, along the path that St. Silouan used to take from the harbor to the mill, loaded with sacks, but also with repentance and love for God. I went into the church of the prophet Elijah, where St. Silouan saw the living God to the right of the royal doors, in place of the icon of Christ. I went into the monastery refectory, where God's grace visited St. Silouan for a second time, similar to the first, while he was serving. I went to the church of the protecting veil, and venerated the sacred skull of St. Silouan that is kept there. Altogether, I went reverently round the whole of the monastery. In the monastery of St. Pantalemon, I also sensed the presence of Father Sophroni. I visited his cell, where, according to his own account, he had experiences of the uncreated light, as well as the workshop of the monastery, especially the balcony facing the sea, where in the evening the elder had many conversations on spiritual subjects with St. Silouan. All in all, while I was staying at the monastery of St. Pantalemon, I was intensely conscious of the presence of these two blessed ascetics. Next, I set out for the desert of the Holy Mountain, following in the steps of Father Sophroni. I climbed up to his cell in Kurulia. They call it Dread Kurulia, and so it is. Many people have been impressed by this location. According to Professor Panayotis Christou of Blessed Memory, Kurulia symbolizes the desert of Athos and is a rocky, steep place with cave-like hermitages of hesychists set into the face of the cliff. It is called Kurulia on account of a pulley, Kuruli in Greek, which the ascetics in the last hermitage nearest the sea had installed to help them to let down a basket to passing boats and to draw up a little bread and any other food that the fishermen or passengers had available, having received payment in advance in the form of hermit's handiwork that was in the basket. The ever-memorable Fotis Cantiglou gives a fine description of these hermitages. He saw them as seagulls' nests and hiding places, and writes that climbing up is a very bold decision. At that time, a Serbian ascetic, Father Stephen, was living in the hermitage where the elder used to live. Some regarded him as deluded, but when one approached him, one saw a monk full of joy and remarkable for his simplicity. That place impressed me. I observed the cave-like hermitage, but in my mind I tried to go back nearly half a century to the time when Father Sophroni was living there as an ascetic. I saw a cave that had water, and in the narrow external part, a small whitewashed building had been constructed with a small chapel. Outside, Father Stephen was cultivating a garden with vegetables and flowers. Naturally, the soil had been brought from somewhere else. Father Sophroni lived here for about four years, two years as a hero deacon and two years as a priest. In complete isolation and intense repentance, mourning 
thirst for God, prayer, and experiences of divine vision. It was the period of the Second World War, and the elder lived the global tragedy and prayed for the whole world. Later, I read a description of this location by an artist, M. A. Paltov, <clears throat> which was published in the periodical Sun in 1950. Paltov had visited Father Sofroni in Kurulia a few years previously and described both the surroundings and his overnight stay there. Because when this article was published, Father Sofroni was living in Paris, Poltov changed his name in the description and called him Athanasios instead of Sofroni. I quote the text so that we may acquire a sense of those hermitages and some awareness of the elder's life in the desert. Excerpt from M. A. Poltov, quote, It began to grow dark when, after a laborious all-day journey, I descended a steep and dangerous pathway and drew near to the caves where the hermits spend their whole lives. I was already moving among the shadowy and rugged rocks upon which the waves of the sea were beating. The sight of the bare rocks with the very few trees here and there, the boundless sea, the sound of the breaking waves and the hermit's caves that could be discerned in the crevices, constitute a spectacle as unimaginably magnificent as it is wild. I approached with difficulty. These caves were not easy to reach. Some of them are on the edge of an absolutely sheer cliff and the side of which paths have been carved out just wide enough to hold a man's foot, and the walker holds a chain fixed along the whole of its length. If at that moment he loses his calm or is seized by vertigo, he will fall onto the stony shore from a height of about 100 to 150 meters and be dashed to pieces. Exposed to all the winds and beaten by raging waves, this inhospitable shore seems to symbolize an austere and hard way of life. Throughout the summer, the lack of any kind of vegetation causes unimaginable heat. The sun beats down all day long on these bare stones, which seem to be aflame. In the winter, the uninterrupted rainfall sweeps away earth and stones, undermines the grounds, and floods all the hollows. One wonders with amazement how these men managed to construct their hermitages there and what means they used. Of what do these men's dwellings consist? Very simply, a cave in the rock, to which has been added a wooden hut covered with zinc sheeting. No vegetation, no garden produce, in contrast with the abundant greenery of the rest of the peninsula of Manathos. The little wharf for boats to approach is usually inaccessible due to wind and rough sea. All the same, it is impossible for the visitor not to feel that this place embodies an ideal and that there is something interesting and attractive about it. One senses that there is some sort of mystery in the soul and mind of those who have chosen to spend their whole lives in this place, far from the world, with real fasting and deprivation for the sole purpose of communicating with the Most High. What are they thinking of, I wonder? The desire to find out something brought me to the door of a hermit. It was a small wooden hermitage with one inner partition and a small yard with a natural stone wall and a small tree in the middle. A narrow pipe resting on the tree brings the hermit potable rainwater from a natural reservoir a little higher up. During long periods of drought, even this small quantity of water often fails. An elderly monk with a very sad expression, thin and wrapped in rags, opened the door to me. I asked him where the hermitage of Father Athanasios, note Father Sofroni, was, whom I wanted to see. Without asking anything at all, he took me where I wanted to go. Father Athanasios was standing at the outer door. This is not his name, but out of respect for his desire to sever every link with the world, I shall call him Athanasios. A refined and courteous young man, 
fair-haired, slim, pale, and with wonderful blue eyes. Welcome, he said to me and held out his hand. Come in. His hermitage was no different from the others that I have described. It is in a steep place, and the view of the horizon are unimaginably magnificent. The pipe from his water supply reservoir was also resting on a small tree and on empty tin cans. A small stone built oven served as a kitchen, two seats in the yard, and a small bench as a table. On the right, the opening of the cave, which was also the last resting place of the previous inhabitant. In that cleft in the rock, Father Athanasios will also end his life when God calls him to himself. Sit down, he said, apologizing for not being able to receive me in better fashion. We are unaccustomed to visitors. I had heard about this man long before. A highly cultured and talented painter, he speaks many languages. My host had at one time had excellent painting exhibitions in Paris. He had lived for art and was looking for a new stage in painting. He was inclined to read religious books, and one day he felt, note Palto's opinion, that he had discovered in these books the path that he should follow. He did not delay. At once to the holy mountain, initially a novice, he became a monk and lived in the monastery. But life in the monastery did not satisfy him. He found it very worldly. He became a hermit. This was the man I was talking to, who was standing before me with a smile on his lips. There was nothing theatrical, nothing artificial about him. You must be hungry, he said. Let me offer you something. I declined and apologized for disturbing him by arriving suddenly and at such an unsuitable time. You did well to come. I want you to eat something. He hung a small oil lamp on the wire, and its faint light he went to his fireplace where he heated a small pot containing a strange concoction. It was sesame paste, which, together with little bread, constituted our supper for that evening. We talked like friends for a long time. It was already two hours after midnight, and yet I did not feel in the least tired, even though I had been walking all day. I was pleased to be given the opportunity to find out something about how people like these think. Father Athanasios had guessed this as soon as I arrived. You would like, he said, to find out about things beyond the limits of worldly life. That's true, I replied. I wanted to ask you certain things. For instance, Father Athanasios, have you found what you were looking for out here? Certainly, he replied. I am absolutely convinced of that. Very well. Were you a talented painter so aware of the voice of God that you came here? Answer, that happened gradually without my realizing it. Until then, I only lived for art. I wanted art to return to the era of the Renaissance. I realized this was impossible, and gradually I changed direction by reading religious books. I imagined, note an attempt to hide himself, that I was enlightened about the way that I should follow, and here I am. Have you completely abandoned painting? Yes, completely, and I have not picked up a paintbrush for years. I am satisfied by my new life. Well, this conversation lasted nearly until dawn. I was so influenced by the surroundings that I thought that I discerned in the noise of the waves invisible beings who were near to us. I wanted to find out how he lived during the autumn and the winter. On occasion, he told me, he cannot stand upright on account of the strong wind. The sea in that area is particularly wild and dangerous. Sometimes the roof is torn off by the gale. There have been quite a few accidents. The hermits are provided with supplies by small boats, which put the scanty food, bread, and tea into the baskets that hang from the rocks, and then the hermits draw them up. The hermit dies inside his hermitage, and his body is buried there by one of the, who will succeed him in that place. I lay down to sleep on a plank spread with a blanket. I had such vivid impressions that I did not sleep at all until daybreak. 
when I had to leave because my boat with my luggage was waiting for me. And when the sun rose, the wind would begin to blow, so it would be difficult to leave. I pressed the hand of the one I had been speaking to, and he thanked me sincerely for visiting him. May God be with you, he said. The boat pulled away from the rock, and for a long time I looked at the wild and magnificent sight of the inhospitable shore on which the slim outline of the hermit could still be distinguished. End of excerpt. I have read such descriptions of Karulia in various texts from the Holy Mountain and elsewhere, and I have experienced it for myself. How many times have I walked along the narrow paths up from the wharf, and how many times have I come down from Katunakia to Karulia with the fear of God, searching, thirsting, and praying in the unbearable heat of summer? There one feels that life and death are transcended. There one meets ascetics whose theology is written in their bodies. From them I heard words of life. 1977 continued. After Karulia, I visited the cave of the Holy Trinity near the monastery of St. Paul. Here, too, I followed in the elders' steps. From the Russian monastery, he had gone for about four years to Karulia, and then for about three years to the cave of the Holy Trinity. This cave is also visible from the sea, in between the monastery of St. Paul and Nuski when one is traveling by boat. I climbed up there along a difficult, overgrown path from near the small harbor of the monastery of St. Paul. I walked up this path on my own with the Jesus prayer. As soon as I reached it, I stood reverently for a while and prayed, asking for the elders' prayers. Then I went inside. It is a cave concealed externally by two small rooms and a chapel. This small building and its roof covered the cave. The location is amazing and uniquely suited to the eremitical way of life and repentance. I sat there for a long time praying. I sought the elders' prayers. To be sure, this cave-like cell seemed to be abandoned. The wind that was blowing at that time rattled the windows and doors. At the monastery of St. Paul, I met the former abbot, Father Andreas, and the librarian, Father Theodosius, who had known Father Sophroni and expressed their reverence and respect for this devout, spiritual, modest, and most courteous hero monk. At Nuskeet, I met Father Theophylactos, a most devout monk and bearer of the hesychistic tradition, who was a disciple of the eminent Archimandrite Joachim Spetsersis, who lived in the Nuskeet at the end of his life, and like another Abba Zosimus wrote the book about the female hermit Fotini, as well as publishing the ascetical works of St. Isaac the Syrian. Father Theophylactos had also been connected with Elder Joseph, the cave dweller and hesychist, and those with him, and he too practiced noetic prayer. He greatly revered the holy unmercenary physicians whose icon he had in his cell. He prayed to them to send him a little oil because otherwise he would not light their lamp or he would leave them out in the cold to freeze. And the holy unmercenary physicians fulfilled his wish. In addition, he besought them to free him from the attacks of the devil when he prayed, as was his custom all night with the prayer rope for people's specific problems. The holy unmercenary physicians obeyed his entreaty. It was Father Theophylactos who used to help Father Sophroni with chanting when he celebrated the liturgy in the chapel of the cave of the Holy Trinity. Father Sophroni writes in his book, quote, When I was in the desert and celebrated the liturgy on my own, having with me only a monk, who used to come in in order to give the responses to the supplications and litanies, to read the epistle and to provide the rest of the participation that was necessary in place of the congregation, then neither I nor that monk ever felt any lack. The whole world was there with us, the world and the Lord, the Lord 
and eternity. This monk was Father Theophylactos. When I asked him about Father Sophroni, he was so moved that he wept. He asked for information about his life. He told me what Father Sophroni had advised him to do and how he had helped him spiritually to deal with the situation with his elder, preserving his obedience to him, but also expressing the truth. He said to me and again and again, Father Sophroni is a saint, and he asked me to give him his respects. Father Sophroni, too, when I told him about Father Theophylactos, was pleased and spoke with love and respect about how devout the monk Theophylactos was. This pilgrimage of mine to the holy mountain, following in the steps of Father Sophroni, was full of spiritual inspiration, especially as it was Eastertide. I returned to Edessa with intense, life-giving memories. June. My second visit that year, 1977, was in June, with the blessing of my elder, the ever-memorable Metropolitan Kalinikos of Edessa, Pella, and Almofia, who followed my progress and quest with love and discretion. This time, I was seeking to find out more about the Jesus Prayer, Noetic Hezekiah, and the vision of the uncreated light from the fathers of the holy mountain who experienced these things empirically. My first stop was Elder Paisios, who at that time was living as a monk in the Calivi, the small hermitages of the precious cross, close to the monastery of Stavronakita. I knew him from the past when I used to ask him about issues connected with the spiritual ministry, but now, under the influence of everything I had read about the works of spiritual vigilance and noetic prayer and what I had experienced at the monastery in Essex, I was determined to ask him about these matters. The discussion with him was an initiation into mysteries. I have kept notes from this conversation, which I wrote as soon as I left his cell, sitting on a little rock on my way to the monastery of Stavronakita. First of all, he spoke to me about God's noble love towards human beings and the whole of creation. He actually said to me, quote, God is noble even to the devil, but the devil cannot understand it. Ultimately, God puts pressure on the devil. End of quote. I asked him about the essence of the monastic life. He said, the, monks, the monk does not have rights because these belong to God. Afterwards, he told me that we ought to develop our inner life and not stay on the surface. In particular, he mentioned that we should live God's righteousness. Quote, purity of the body is not enough. Experience of righteousness is also necessary. The just, but also all those who suffer injustice, are really God's children. End of quote. Monasticism is centered on God and our relationship with him. He said, quote, if, if I go to a military camp and tell them about monasticism, they will all want to be monks. But if they come here, at first the chanting of the palielos in church will fill them with enthusiasm, but later they will prefer the sound of borzukis. Thus, the essence of monasticism is in the heart. It is our responsibility to teach the new generation true monasticism. End of quote. Because he knew the value of obedience, he said, every elder will answer to God depending on how obedient his spiritual are, children are to him. Naturally, obedience is not imposed tyrannically by the elder on his disciples, but should take place freely. For that reason, he stressed, when monks have an elder who gives them freedom, they have a great responsibility. He also referred to the fact that some monks are not interested in this, their spiritual progress, but devote themselves to construction works. However, monks ought not to build a lot. They should simply repair existing buildings for their needs. He said, today we have cells and a paunch. The discussion turned in a natural way to noetic prayer, which is the essence of the monastic life. 
He expressed the teaching that prayer issues like a spring from the heart that loves God or feels pain. Quote, Prayer does not mean simply praying, nor just that we have a pure noose and do not accept thoughts, but first and foremost that the heart begins to function. End of quote. One must feel this little machine working. However, the heart is one thing and the will is another. As regards what the heart is, he referred to an amusing incident. When an Englishman, without knowing Greek and mostly out of curiosity, visited him to ask what the fathers of the church mean when they write about the heart, Elder Paisios, seeing that he was not really searching, told him, quote, With my English and your Greek, we cannot even find where the bodily heart is. I asked him about the distinction between the noose and reason. He explained it with a simple example. Quote, the reason is like unfermented grape juice and wine, whereas the pure noose is like distilled tispuro. End of quote. I asked him about the headache that comes from attempting to concentrate on the Jesus prayer. He said that when someone tries to concentrate on the Jesus prayer and a headache comes, then this headache during prayer is a sign of a keen sense of honor. So God sees the effort of the child who has a keen sense of honor and blesses him. He says, do not tire yourself. I shall give you what you are looking for. One should be aware that when others rightly complain about us, that does not help in prayer. He said many wise words to me about the spiritual life because prayer develops in the temperate climate of ecclesiastical spiritual life. For instance, he said, quote, God's arithmetic is different from man's arithmetic. Four for God is excellent, whereas nine is not excellent. End of quote. When I asked for an explanation, he replied, When someone receives two spiritual gifts from God and doubles them, to four he is given excellent, whereas the one who received five gifts and instead of doubling them to ten, increased them to nine, was not given excellent. He also told me that sometimes thoughts of unbelief are the result of excessive asceticism, and also when someone uses his imagination, he may even fall into heresy and harm the whole church. I asked him about fools for Christ's sake. He mentioned the case of Father Euthemios, who used to live in the area of the Great Lavra. Elder Paisios greatly respected and admired him, and he was at a high level of spiritual life. When Father Euthemios went to the monastery of the Great Lavra, in order to conceal his virtue, he pretended with shouts and protests that the food that they gave him was not good, so that he would not have to eat it. And he also threw the clean sheets off the bed, so that they put him in an inferior room. And Elder Paisios added humorously, Today, as we are fools in our minds, why should we become fools for Christ's sake? To help me spiritually with related questions that I asked him, he told me about many incidents from the monastic life in the monastery of Konitsa, how the devil wanted to do away with him, his encounter with bears, how he dealt with bodily temptation, as well as various accounts from his time as an ascetic in Sinai. These have been recorded in the book written by Hieromonk Isaac of Blessed Memory about Elder Paisios, and I have written them down in a relevant text. After Elder Paisios, I went up to the monastery of Philotheu to meet Elder Ephrem, the disciple of Elder Joseph the Hezekist and cave dweller. Elder Ephrem was at that time abbot of the monastery of Philotheu, and now lives in America and is the spiritual father of many holy monasteries in the New World. Elder Sophroni greatly respected the ever-memorable Elder Yosif. I asked Father Ephraim about his elder and his way of life. Sweet words flowed from his lips when he spoke about Elder Joseph the Hezekist, about the force that he exercised on himself, about his vigils among the desert rocks, about his noetic prayer and the purity of his noose, 
his experience of the vision of God and his warfare with the devil. I listened to him with admiration. Most of all, I asked him about the manner in which Elder Joseph practiced noetic prayer. He explained to me the relevant points from his elders' life and teaching. It made a particular impression on me, however, that he dwelt on the way in which he had died. He told me, quote, I have never seen death faced more gallantly. He was waiting for it and he pursued it, end of quote. He related how, when the elder felt something wrong with his heart, he was filled with joy and glorified God. He celebrated the fact, saying, My departure will come from this. His death was truly hesychistic, just as he lived hesychistically. After my departure from the Holy Mountain in the autumn of 1977, to be precise, I wrote the book A Night in the Desert of the Holy Mountain on the subject of the Jesus Prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me, what precedes it and what follows. During those two years, 1976 to 1977, I was living continuously within the current of the Jesus Prayer. I heard and read a great deal about it. The book was published in the spring of 1978 anonymously with the initials A.I.V. because I considered that nothing was my own. I was simply conveying and recording this spiritual work. Archimandrite George, abbot of the monastery of Grigoriu, wrote in the preface to the book, quote, The Lord who loves mankind and who gives us what our soul truly desires, has given to A.I.V. the grace to love the spiritual atmosphere of the holy mountain and to hear its mystical heartbeat of the prayerful words, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me, a sinner. He has spoken with the holy fathers and has received their blessings. He has heard words spoken of eternal life, and out of the fullness of his heart, he offers these conversations to his brethren. Christmas. My third visit to the Holy Mountain that year began on the day after Christmas, when I went to the monastery of Grigorio to spend two weeks there. Since the Holy Mountain celebrates these feasts with the old calendar, it was two weeks before Christmas, and that year I experienced the days before Christmas and the Feast of the Nativity of Christ for a second time. These blessed impressions will remain unforgettable in my memory. The abbot, Archimandrite George, showed me much love and made sure that everything was arranged so that I could live hesychistically. The atmosphere of the monastery also helped in this with young monks who had zeal, but also the fact that there were few pilgrims because it was winter. Apart from the long and splendid services in church which prepared us appropriately for the Christmas feast and discussions with the abbot and the fathers of the monastery on spiritual matters, I experienced the spirit of divine inspiration. Everything spoke to me of God and inspired me to pray. After the services, I would go at once to the cell. Love for God and prayer were kindled by many small things. The quietness of the cell, gazing at the sea, visiting Kathisma, small dependencies of the monastery, reading patristic texts, even lighting the wood-burning stove. Strange, then the trees, the plants, moonlight, rain, wind, and so on. I lived the festive celebration of creation. I visited a cathisma of the monastery high up on the mountain, where there was a monk, and I sensed an, an ineffable fragrance. I asked him what incense he used, and he was surprised, because he had not burnt incense that day. Apparently his prayer emitted this fragrance of grace. The royal hours, vespers on Christmas Eve with the divine liturgy of St. Basil the Great, matins in the divine liturgy of St. John Chrysostom on Christmas Day, the refectory to which we went in the dark before sunrise as laid down in the Tipicon, the reading of St. Gregory the Theologian's homily. All these things were evocative of paradise, a feast of participation and the wedding of the king. I did not want this heavenly banquet to come to an end. 
After the Divine Liturgy on Christmas Day, I left the Holy Mountain for the world, where they had celebrated the Feast of Theophany. In some way, I celebrated Christmas, Theophany, and Pascha together. So, in 1977, I did not visit the monastery of St. John the Baptist in Essex, but with the blessing that I had received from Father Sophroni, I visited the holy mountain and came to know its depth. Thus, the monastery in Essex was united with the holy mountain in my being. I felt that what I had experienced at the monastery in Essex, the spirit of Hieromonk Sophroni of the holy mountain, which was simultaneously the atmosphere of the life and teaching of St. Siloan the Athenite, and the holy ascetic Elder Joseph the cave-dweller was a preparatory stage for a better, better knowledge of the holy mountain and its deepest heart. 1978 At Easter in 1978, I visited the holy mountain again. From when I was a student in 1965, I had been a humble visitor and pilgrim to the holy mountain every year, but from the time when I was ordained to the clergy in 1971, I used to go at least three times a year. I would visit monasteries and skeets, cathismas and small dependencies and hermitages, looking for spiritual nourishment. One of the most essential stops for spiritual supplies that Easter was Elder Theocletos of Dionysiu, a spiritual debater, unrivaled in his use of words and expertise and patristic wisdom, and an important figure on the holy mountain. I sought a meeting with him. He had been informed that I was behind the initials A.I.V on the book A Night in the Desert of the Holy Mountain. As soon as he saw me, he said, Are you the culprit? I pretended not to understand, but it was impossible to insist when faced with his torrent of words. He asked me, Who was that hermit to whom you talked? There are many hesychists on the holy mountain, he mentioned a few names, but they do not know about Buddhism, as you write in the book, comparing it with noetic prayer, nor about stoic dispassion. Without waiting for an answer, he went on, I said that the hermit to whom you spoke was Elder Sophroni in Essex, who knew about transcendental meditation and noetic prayer. He had experience and education and is able to write about hesychism. I listened in silence, neither affirming nor denying. He asked me if I had met Father Sophroni. I answered in the affirmative and told him about it. He began to sing the praises of Father Sophroni. He asked me, with the simplicity of a small child, Has Father Sophroni seen the uncreated light? I answered, Father Theocletos, you have experience and you perceive these things. When you read the book that Father Sophroni wrote about Start Siloan, you must surely have understood that he has seen the uncreated light, because otherwise he would not have interpreted the personality of Start Siloan in that way, and also he would not have analyzed such profound subjects with such obvious assurance. He accepted what I said, remarking, if there is a hesychist today who has experienced orthodox hesychism in depth and, most important of all, can put it into words and compare it with other traditions, it is Elder Sophroni. He took the opportunity to explain to me in detail that the knowledge of God, according to the Holy Fathers, is not rational but something that involves the whole of life. It is experience. To be a great father, like St. Gregory the Theologian, St. Basil the Great, St. Greg Gregory Palamas and others who dealt with the heretics of that era, one must have noetic capacity and the vision of God, but also education, that is to say, knowledge of the philosophy used by the heretics. Knowledge of philosophy and the so-called wealth of the mind must be subordinated to holiness. The problem, however, is how they can be subordinated. Perfect purity from passions, or rather the transformation of the passions, is required. The pure heart knows how to discern things and to reject or accept. In reply to a question of mine on the subject, he went on to expound the teaching of St. Maximus the Confessor, saying that the disciple's attitude to his spiritual father 
ought to be distinguished by respect, fear, and love. Fear without love gives rise to hatred, and love without fear causes audacity. When love is not linked with fear and respect, this is not a healthy spiritual state, but an unhealthy sentimental one. As I was leaving his cell, he pronounced me blessed, because I had been found worthy to meet Father Sophroni, whom, as he said, is higher than St. Siloan. In fact, when he wrote a criticism of Father Sophroni's book about Start Siloan in his periodical Athenite Dialogues, he asked himself who ought to be praised, the subject of the biography or the biographer. Later, I heard Father Sophroni say that that was stupid because St. Siloan was at an exalted level in the spiritual life. After Father Theoclitos, I visited the ever-memorable Yeronda Frem of Katanakia. From New Skeet, I climbed up my beloved path, which I took every year toward St. Anne, little St. Anne in Katanakia. I found Elder Ephraim in a state of Hezekiah. He mentioned to me that some people had told him not to receive me again, because many considered that I had published the discussion that I had with him. However, he said to me, quote, I shall tell you some more so that you can include it in the second edition of the book, end quote. I remember that he referred mainly to two of his experiences. One was about the relationship between tears and the vision of the uncreated light. Intense prayer comes first, then a splitting headache, followed by floods of tears. The tears purify all his thoughts. The ascetic requires noetic hezekiah and purity. And then, at a moment when he does not expect, his noose is caught up in theoria of the light. The other experience referred to the vision of the uncreated light of the Holy Trinity. One evening, while saying the Jesus prayer in his hermitage, facing the sea, he saw three lights. At first he thought it was fishermen fishing. He saw, however, that the lights were coming towards his hermitage. They entered it, filled the whole place, and he fell to the ground. He sensed that the triune God was embracing him. The joy was unspeakable. With difficulty, he recovered from the ecstasy, as grass gradually stands up again after someone steps on it. I asked him about Elder Joseph the Hezekist, who had initiated him into noetic prayer. He told me a lot about that blessed Hezekist. I was incredibly impressed by his statement, With that blessed Elder, when I celebrated the Divine Liturgy in his cell, I was replete with grace. This testimony that I was replete with grace is amazing. He expressed his admiration for Father Sofroni from what he had heard about him, and he was intensely aware of him in his heart. Everywhere I went on the holy mountain, I heard positive comments about Father Sofroni. Certainly, there were a few people who said that Father Sofroni was a Russian spy and gave their own interpretations of his relationship with Balfour. This was a superficial judgment. How could such an ascetic who beheld God act as a spy? In the previous chapter of this book, this slanderous statement is refuted. This was my reason for insisting on this point. Shortly after Easter, in June of the same year, 1978, I made my second visit to the monastery of St. John the Baptist in Essex, England. Anyone who reads the whole of this chapter will ascertain that my contact and spiritual relationship with Father Sofroni became more substantial and profound as time passed. The first edition of my book, A Night in the Desert of the Holy Mountain, which was published in the spring of 1978, as mentioned above, had reached Father Sofroni before I visited the monastery. When I met him on the path on that first day, I was extremely hesitant and ashamed at the thought that such a great hesychist and theologian had read the book written by an infant in the spiritual life about noetic prayer. He understood my hesitancy, and to give me courage, he called the book a bestseller, as he had heard that the first edition had sold out in a few weeks. Subsequently, he said, on the, other hand, on the one hand, 
that the content of the book was in the right perspective, but on the other, he made his own comments on it. He said that he was afraid for me. I asked why. He replied that he was afraid for me spiritually because the devil would envy me and would fight hard against me. He also told me when I write to be careful not to use strong expressions. Usually I should make use of patristic views to conceal any possible personal experience. Because I had put a photograph in the book of the cave of the Holy Trinity near the monastery of St. Paul, where he lived for a while and had written underneath it, this cave became Tabor, a contemporary God-seeing Moses lived here. He said to me decisively, that was stupid. He said that when he saw that photograph with that caption, he was horrified and he advised me not to put it in the second edition. I complied. It should be noted here that many people attempted to discover the monk in the desert with whom I had had the discussion on the Jesus prayer that was recorded in the book. Personally, I was deeply surprised that readers attributed the discussions to many contemporary ascetics. Elder Ephraim of Katanakia told me that he used to reply to those who told him that he was the one who spoke to me. Quote, Don't try and find out who the hermit was. Try to put what he teaches into practice and read this book, which, with the things he writes, is like a spiritual bombshell. End of quote. Elder Porfirios of Kafsokalivi telephoned me and said, quote, Father Herotheus, have we ever had a conversation on these matters? Because everyone who reads your book has told me that it resembles what I teach them. End of quote. And Father Theocletus of Dionysia told me that to everyone who asked him about who the hermit was, he replied that, quote, the hermit monk with whom Father Herotheus spoke was Elder Sophroni, who knew about Buddhism and Stoic philosophy and refers to such subjects. End quote. In fact, Father Theocletus of Dionysio wrote to me in a letter much later in Pascha 1995. A suggestion, he writes, would it not increase the prestige of the book A Night in the Desert of the Holy Mountain if in the new edition... The words were added after the foreword. Quote, now that the great theologian, the Russian hero monk Sophroni, has passed away, I feel the need to reveal that the book was not produced in a night on the holy mountain, but in two nights, the second in Essex. End quote. In my opinion, it should also be subtitled And One Night in Essex with Father Sophroni. The great respect that Father Theocletus of Dionysio felt for Father Sophroni is clear from a paragraph in the same letter. He writes, quote, Now that I've reached 80 and read my early works, I wondered whether it might not have been better to postpone writing for 20 years so that they would have been written with greater fluency, more illumination, and more intense participation. Does it not impress you that the great Sophroni wrote very few books. So be it. God sees the heart and rewards each one according to his intention. End of quote. Be that as it may, I glorified God when I heard that the discussion in my book was being ascribed to many great contemporary monks of the desert, and it became clear that what I have written in the book expresses the experience and life of the church. As at that time, Father Sophroni's book, His Life is Mine, had been translated into modern Greek and published, Father Sophroni took the opportunity to refer to that as well and to tell me, quote, Europeans do not understand at all about mourning. They regard it as an unhealthy state. That is why I did not write anything in the book about mourning, end of quote. And he continued, That book that I wrote is for Europeans. The chapter, The Tragedy of Man, could not be written in a book intended for Orthodox Christians. Perhaps a few words about the tragedy of man could be written for Orthodox readers. For that reason, I am now writing another more analytical book that will relate to the Orthodox. 
He was referring to the book, We Shall See Him As He Is, which was published later. It is well known that in every genuine monastery, the daily common life centers on two focal points, the church and the refectory. As well as these two central points, every monk has his cell and the work that he is given to do. It was not easy for someone to enter Father Sophroni's bungalow. I once went into the small kitchen to give him something he had requested. I would pass outside his bungalow on my way to the monastery garden, and I always went by with the deepest respect, asking noetically for his prayers from outside. However, the elder lived in church, particularly at the holy altar during the divine liturgy, and also in the monastery refectory. Every Sunday he would celebrate in All Saints Church. He celebrated the divine liturgy with extreme concentration. He had great inner tension, as though his heart was drawing his whole noose. But this tension did not show on his face, which was joyful, with no sign of anxiety. This indicated that his noose was separated from his reason and was celebrating in the sanctuary of his heart, whereas his reason was following the order of the divine liturgy. Once during the service of the Tipica, before the little entrance, he had sat down in a chair to rest, and I discerned that his noose was deeply absorbed in his heart, without him losing his awareness. This was clear from the fact that on the one hand his head was not bent downwards, as happens when someone relaxes and falls asleep, but on the other hand, at the appropriate moment, he immediately stood up for the little entrance. This means that his reason was following what was happening in the church while his noose was deep in his heart. He did not, of course, express himself or say anything about his experiences. In his liturgical gestures, he was magnificent, contrite, and concentrated on the place of the heart. When he blessed the people, everyone perceived that he was receiving a blessing. The movement of the hand that was blessing was slow, and his attention followed its movement with his eyes. His very deep voice helped, as did the slow rhythm with which he declaimed the final clause of each prayer and the slow movement of his hand in blessing. It is easy to understand why many people felt very profound compunction when the elder celebrated the divine liturgy. There were some who told him that they saw and sensed God's grace, and which led them to repentance, mourning, and prayer. Another important place where I met the elder almost every day was the monastery refectory. When it was time for the midday meal, the elder would come from his bungalow, accompanied by a monk, following the cement path, which he had designed to have the appropriate bends, so as not to be completely straight. This image of the elder's slow approach against the background of the intensely green surroundings of the monastery with the tall trees and lawn was wonderful. He was always calm and pleasant. He ate in an aristocratic manner. His behavior was noble in every respect. He always found ways of guiding people from his abundant experience. I remember that one day in the refectory we were reading from the sayings of the fathers about a monk who had a blasphemous thought about uh, and uh, Abba Piman advised him to speak to the devil and contradict him as though he had him in front of him. Father Sophroni stopped the reading and said, quote, that too is one way of dealing with the devil, but the best way for the beginner to deal with the devil is not to talk to him, but to despise him because he probably will not be able to endure that dialogue, and then it will turn out badly. His soul will be troubled because the devil will leave his energy, which will disturb that man's soul. In the refectory, he would congratulate anyone who happened to be celebrating that day or had some sort of anniversary. He would say a few words about the one whose feast it was and immediately afterwards would give the signal for those present to sing, Lord have mercy, three times in the first plagal tone, in the Athenite manner, but more slowly. I had confided to Father Zacharias that I celebrated the 11th July. And he told the elder, full of enthusiasm, the elder mentioned it to the brethren during the midday meal. He said that 
In Russia, they used to name the child after the saint on the day of which he was born, but it was the first time that he had heard of someone celebrating the day of his baptism, his spiritual birthday. He asked the monks to sing, Lord, have mercy. After the meal, I approached him to thank him, and he said to me, In the 40 years that you will celebrate the liturgy, commemorate my name. I responded, And you, Father, commemorate me in heaven. He answered, If I go. I said, I believe that you will go. He replied, If I go to heaven, I shall pray for the whole world, as Start Silawan used to say. Usually, after the various the meal, various people would go up to him to ask for his blessing, sometimes pilgrims who had arrived that day, and sometimes those who were staying for a while but wanted to ask him something. He would reply to everyone. One day, after the prayers in the refectory, he called me so that he could expound to me the wall paintings of the Holy Trinity that had been painted. I had noticed that the faces, which he himself had painted, showed that their noose was in their heart, the whole perspective was directed towards the heart and showed the hesychistic life and noetic prayer. When the elder painted icons, he depicted his spiritual state, his own self. He told me, We try to choose colors and scenes that do not impose, but can be accepted with pleasure. We use gentle colors. When I said, Do you mean sweet? He replied, Not sweet, but gentle, because sweetness is not always good. I asked, why? And he answered, it is not good. That's just how it is. On many occasions, he was brief and did not go into detail. A few days after my arrival at the monastery, I asked the elder for a private meeting. He accepted, and we went to the usual place, the office next to the chapel of St. John the Baptist. Among other things, he said the following, which I set down in writing immediately after the discussion. 1978 continued. Among other things, he said the following, which I set down in writing immediately after the discussion. The dogma of the Holy Trinity is related to our life because man is in the image and likeness of God. What is our relationship with God? The person, hypostasis. The Father lives in the Son and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit lives in the Father and the Son. This unity does not do away with the particular hypostatic properties of the persons. We too were created as persons in order to have communion with the triune God. The hypostatic principle is inherent within us. After the sin, we became individuals, egotists. Now, however, that we have been united with Christ, the hypostatic principle is activated and we become real persons. God lives in us and we in Him. We love God and all human beings. The expression of the person of God is His love, which descended to Hades, and the expression of our person is our love, which descends to Hades through self-emptying and self-hatred. We Christians become persons when we are united among ourselves in Christ and live one within the other through love. Thus we live according to the Trinity. And an Orthodox Christian is one who has right belief, that is to say, correct faith, and who glorifies and prays aright. In other words, faith is connected with prayer and worship. As Orthodox, we believe God and glorify Him as Trinity and love the Triune God. This is the difference between us and other religions, which have a God with one hypostasis. Our love for God and our brother is a confession of faith. Consequently, When we love God, we confess Him. And usually other religions and other systems conceive and construct the idea of God through man. In the Orthodox Church, we perceive man through the presence of God. Insofar as man is in God's image and likeness. So, correct knowledge of God is a prerequisite for knowing man and for solving his problems. And Each one of us is saved from a particular point. The church's preaching is general. Each one, however, takes what he needs and makes progress through asceticism and obedience by putting Christ's commandments into practice. 
We shall love other people when we pray for them. In order to understand what bothers someone else, we must pray for him with our heart. Then we see his needs and take care to solve them. If one's heart does not feel anything, one should not speak. When one speaks to monks, the only issue that he can definitely raise is obedience. Obedience is the basis of the monastic life. When someone is obedient, his heart has become very sensitive and he grasps the problems that concern the other person and helps him. By being obedient to the elder, he receives the tradition and life that the elder has. Obedience has many aspects. There is obedience to the tradition of the church, obedience to the bishop, obedience to the elder, and ultimately obedience to everyone. When one gives way to the will of others in secondary matters that do not constitute a transgression of God's commandments. Some people think that monks do nothing. That is how it seems, because monks do what other people don't. But monks have a secret. The center of their life is God. They are united with God, who is the center of the world, and so they too become in Christ lords of the whole world. Monks are perfect Christians. During my stay at the monastery, it was possible for me to encounter the elder either by chance or according to my own plan, particularly in the afternoons when he came out of his bungalow and went for a walk, accompanied by various monks along the concrete paths or on the narrow road outside the monastery. At every meeting, he found a spiritual word to offer. I had noticed that every contact with the elder, even if just for a few seconds, was a source of inspiration, because he always said a word that was a window enabling one to see a heavenly and eternal realm. Every word of his was theological, prophetic, instructive, and opened up spiritual horizons. For instance, one day he found me in the garden. He showed me an oak and said, That tree grows very strong, very slowly, first putting down deep roots. It is the same with the monk. He grows and makes progress gradually through repentance, but he is deeply rooted for centuries. On another occasion, I told him that although he was advanced in years, he was in good physical shape and was able to write. He replied lightheartedly, Moses began shepherding the people of Israel when he was 80. He offered me many gifts as blessings and spiritual treats. I remember one such treat very vividly. A Greek lady who lived nearby and used to come regularly to the monastery with her whole family invited me to her house for supper. At the same time, she invited two other monks with me. When they came to collect us from the monastery, the monks said that they were unable to come with us. She was upset. At that moment, the elder passed by and asked her why she was unhappy. When he found out the reason, he said, Don't worry, I shall come with Father Herotheus. She was delighted. We went to the town where she lived. On the way, the elder sang, Lord have mercy, many times and said various spiritual things. When we reached the house and went through the door, he immediately gave a magnificent blessing as he did at every divine liturgy, and said, Peace be to this house. He sprinkled the room with holy water, which he had brought with him, and asked me to sprinkle the remaining rooms. Then he sat down, greeted the children in a childlike spirit, but at the same time, seriously. He gave them chocolates and showed them love. He held the view that we should speak to children as though they were adults, but according to what they would understand at their age. We should take them seriously, even when they behave superficially. He said that we should treat them as persons because they would realize it and respect us. During the meal, one of the things I remember is that in reply to a question from the mother, he said that the mother is the best protector of the child. She should make the sign of the cross over the child and pray for him or her. He mentioned that his mother gave him a cross and he had it on him always, and that cross protected him from many dangers that he went through in his life. The mother's blessing and prayer, he continued, play an important role in the child's life since the mother usually prays with pain. And when prayer 
is accompanied by pain, it is powerful. Father Sofroni was courteous in the extreme, not only by nature and upbringing, but also out of spiritual sensitivity. As he had beheld God, he loved all God's creations, and he saw God's image in every human being. He even respected small children whose hearts were pure. He did not want to grieve anyone. One woman who met him said to him joyfully, How are you, Father? Using an idiomatic phrase in Greek, which literally means, What are you doing to me, Father? He did not understand the expression and asked with concern, What have I done to you? He became calm, however, when I explained that the phrase means something else. Another woman, when he advised her how to deal with a certain issue, began to weep bitterly over her own problem. The elder asked her anxiously, Perhaps I said something that wounded you. These two incidents show his courtesy and the delicacy of his behavior. Also, when speaking Greek, he spoke to everyone in the polite plural form. As that year, too, I stayed almost a month in the monastery, timidly, I asked him if he had time available that we might have another discussion. He accepted, and at that meeting, the things he told me are included in the following. All the difference between orthodoxy and other confessions lies in the teaching about Jesus Christ as hypostasis, as the God-man, theanthropos. Otherwise, there is no salvation. An impersonal being who is not hypostasis person and did not take flesh cannot save man. Far from Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. There is no fullness or perfect salvation. This is what distinguishes delusion from the truth from orthodoxy. All the differences between the non-orthodox and the orthodox start from the fact that the non-orthodox do not know about the hypostasis of God and man. Saul, that is Paul, felt he was making war on Christians in the name of God. For him, God was impersonal until then. However, when he saw Christ and the Holy Spirit and conversed with him, he knew the hypostatic God, the God-man Christ. Immediately in the Holy Spirit, he recognized him and became his servant and his apostle. Anyone who knows the hypostatic God the God-man Theanthropos knows the real God. Outside Christ, the impersonal holds sway. The Romans, he meant the Roman Catholics, ascribe importance in their liturgy to Christ's words, take, eat, and consider that the consecration takes place at that moment. But Christ as man, his human nature, made supplication and prayed to his Father. For that reason, the prayer of consecration is a prayer to the Father to send the Holy Spirit and to change the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. When we rely only on these words of Christ and do not pray to the Father to send the Holy Spirit, we are committing Adam's sin, which is self-deification. The apostles said that God raised Jesus from the dead. They do not separate the energy of the Son from the Father and the Holy Spirit as the energy of the triune God is shared. The non-Orthodox live in ignorance. God will judge them accordingly. But for us Orthodox, salvation is deification, that is to say, our union with Christ through his holy commandments and the mysteries. If the priest, together with priestly grace, the priesthood, does not also have kingly authority, the activation and development of the grace of baptism, that is to say, purification from the passions and resurrection from sin, then his priestly work will yield nothing. It is progress in prayer when the praying noose finds the place where the deep heart is. When someone feels his heart, all the fruits of prayer begin from there. The union of noose and heart is accomplished by the energy of the Holy Spirit and is revealed by the continuous shedding of tears. Through tears and mourning, the heart becomes very sensitive. During prayer, the attention, the noose, should be concentrated in the deep heart. According to the fathers of the church, the heart first feels the grace of God and then the experience is expressed through the rational faculty. During prayer, one ought to feel warmth in the heart. The absence of divine grace is marked by iciness and coldness of heart. 
When we read or pray, it is good to feel the warmth and movement of the heart. However, this should happen gradually, because in weak and unaccustomed hearts, it may even cause physical disorders, in which case one stops praying and prayer works in another way. When, however, the heart is strong, it is recommended that one remains there during prayer. The descent of the noose into the heart is helped by breathing in and out, but it is better for it to descend through repentance. In these cases, the pain in the heart is completely healthy and natural. When the noose descends to the heart, it does not go down completely, but leaves a small remnant. This remnant may be occupied with other things without the noose leaving the heart. For instance, in the Divine Liturgy, we can pray with the heart and feel its warmth and at the same time say to the deacon or the concelebrating priest something connected with the tipikon, without our noose being distracted from prayer in the heart. When, however, this remainder of the noose runs after other things, it may lead the whole noose astray and extract it from the heart. For that reason, one ascetic used to keep count on the prayer ropes he had prayed during noetic prayer in order to satisfy this remnant and stop it becoming involved in other things. Consequently, one loves God with one's heart. It is the heart that distinguishes whether we have gone wrong or whether we are devoted to God's will. When we are aware that our noose is concentrated in the heart with repentance and warmth, we ought not to breathe in and breathe out. We should stop that method when our heart is warm. It is natural, in accordance with nature, for a man to be aware of a woman's body and a woman of a man's body. This is how the human race reproduces. Homosexuality is an unnatural state. Monasticism is a state above nature. Without divine grace, the desire for what is natural becomes unnatural, because without God, everything is sin. In the monk, the presence of divine grace fills everything. This is a supranatural phenomenon. The thoughts that come into the noose, particularly during prayer, show the existence of a passion. The more often the same thought comes, the more deeply rooted it means that those specific passions are. Such a passion has deep roots, and great labor and suffering is needed in order to cure it. So thoughts during prayer help us to discern our state and our passions. The same happens as with a cinematographic, cin cinematographic film. Excuse me. When there is light behind the film, then everything appears clearly on the screen. In the absence of light, it is not clear what is happening. And there are few of us monks left in the world. Everyone is against us. So there should be love between us. The older tradition of the monasteries on the holy mountain required that young monks should not be ordained to the clergy to avoid vainglory, as priests are honored on the holy mountain. Today, however, it seems that young monks seek ordination because they cannot endure the hardship of the monastic life. Father Gabriel, the abbot of the monastery of Dionysio, asked Father Seraphim, abbot of the monastery of St. Paul, What do you want with that spy? Note, he meant Father Sofroni, who at that time was spiritual father of the monastery of St. Paul, as some regarded him as a Russian spy. Father Seraphim did not reply. Later on, when Father Gabriel had problems at his monastery with the monks, he asked Father Seraphim to tell them how he ought to deal with them and what he himself did about such issues. Father Seraphim replied, I recommend that you take Sophroni, the spy, as spiritual father. I have him at the monastery, and I will have peace and quiet. Someone said that all the idlers become monks. I replied to him, but not many people become monks, although many are idle. It is natural for women to cling psychologically in the beginning. This is, however, a problem. There are three levels, spiritual, psychological, and physical. In women, the psychological level is nearer to the spiritual, so they regard psychological things as spiritual. In men, psychological matters 
are nearer to physical things, so they seek physical enjoyment and pleasure. As spiritual fathers, we should not turn away women because they start off more on the psychological level or stay there. We should tell them that we are seeking their salvation. It is natural for women to begin psychologically by looking for support from men and from the spiritual father. The spiritual father must be mature and not let thoughts dominate him. He should attempt to raise women to a higher spiritual level. If the spiritual father notices a psychological attachment, he ought not to send them away because they may feel deprived of the presence of the spiritual father and fall into despair. It is different if the spiritual father himself suffers harm in this case. If that happens, he ought not to hear women's confessions. In the beginning, when a woman comes to confession and has been through a lot, she's usually a wreck and feels very low. When she benefits a little from the spiritual father, she may become devoted to him out of gratitude. The spiritual father, however, should accept from her only her desire to become holy and nothing else. When women are upset by the absence of their spiritual father, this is unhealthy. However, we must help them with discretion and prayer. I mentioned to him the case of someone who had fallen into small transgression that was not a hindrance to the priesthood and who wanted to become a priest. He told me, This specific misdeed does not prevent someone from becoming a priest, but it ought to prompt us to identify the existence of the passion and to cure it, because otherwise, if he becomes a member of the clergy, he will not be spiritually mature. There are two ways of curing unsatisfied physical desires of the flesh. One is abundant divine grace, and the other is the absence of the former. In the absence of the former is ascetic practice. The abundance of God's grace does not allow someone to have evil thoughts. For instance, when we are crossing a road with traffic and we are careful out of fear, do we have evil thoughts? No. So when divine grace concentrates the noose, no margin is left for evil thoughts ideas, and desires. Ascetic practice, on the other hand, requires a struggle with thoughts. We have to struggle so that the image and the idea do not go on to become desire and action. This is called spiritual vigilance and hezekiah. On the subject of having children, we have to take into account the woman's power of endurance because it is unbearable for many people today. They do not have the fortitude of previous generations. Women nowadays cannot even breastfeed for long. And many women, once they conceive, have to stay in bed since their constitution cannot take the strain. In general, on these issues, we should ascribe great importance to developing the spiritual life of the couple. With regard to sins that are known to other people, the spiritual father needs to deal with them very carefully. For sins not known to others, it is possible to exercise economy, looking to the needs of the penitent and his salvation. When speaking to someone in order to avoid the possibility of sensing the energy that he transmits, one should avoid looking into his eyes and look instead at the place between his eyes, above the nose. Then, although one is Apparently paying attention to him, one is not subject to any energy that he may send out. When someone finds himself in different surroundings, he should avoid standing out. He should not be different from the others. He should do the same in the divine liturgy. He should not show that he is praying at that time because he will become vain. Philosophers can think correctly and right, but their life may be different. This means that they do not live with the heart, but with the reason, and actually with fallen reason. Life at the monastery, an association with the elder and the monks who expressed the elder's experience and were the spiritual children of this blessed man, was a daily education. Everything brought inspiration. Every word was a revelation. One could acquire many things for one's pastoral ministry, even through a simple word. One day, I met the elder on the lane outside the monastery. He was taking a walk with Father Kirill. Father Kirill said to the elder, Our beloved father, Herothius, 
And Father Sofroni replied, He has managed to, to make us love him. He invited me to join them, as on other occasions, and said to me lightheartedly, We shall be peripatetic philosophers. He put me on his right and Father Kirill on his left. He said humorously, I am between two great men. To support himself, but also to show unity, he took us by the elbow, and the three of us walked along together. He began to teach us. Of course, neither of us interrupted him. At one point I asked him something, and he continued talking. I felt that he was a theologian and prophet. Some of the things he said were as follows. Nineteen seventy eight continued. Some of the things he said were as follows I am very insistent on the divinity of Christ, on the union of the divine and human nature in Christ, in his hypostases. The God man, Christ, is the bridge between uncreated and created. Without him, it is impossible to acquire knowledge of God. You should say that continually in your sermons. This is the most basic point. The Buddhists and the Muslims believe in a suprapersonal being. Thus, salvation is abolished. Many people attempt to live the spiritual life only in the Divine Liturgy on Sunday, but all week they are outside the ascetic life. These people cannot understand monasticism. Those who do not live evangelically and ascetically all week cannot live liturgically on Sunday. Those who slander and defame a member of the clergy do him a great deal of good. They humble him. However, not many people should criticize him because he will become embittered. And where there is bitterness, God's grace does not act. Being defamed helps the member of the clergy since it acts as a brake in the way that the brake stops a car when it is headed for a precipice. But it does not benefit the slanderer. When people praise a member of the clergy, he should rejoice, but also humble himself, because he is a minister of Christ, who endured humiliations and the cross. Tears are essential for the monk and for the Christian. There are worldly tears and divine tears. The distinction between them is clear from the fact that worldly, self-centered tears come from being despised by people from the loss of worldly valuables and goods, whereas spiritual divine tears spring from repentance, the desire for salvation and eternal life. God revealed the words, Keep your mind in hell and despair not, to Staretz Siloan. I believe this, and I understood it, just as I realized later on that this is evident in the life of Christ. The Apostle Peter confesses, You are the Son of God and Christ announces the passion, the descent into Hades and his resurrection. The announcement of the passion is closely linked with the confession of Christ's divinity. This is, keep your mind in hell and despair not. Not everyone can keep his noose in hell. It also depends on his strength. This is the privilege of the few, the strong, because it is possible to fall into despair. When after the experience of hell, the hope of salvation comes, this means that it is the action of divine grace. The energy of the passions stops with the thought, keep your mind in hell and despair not, and the eternal spirit enters us. Then someone does not feel that in the future he will possess the kingdom of God because he already has it within him. This phrase has been revealed to many people and they have lived it personally, but it has been kept secret down through the centuries. I felt I was the possessor of a great inheritance that I must proclaim to the world. After a carnal sin, prayer ceases, whereas theological writing may continue. This is the difference between theology as a gift of the Holy Spirit and theology as human learning. Prayer shows the purity of soul and body. It is possible for someone to theologize, to write, to be an academic, but not to pray and not to be holy. I want to live the life of a hermit, not to act a part, to be what I am, 
When I laugh, there are people who will take offense. When I am serious, again, they take offense. But I want to be natural, simple. The monks in our monastery do not live as I lived in the desert of the holy mountain, but I am pleased because they are good monks and live in a natural way and are not hypocrites. They do not put on an act. They receive everyone, rich and poor, in the same way without making any distinction, and they try to help everyone. When there are no monks, faith will be lost. I am glad that your bishop, Metropolitan Kalinikos of Edessa, loves monks. Monks are not idlers. They benefit every continent, the whole of humanity. Parish priests restrict their activity to one parish, but monks benefit the whole world. People come from all over the world to our monastery. Star at Siloan, with the physical constitution that he possessed, could have fathered many children, but the grace of God kept him completely self-controlled. He did not have a single carnal thought. When he went to the monastery and was inexperienced in the spiritual struggle, after eating, he fell into a sin. From then on, he did not accept a carnal thought for the rest of his life, in obedience to the words of his spiritual father. On the holy mountain, as a spiritual father, I also encountered some mostly young men who used to practice self-abuse. In this case, the cure is to fix their noose on prayer, on God. When inner prayer and spiritual inspiration develop, the energy of the passion ceases. When after a nocturnal fantasy we wake up troubled, that means that we experienced sensual pleasure. This is countered by repentance and grace, weeping, prayer, and the union of the noose with the heart. Many spiritual fathers have difficulties in dealing with the issue of childbearing in relation to Holy Communion. Discernment and God's illumination are required. One general comment is that great care is needed not to rebuke people thoughtlessly because they will be disappointed and will leave the church. In addition, being deprived of Holy Communion for a long time deadens people and distances them from the church. Many people live with the desire for Holy Communion. If we deprive them of it, they cannot withstand various temptations. Wisdom and prayer are required, and it depends on the Christians who come to make their confession. We ought to help them to live penitentially and prayerfully, to go to church and to keep Christ's commandments. Also, some exercise self-control beyond their strength. On this subject, it is impossible to lay down a common line for everyone. This is a matter for the spiritual father and the penitent. When there is a possibility of economy, we should give Holy Communion sometimes, as long as we see progress in their spiritual life. Before my departure from the monastery at the midday meal, I asked to say goodbye to him, and he asked the monks to bring us a cup of tea in the office next to the chapel. These are some of the things he said. There are no clear-cut divisions between positive and negative theology. Positive theology has negative elements. When we say that God is merciful, which is a positive word, even then we do not know in depth what the mercy of God is, and this can be experienced negatively. When someone sees God, he sees him as light, that is to say positively, in which, according to St. John the Evangelist, there is no darkness at all. But a negative path came first, denial of thoughts and rational energy, rejection of concepts. Also, our ignorance of God's essence in which man cannot share is called negativism. Then God is darkness. Beyond the light, there is nothing else. There is no darkness, as some people say. When the fathers teach that darkness follows after the theoria of the light, it is necessary to examine exactly what they mean. They either want to indicate the uncreated essence, or else this is simply a form of words to, for describing something very dramatic that goes beyond human capabilities. As human words cannot describe the abundance of light, they characterize it as darkness. This darkness, therefore, is the impossibility of describing the radiance of the uncreated light. Darkness also denotes the fact that human beings cannot share in the divine essence. I consider that 
the greatest sin in my life was being led astray into yoga and meditation at the time when I was dabbling in Eastern religions and denying Christ in practice. The greatest missionary work is accomplished through the divine liturgy. The fathers erected an altar in every country or city to which they went. This is because when the heart melts in the divine liturgy, it seeks God and begins to want to live the orthodox ecclesiastical life, which is centered on the divine liturgy. I have said to the brethren, first and foremost, to keep the divine liturgy in the monastery. The prayers in the divine liturgy ought not to be said in personal tone, because at that moment the priests are expressing all those who are praying, so the priests should not pray with personal emotions. They do not celebrate the liturgy as individuals. Some Anglicans, as soon as they become Orthodox as new converts, criticize their leaders and their confession. We need to be careful not to join in with this, nor to criticize Anglicanism to them, because their love for Anglicanism will probably return years later, and then our own ill-considered criticisms will be interpreted as attempts to proselytize. Westerners have lost the faith and fallen into a carnal way of life. But they have a culture, albeit human and rational, which keeps them at a certain level. They have descended very gradually. They have a high degree of courtesy. They draw the line somewhere and do not reach rock bottom. When the Orthodox, however, lose their faith, they do not have human culture to keep them in check, and they sink at once to rock bottom. Westerners have lost Orthodoxy, which shows the way to salvation. Thus some of them rely on reason separated from the heart, rationalism, and others rely on sentiment separated from the reason, sentimentalism. The noose is united with the heart only by the Holy Spirit, and man becomes in the image and likeness of God. I believe that the delusion of the world comes about through the Orthodox, excuse me, I believe that the salvation of the world comes about through the Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Church is always crucified, as Christ was, and we are crucified, not crucifiers. The higher the standing someone gains among the people, the more careful he needs to be about what he says and what he writes, because something that he says may not be Orthodox, and on account of his prestige it may spread quickly and be very dangerous. Among people in the West, love, eros, has become a science and an art. The explanation for this is love of pleasure and the fact that Westerners do not have God's energy and inspiration. Much care is needed when books are translated into Greek, which have the Western spirit, which is unrelated to that prevailing in the Orthodox East. It can be usually be observed that when someone knows Christ and begins to live the ecclesiastical life, he wants to become a priest. However, a long period of time needs to elapse for him to become established in the life of the church, and after that he can decide if he wants to become a priest or if he is suitable. Prayer, free from delusion, comes with weeping. If someone wants to become a real monk, he must learn to pray. He regards himself as a condemned man. Then a thought of self-accusation comes to him, a new thought comes every time. He should stay there, then his noose attaches itself to his heart. From this weeping, pain comes to his heart. This spiritual pain is essential. He feels this pain in the upper part of the bodily organ of the heart. If, however, the pain is in the lower part of the heart, this may easily cause the flesh to rebel, so this pain ought to be avoided. From this spiritual pain in the upper part of the heart, calm and peace spread to the whole body, and then someone can discern whether thoughts come from God or from the devil. Then he can also understand other people's thoughts. Thus, when a monk prays for others, he can immediately grasp their spiritual state. When a monk becomes accustomed to weep in this way, and the monastery becomes a hindrance to him, he goes out into the desert. When weeping comes automatically amidst continuous mourning, this is a sign that he should live as a hesychist in the desert. When one day a monk weeps for two or three hours with a pure mind, his noose may remain in God, 
for many days and not be distracted from there. He may not need to say the usual prayers and his prayer rule. Love is when one becomes everything to all men, when he behaves sincerely with those whom he meets and with whom he lives, when he has no desire to impose his own will, but accepts the will of others as his own. For noetic prayer, ordinary light from the sun or a lamp, or even the color of the walls, causes difficulties, as does noise. Darkness and quiet are required for practicing noetic prayer. The colors of the room should be dark and the icons not too bright. The Christian cannot pray many times a day with a sense of grace. God gives his grace now and again. When the noose prays noetic prayer and grows tired, it cannot pray intensely again that same day. How long the intensity lasts is different on each occasion. Sometimes one prays for one hour, sometimes two hours, and sometimes for a quarter of an hour. When it is done intensely, it is enough for the whole day. It is good, even for someone who has noetic prayer, to say the Jesus prayer out loud so that the ear can hear when he is tired of noetic effort. This should happen particularly when he is on his own. Sometimes during prayer the devil forms various images in the noose about his, the devil's, presence to frighten the one praying. For that reason there needs to be a very small light in the room, so that the one praying is not frightened by the idea that the devil is present. In the course of intense noetic prayer certain radiant thoughts come along. These are thoughts from the devil to distract our attention from prayer. During Theoria of the Uncreated Light there are no thoughts. The thoughts may also be good or natural, the natural thoughts of the noose. When the mind is concentrated and reflects, it has a certain inspiration. Care is needed lest this be mistaken for the grace of God, God's illumination. This is what is called the darkness of divestiture. Purified of material things and enlightened by the grace of God, the noose acquires a certain brightness. Theoria of the uncreated light is experienced beyond this state. The Christian may say the Jesus prayer very slowly out loud, and afterwards his attention may rest noetically in his heart, and the utterance of the prayer cease. As long as the strength of the noose endures, the Christian should remain there and watch. When his prayer weakens, he should say it again out loud. This too is a method of experiencing Hezekiah. Often the devil recalls to our memory sins that took place, or allegedly took place, in the past in order to cause despair. In such cases, the spiritual father needs to have discernment in order to cure his disciple. Often during the night we sense a cloud in our heart. Then we pray the Jesus prayer intensely. We repent, we weep, and the next day we get up full of joy. Someone who practices the Jesus prayer often has pains in his heart. This is not something wrong with the heart. Sometimes it results from the effort made, or at other times it is a temptation from the devil. In the second case, the devil suggests the thought that if he continues praying, he will die. For prayer to develop, this sort of trial must be gone through as well. He should say, let me die, and continue praying. Trees have green branches that bear fruit, but they also have some dry branches which do not harm the tree. It is the same with people. They may have some failings that do no harm. We ought to look at their virtues. When a thought or an unlawful love gets into us, it goes away with weeping. Every kind of evil leaves the soul by means of tears. When something or someone attracts our love more than the love of, for God, we are committing spiritual adultery. Beginners in the spiritual life form the words of the prayer imaginatively in the noose, which develops and cultivates their imagination. It is preferable at first to keep the prayer on our lips, to say it out loud with our mouths without imagining the words. On spiritual matters, one must go forward in the fear of God. Fear of God should be the basis. When doing something results in humility, this is a sign of God's good pleasure and of wholeness. The elder ought to keep his disciple on the border of despair. He should not praise him for his gifts. He should only encourage him at difficult moments, when incurable despair threatens. 
Then the disciple will make progress. The monastic life exploits every state. The monk benefits especially from insults and humiliations. When Elder Joseph the cave dweller prayed, the wild birds used to come and tap on the roof with their beaks. Someone could say that this was a temptation from the devil. I think that the birds were attracted by the elder's prayer. St. Seraphim of Serov lost the divine grace he had received because the following happened. There were two candidates for the post of the abbot at the monastery, St. Seraphim and someone else. St. Seraphim withdrew from the competition for the abbacy. However, when they sent him away from the monastery, he was aggrieved. This sadness was the cause of divine grace withdrawing from him or decreasing. It was necessary then for him to practice great asceticism and go through profound repentance, remaining on a rock for a thousand nights and a thousand days in order for divine grace to return. The feeling of worldly sadness and bitterness causes great harm. Monks are like merchants. Merchants make a million drachmas one day and the next day nothing, or they lose everything. The same happens to monks. One day they make a profit with tears and prayer, and the next day they lose everything by talking too much. After 20 minutes, conversation with people usually turns into chatter and criticism. He was asked if kissing was a sin. He answered, Everything outside God is a sin. Man far from God is in darkness. Whatever is in God is light and there is no darkness in it, and consequently there is no sin either. Whoever kisses someone else and remains in God, as parents kiss their children and spouses one another, does not sin. Whatever distances man from God, however, is sin. Since we are full of passions, we should avoid even what is regarded as free from passion. There are two expressions of true monasticism. The one is tears of repentance and despair over ourselves according to grace. The other is self-accusation. There are They are two sides of the same coin. The monk should weep in despair of himself. Then a pain arises in the heart. The heart is wounded, and from this wound, remembrance of God is produced. All night long he is on tenter hooks, and during the day he has an intense desire for God. This is the natural state of genuine monks, and it is the source of uninterrupted prayer. It is possible to pray so powerfully for a quarter of an hour with weeping and self-accusation that the noose is held in God all day long. This is one way of expressing the words, keep your mind in hell and despair not. This is a difficult task, but this is true monasticism. This is the content of all the church's hymns. Through the hymns we express our wretchedness, keep your mind in hell, and we seek God's mercy, despair not. And other different attitude to God is outside the spirit of the Orthodox Church and Orthodox ascetic practice. All our experience is summed up in the prayer against the only do we sin and the only do we worship. Whatever is said between elder and disciple is sacramental in character, and the devil cannot understand it. When, however, there is even a single discourse to a third person, the devil perceives it and begins to make war. Therefore, when someone wants to become a monk, he ought not to disclose it anywhere except to his spiritual father, because the devil will fight him. In order for a monk to mature, he must learn to wrestle with his thoughts. He must struggle and fight against the thought that gives him impure ideas about his elder. There is no way a monastery can be in a good state if the elder of the monastery is immoral. Even the perfect suffer harm when they hear praise. When a monk surrenders to thinking about the praises other people have addressed to him, he stops being a monk. An Orthodox monastery does as much missionary work as a parish. Also, creating and sustaining a monastery is more difficult than creating or sustaining a parish or a metropolis. If monastic communities have more than 12 monks following the example of the band of apostles, no productive work is done. Small companies of monks 
should have four monks together with their elder. A little while ago, I completed 50 years of monastic life. Someone said to me, What patience you have had to spend so many years in the monastic habit and asceticism. I answered him, Not what patience, but what a privilege. We read in the sayings of the fathers that a monk was attacked by a certain woman. He started to pray and found himself outside on the road. How did this happen? I think that praying intensely with grace, he went into ecstasy, and whether in the body or out of the body, he did not know. In that state, he walked out of the house. That is to say, he walked along physically without realizing it. And when he returned to himself, he saw that he had covered quite a distance on foot. Thus, in all difficult situations in our life, we ought to pray intensely in order to overcome problems. Usually, the devil does not allow another monk to come into a cell of a saint who has sanctified it with prayer. And if another monk does enter it, he wages a fierce war against him. It is as though the devil were taking revenge. I recommended the monks to be cheerful outside, like the English. However, when they got into their cell, as soon as they shut the door, they should start to weep and mourn. When the longing for Hezekiah and flight to the desert comes and goes, that means that it is not a mature desire. When a longing comes from God, it remains irrepressible. When someone has the desire for Hezekiah and monastic life and dies before he can put it into practice, he will be reckoned as a monk and ascetic by God. When a Cenobitic monk is ready for the Hezekistic life, they should let him leave the monastery, because if he stays there, he will be destroyed by the praises of the other monks. When wealthy people want to donate money and wish to get involved in the life of the monastery, we should not take it in order to preserve our spiritual freedom. We should tell them to put it anonymously in the collection box if they want to. When I was a spiritual father at the monastery of St. Grigoriu on the Holy Mountain in the 40s, one monk fell into delusion and told me that the idea had come to him to murder some other monk as he was in a good spiritual state, and thus he would help him to be saved. I advised him to tell Abbot Basarion in order to receive his blessing, because nothing happens in the monastery without a blessing. I said this so as not to, to transgress the confidentiality of the confession. The abbot, however, paid no attention and sent him away. Thus, the monk went in the evening to the cell of the monk about whom he had the evil thought, guided by the devil. He knocked on the door. The monk did not reply. But since the idea of murder had gotten into him, he knocked on the next door and murdered another monk. We should not be prisoners of an idea, and we should not act without obedience. We should not be tied down by dreams and aspirations. We ought to have no ties. If God wills something, He will give energy, grace, and strength for us to want it and to put it into practice. When a hermit visits a monastery, they ought not to take any notice of him because they may do him harm. It is possible that they may destroy him with the respect that they show him due to potential pride. Hearing confessions is a great and heavy task for the members of the clergy. But he must begin this task, even if he makes mistakes. He prays about every problem that God give him solutions. He should mention the first word that comes to him after intense prayer. In any case, no one is infallible. Only those who do not work do not, have mis do not make mistakes. The idle do everything well, don't they? People's growing love of psychology is a terrible thing. Psychology helps those in the West, but it is dreadful when the Orthodox learn psychology and substitute it for the niptic tradition of the Church. We must undermine Orthodox Christians' love of psychology because psychological methodologies outside the Orthodox tradition, and at the same time, it is characterized by the Western mentality. 
Carnal sin starts off as psychological and sentimental, and then comes to the body, at which point it attempts to find occasions to complete the fall. Some children mature very quickly physically, but the world of their soul does not mature easily. Some people want to combine married life with the sweetness of prayer as experienced by ascetics, but this cannot be done. As a result, they are distressed and lose hope. Noetic prayer requires purity of soul and body. We should guide them with discretion and tell them that it is better for prayer to stop rather than for communication with the other spouse to be interrupted and the family dissolved. If the family falls apart, the husband will look for another wife and probably the wife for another husband, and then prayer will be lost as well. Not only will the family break up, but prayer will also be lost. Spiritual life needs to be discreetly attuned to married life by an experienced spiritual father. If you want to destroy someone, tell him that he has a good voice or praise him for a gift that he has. People do not make a sincere confession immediately. A long time will pass before they put into the words what is troubling them, and often they will say it as though they had forgotten it. Much care is needed. We should show love and wait for their frank confession. Also, there are many who say, I will not tell everything in case the spiritual father deprives me of Holy Communion. We should encourage them to make a sincere confession, and when they confess sincerely, we should handle things with discernment. 1978 continued. There's a general phenomenon that we often observe. As soon as people know Christ, they sense the sweetness of the spiritual life, and immediately they want to abandon their work and devote themselves to Christ. Since, however, they have families, and this desire of theirs is fleeting, we must hold them back so they become stable in this spiritual activity. And as time passes, they will find ways of harmonizing God's will with their work. Then they will do what they want, or they will change their way of life without causing problems. The Apostle Paul faced the same problem with the Thess Thessalonian Christians who did not want to work once they came to know Christ. There are some spiritual fathers who impose a rule on women that they should have children, even when the doctor forbids it, regardless of whether they die. And they justify this by saying that the women will become martyrs. We should not violate people's freedom. We should find ways to cure them so that they freely obey God's will. Also, one can urge oneself on to martyrdom, but not others. There are spiritual fathers who, in order to be certain, keep the letter of the law. This gives them security. However, those spiritual fathers are more secure who put themselves at risk for the sake of brotherly love, and who apply economy, living the spirit of the law. By using economy through prayer, they feel that, that for love of their brethren they have transgressed the letter of the law. This reproach keeps them humble. By contrast, it is difficult for those who justify themselves as keepers of the law to be saved. Those spiritual fathers who are excessively strict cannot keep people with them or help them. Usually, I do not impose a rule with regard to prostrations. I do not lay down how many prostrations someone should do. Rather, I advise him to make prostrations until he is tired and until his body becomes accustomed to participating in prayer with his noose. In this way, everything is done with love and freedom without coercion. When the confessor regards the penitent with love and compassion without criticizing him, when he is confessing his falls, then he, the confessor, will benefit and receive grace, and will be enlightened to handle the problems correctly and to cure the wound. If, however, he criticizes him, even in thought, he will not be illuminated by God, and the penitent too will understand the spiritual father's attitude and will go away without being comforted. When people who had another spiritual father previously come to make their confession, 
We ought not to undermine the standing of their former spiritual father. We should recommend that they ask their previous spiritual father's blessing to come to us. Then the penitent will be blessed, but our own work will also go well. Otherwise, we will not succeed in this work, and they will leave us too. Bringing up children is difficult nowadays. Perhaps parents ought to look at themselves and develop themselves spiritually, so as not to forfeit their salvation. This comes first, and this will be transmitted to the children. The following happens with Orthodox books. Someone can write 500 pages, which are all in accordance with ecclesiastical teaching, and one mistake may be included as well. Everyone will dwell on the mistake and characterize the writer as a heretic. Great care is needed. When someone who is young makes a mistake, the others justify it as foolishness. When, however, he is of mature years and has some experience, they make no excuses for him at all. Concluding the discussion, I said many times, Your blessing, and he replied emphatically, You have it. I have your name written in the proscomidi. With the blessing of the elder and the assurance of his prayer, I left for Greece. As is evident, the elder was a great theologian and spiritual father and moved at high altitudes of the spiritual life. He did not bring his words down to a low level. When I was listening to him, I would often remember the beginning of the book of the prophet Isaiah, the vision of Isaiah which he saw, Isaiah 1.1. The beginning of the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The word of God came to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1 1. And the book of the prophet Malachi. The burdened prophetic oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by the hand of his messenger, Malachi 1 1. The elder's word was the vision of God, the word of God, and the burden of the word of the Lord. For that reason, some people did not understand him. A certain bishop had spoken against him. He told me that all the monks of this monastery were holy young men, but the problem with the monastery was the elder. When I told him one of the monks this, he answered, He says this because Father Sofroni is the monks, is not an ordinary man, excuse me, and he does not understand him, whereas we are human beings and he judges us by the human standards that he understands. He added, I am intoxicated with the writings of the elder. When I left, I took with me the prayer at daybreak, which the elder wrote and prayed in the desert of the holy mountain in Kurulia. It used to take him about an hour to say it. I left the monastery with real inspiration. This inspiration, which was not due to me, is clear from three letters that I wrote to Father Sophroni. Father Kirill and Father Zosimus, now Zacharias. I wrote them here to show the spiritual climate of that time. Odessa, July 18th, 1978. Venerable Father Sofroni, your blessing. By your prayers, I returned to Odessa a few days ago. Thank you for your hospitality and the spontaneous love which I experienced both from yourself and from the brethren of your monastery. I believe that the foundation and existence of the monastery of St. John the Baptist accords with God's good pleasure. It presents orthodoxy and proclaims the ascetic spirit of our church. It is a manifestation of the truth that exists in the church. I believe that every monastery that is inspired and guided by the spirit of the tradition and every monk who has become dead to the world and has accepted the life of the past, the life of the undefiled tradition, is a huge protest against the spirit of secularization in the church, particularly institutionalized secularization. I make bold to say that such a monastery is living hope that the church exists and that orthodoxy exists. This may be slightly daring, but so true. It presents the authenticity of the gospel truth. I also think that the world today does not need people who know the fathers, but people who have a patristic way of thinking. In your monastery, I noticed, as I did the last time, apostolic simplicity, evangelical humility, 
and patristic experience. The brethren receive everyone who comes with unfeigned love and sincere concern. This bears witness to many things that love has become incarnate. I remember your counsels and I am trying to put them into practice. I desire my salvation. I want to enjoy eternal life, the blessedness to come. I beseech you, Father, pray for me that I may find mercy with the Lord. May his mercy that cannot be measured enlighten my soul and draw me towards divine love. Pray that the old man may be put to death and that Christ may live in me. You have blessings and respects from his eminence. With deepest respect, signed Archimandrite Herotheus Vlacos. And again, Edessa, July 18, 1978. Dear brother in Christ, Father Kuro, your blessing. It is only a few days since I returned to Edessa, and I feel the need by means of this letter to express my warm thanks for the love that you showed me in all sorts of ways and for the unfeigned and sincere interest which I believe expresses the experience of communion in the same hidden body of Christ. Only someone who lives in the body of Christ perceives in the Holy Spirit other people as members of the same body and sacrifices himself every day in order to love and to do good. As I did last time, so this time too, I felt the change for the better, which cannot be described within the narrow confines of a letter. I just pray that it may remain in my soul, and that this change may lead to improvement, so that one day I may be found worthy of Christ being formed in me in the Holy Spirit. The presence of the elder, a bearer of the tradition, the ceaseless cry of the life-giving Jesus' prayer, the love of the brethren of your monastery, all these contribute to the experience of orthodoxy. I shall not write more because I would probably seem to be exaggerating and because it is possible that my sincerity may be mistaken for flattery. I ask forgiveness for the, for the bother that I caused. I thank you profoundly for the hospitality, full of genuine love, and I ask you to pray to God for me. I have written to the elder, but convey my respects to him as well as my love to all the brethren, with the fervent request that they pray for me, with much love in Christ, our commander Herotheus Vlacos. And July 18th, 1978, from Edessa, Dear Brother in Christ, Father Zosimus, your blessing. I address you as a brother, and I feel you are very close to me. Without really understanding it, I feel that you and I are brothers of the same monastery. I felt the need to write a letter to you too, even though I have already written letters to the elder and to Father Kiro, because I bothered and disturbed you more than anyone else. Thank you for the interest that you showed in me. I recognized on many occasions that you did it out of great love, and the more perfect the love, the more closely it is linked with sacrifice. I therefore realize that you often sacrificed for me sweet hours that you could have spent in your cell, engaged in calling upon the name of Jesus. And this for the sake of a brother. I ask your forgiveness, and I am grateful for your love. Brother, my heart is too cold and barren to find appropriate words of thanks. I believe, however, that you will have discerned at least my good intention to thank you. My latest stay at your monastery brought me immense benefit. You said to me that this time I did not benefit as much as last time because there was a lot of over-familiarity and so on. However, the opposite happened. I benefited more, even though I did not want to show it. I am not writing this out of politeness and good manners because, fortunately, in this respect, I am a Roman. Pray for me. Please ask the other brethren as well to pray for my progress according to God. I do not want to become a good human being free from peculiarities and so on, but a man of God. To stop living as an individual and to live as a person. To get rid of my own will for the sake of the will of the God-man, Jesus. I now see clearly that Hezekiah, in its full dynamic sense, is more beneficial for me. Different activities, even ecclesiastical ones, are a hindrance to me. To be sure, they are not to blame in any way, but rather I am. I consider you blessed because you have found a wise elder and chosen the good part. 
I do not complain because to me too God has revealed an elder with evident discernment. However, the atmosphere of the monastery and the desert moves me and does me good. The world and ministry in the church do not help me to weep, whereas the Hezekiah of the desert and the atmosphere of the monastery is, I believe, the right place for me to see my desolation and to weep over it. I seem to need a river of Babylon. By the river of Babylon, there he sat and wept when he remembered Zion. In fact, the heavenly Zion is remembered in the river. I realized this at your monastery, especially when I found myself in the river of divine grace during the divine liturgy. Pray for me, Father Zosimus, with much brotherly love, signed Archimandrite Hirothis Flacos. That year, at the monastery, I met a philologist who had just finished her postgraduate project and was going to leave for Greece. She described to me how she had met the elder, how she had benefited from his teaching, his personality, and his advice, and how she began to see the church in another perspective. I record some of the things that she told me to show how the elder exercised a pastoral ministry toward pilgrims to the monastery. He regarded each one differently and personally. To those who were well disposed, benefited greatly. In each case, he would act in a self-emptying and sacrificial way, as a great elder with godly wisdom. Many people from all over the world can tell of such occurrences, members of the clergy and monks, academics and simple people, students and pupils, people with families and children, orthodox and non-orthodox, those experienced in spiritual things who have lived the spiritual life, and beginners or even atheists, monks of the holy mountain and those living in the world. All benefited from seeing the elder. They received his word in order to put it into practice and to be saved, either in their family or in monasticism. Many were born again spiritually, and many non-Orthodox converted to Orthodoxy and gained genuine knowledge of God because the elder was a theologian as well as a spiritual father. The excerpts quoted are indicative, representative, and expressive. Hundreds and thousands of people could relate similar experiences from their meeting with the ever-memorable elder. Quote, We arrived at All Saints Church on, Mon on Monday, Thursday, while Father Sofroni was reading the first gospel of the Passion. As we entered, I beheld a biblical figure, venerable priest, all white, who pinned me to the spot. I was unable to move, to take a step. He was reading the gospel slowly, clearly, and meaningfully. Nobody stirred. This image is deeply engraved in my memory. At breakfast in the refectory, the elder sent a sister to call me over and to place me next to him. Have we such Greek people here? He said and looked at me while his face was shining like the sun and he was laughing. I could not utter a word and just gazed at him and he looked at me intensely. The elder took me with him to the office where he first prayed with raised hands, and then sat down, looked at me and laughed. I hardly needed to explain anything. He knew everything. He began to teach me. My visits to Essex became frequent. On one visit I mentioned to the elder that sometimes I felt a terrible pressure, that the whole earth was pressing down on me. The elder explained that this happened because England was not an orthodox country and no one around me in the town where I was living prayed, rather the opposite happened. On the contrary, in Greece the bells ring, liturgies are celebrated, people pray, and this environment helps a lot in prayer. Prayer rises up warfare and temptations from the devil. The elder used to tell me, you belong to the family, and since there was no room, I usually stayed in the sister's attic. When he met me outside the sister's house on the path of his own house, he would often say, where are you staying, in Ornupoli? You know that the holy mountain is next door, and he pointed with his walking stick to his bungalow. One day he met me outside the father's house and we walked along together. 
Lightheartedly, he responded to what I was thinking, namely, that I would be very foolish to live a worldly life when these people live like angels. And he said to me, all these people, and he pointed to the fathers who were ahead of us, are foolish, but you love them all. Do you want to be foolish too? And he began to laugh loudly. On another occasion, when I was rather dejected, he took a spiritual x-ray. He looked up at the overhead electricity cables and said, Do you see that bird? It is sitting on the cable. Do you know what voltage it carries? But the bird suffers no harm. The monk is like that. He has a great struggle within him, and on the outside he appears very calm. There was never any need for me to tell him anything. He knew everything and answered me, looking at me with those sparkling, penetrating eyes of his. Once on the feast of the nativity of the Theotokos, I was very joyful. At breakfast in the refectory, the elder turned to me and, stressing the word joy, saying, Your nativity, O mother of God, brought joy to the whole world. He smiled and sat down to breakfast. Every time the day drew near when I would leave the monastery, I would weep a lot. Seeing me in this state, the elder said, Weep, regardless of the cause. Turn it into prayer. Turn it into repentance and prayer. Once when I told him that I could not retain many of the things that I read, the latter sayings of the fathers, start Silwan, he replied, You do not need to retain it. The heart understands it and it becomes spiritual nourishment without you realizing it. In March, I began writing my postgraduate project, and I finished it in August. My confidence in the elder's statement, write it and we shall bl blind them, you will get through, gave me strength to continue. Thus, when I handle, handed it in without reading it even once, even though I had written it directly in English, which I did not know particularly well, I left for the monastery hoping that I would stay for as long as I wanted, but unfortunately I was appointed to a post and I had to return. On the 16th of September, after the midday meal, I was to leave. The elder called me over to him, and as I was crying continuously, he said, You will make us all cry. He stopped the meal early. He took me by the hand and we went to his office, where one of the fathers arrived with a bunch of roses. The elder took the flowers and began to cut off the thorns. He gave them to me and said, I have removed all the obstacles for you. The elder's word was the word of God. You thought God was speaking to you. I never had any doubt about that. End of quote. As I mentioned above, the impressions of this pilgrim show how the elder approached people. Thousands of people were regenerated spiritually by this transfigured man who always spoke theologically wherever he met people. End of 1978. 1979. As is evident from the above, I had many discussions with Father Sophroni in the summer of 1978, and I gained a great deal from what he said to me. At the same time, I entered more deeply into the spirit of the monastery. I relished the contrite and hesychistic services with the prayer rope and the recitation of the Jesus prayer. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, as well as the Divine Liturgy, which was celebrated in a hesychistic atmosphere. This inspiration followed me to Edessa. I attempted to continue the program of the monastery with regard to the daily services within the circumstances of my pastoral ministry while living in the official residence of the metropolis with my blessed elder, Metropolitan Kalinikos of Edessa, Pella, and Almopia. The ever-memorable Kalinikos rejoiced at all the contact that I had had with Father Sophroni. Every time I returned, he would ask me to tell him exactly what the elder had said, so that he too could benefit. Thus, we were both, in some way, disciples of Father Sophroni. Of course, Father Sophroni also respected the monastic consciousness of Metropolitan Kalinikos, as well as his noble love linked with freedom. At a certain point, however, while I was praying the Jesus Prayer, 
I felt something specific. I was afraid that it, it might be some sort of delusion. I wrote immediately to the elder telling him precisely what I was experiencing, and I asked for personal guidance. A few days later, completely unexpectedly, I received a letter from the elder, the only one that I have in my archive. Later on, I found out that Father Sofroni had been positively concerned and had put my letter in the place where he prayed so he would remember me when praying and pray for me. I shall quote this letter of his with two explanatory comments. The first is that in this letter, the elder expresses his own experience in Paris and how he was led to the holy mountain. Noetic prayer caught fire within him and made his presence in the world impossible, so he left for the holy mountain, where St. Silouan gave him confirmation. This letter should be read in this spirit, in other words, as an autobiography of the elder. The second comment is that Father Sofroni writes and gives guidance through his own personal experience, as did all the Holy Fathers, but he respects the freedom of his correspondent absolutely. He opens up new opportunities in the spiritual life without imposing obligations. This is noble love, as possessed by those who have knowledge and experience of the life of the Spirit, sacred knowledge of God. These two reasons have led me to publish this letter from Father Sofroni and, of course, to seek his prayer and inter intercessions. The letter reads as follows. Monastery of St. John the Baptist, Tolshan Knights, by Malden, Essex. 30th September 1978. My dear brother and concelebrant in Christ, Father Herothius. Today I received your letter on 24th of September. I am replying to you at once, praying that the Lord may have mercy on us both. I do not reply as an elder, but as a brother and concelebrant at the throne of our Most High God and Savior. My profound respect for Father Paisios prompts me to suggest that you comply with his word. But when I confront your problem, which is analogous to that which confronted me more than half a century ago, I allow myself to set out my thoughts. I am speaking to you on the basis of my experience. I make no claim that my word is directly from God, so it is not obligatory for you. Accept with fear, as God's blessing, what happens to you during and after prayer. All those to whom such prayer is granted experience something similar to you. Prayer itself teaches you what you ought to do. I am only taking the place of a brother witness. As you see, there is no eagerness to prepare sermons. You have no inclination to communicate with the world. You have conceived the desire to go into a monastery, and so on. All these things work naturally within the soul through prayer itself, and the soul knows this in a natural way without guidance from outsiders. But you are right to ask someone else so as to gain evidence that the present case is a matter of God's mercy and not stimulation of the imagination. Thus it was from the beginning. The Virgin Mother God went to Elizabeth. The Apostle Paul went to Jerusalem. And our fathers advise us to ask those who inspire confidence. I must tell you, to combine this sort of prayer with activity in the world is not possible. Perhaps you have heard about Bishop Theophan the Recluse, the author of many ascetic works, who in the last century left his episcopal throne with the blessing of the Holy Synod of the Russian Church and went into a monastery. As I write in the book about the Starets and in my article, Principles of Orthodox Monasticism, the noose that prays in the heart cannot and should not allow its attention to turn to anything else. Nothing is more important and necessary than prayer. Academic work, which does not give genuine knowledge of God, but only acquaintance with words about God, is abandoned. Inner prayer is not compatible with activity in the world, however beneficial this may be. This is why inspiration for sermons does not come. The heart and the noose avoid even this kind of pastoral ministry. What else can I say to you? Withdrawal from the world becomes 
the one thing needful. Thus what is happening within you is not a fantasy of an arrogantly deluded noose. No, it is the call of God. A call to a more difficult and painful life on account of profound repentance, which is necessary for our salvation. May my word not trouble your heart. Perhaps this is sinful, spiritual selfishness. No, it is not. Rather, one should reflect, if I myself am in the darkness of ignorance of the ways of salvation, how will I be able to assist in the salvation of my neighbor? The Lord said, Physician, heal yourself first. If I myself am a slave of the passions, how will I purify others from passions? And so on. If God so wishes, then later on, after many years, when you learn how merciful the Lord is, you may possibly seem useful to your brothers. But we ought not to think about that at the start of the journey. Now there is nothing before you except repentance. Repentance which has no end upon earth, because this end would mean complete likeness to Christ. So, if my word is acceptable, the practical issue arises of putting this aim into practice. I hope that you are able to entreat your bishop and benefactor to give you his episcopal blessing for the proposed work of repentance in poverty and humility. Do not build cells now and do not take on the worry of founding a group of monks, lest you lose precious time for God's visitation. Ask of the bishop and it will be given you. As far as possible, do not delay. This is what St. John Climacus advises. Know for certain that in the world you will not be able to keep the inner prayer that has now been given to you. Forgive me. Pray for me. I beseech God to have abundant mercy upon you with brotherly love. Signed, A. Sophroni. P.S. Would the holy mountain not be the best place for you, as it was for me in those days? May the Lord and the Most Holy Virgin Lady assist you. And once again, my word is theoretical, from my personal experience, so it is not binding. Peace be with you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Signed, A. Sophroni. I did as the elder advised me, but Metropolitan Kalinikos of blessed memory was not willing to let me leave him. He told me, Please, I beg you not to do it. I leave you free to do whatever you like while living here with me. So I did not have his blessing in accordance with the elder's advice. I told the elder this, and he had no objection. In any case, his word was not binding. I built a small cottage outside Edessa near the chapel dedicated to the prophet Elijah, and I divided my daily life between this hermitage and the metropolis, living as hesychistically as possible. The elder's prayers, however, set me on fire as regards inner prayer. I wrote to him about these matters. For me, the winter of 1978 to 1979 was really a gift from God. By the intercessions of Father Sophroni and the prayers of my elder, Metropolitan Kalinikos. So, when I went to the monastery in Essex in the summer of 1979, my communication with the elder was becoming even deeper. The reader will realize the elder's words were mostly concerned with prayer and the inner life of the soul. The elder received me with very great joy. That summer he was writing the book that was later published under the title, We Shall See Him As He Is. Someone told me, before starting to write on the, on the typewriter, the elder closes his eyes, lifts up his hands to God, prays, and then writes. The first time I met him, I asked him to give me the chance to ask him a few things about prayer and the spiritual life. He told me, stay here at the monastery, and at the first opportunity I shall call you. That year I happened to be there for the Sunday of Pentecost. We celebrated Vespers magnificently on Saturday afternoon. In fact, the ever-memorable Abbot Ephrem of the Monastery of Zirputamu sang the Choparia for the right-hand choir with his gentle and contrite voice, and I sang those for the left-hand choir. The elder was also present, and he conveyed a special atmosphere to us. 
It was significant to know that the next next to you was a father who had reached the heights of Pentecost in Theoria of the Uncreated Light. The next day, at the Divine Liturgy of Pentecost, Father Sofroni showed me the church where they had opened, on his orders, windows in the roof. And he told me, this shows illumination from on high. He wanted there to be light from above in the church to avoid shadows. The saints organized their everyday life and the architecture of the church building in accordance with their experience. At the service of kneeling vespers, he read the first prayer in a slow, contrite, and supplicatory manner, different from the usual. The rest of us priests read the remaining prayers. While I was staying at the monastery, I celebrated the liturgy every Sunday in the All Saints Church with the elder, the abbot, and the hero monks of the monastery. I often preached at the Divine Liturgy, and occasionally I would address the pilgrims after paraclesis in the afternoon. One Sunday, the elder asked me to speak at the Divine Liturgy. The Gospel reading referred to the miracle of the healing of the centurion's servant, fourth Sunday of Matthew. Prompted by the centurion's words to Christ, Speak a word and my servant will be healed, Matthew 8.8. 8. Christ's reply, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And the result, his servant was healed that same hour, Matthew 8.13. I spoke about the divine word being the energy of God and not a casual human word. In any case, according to St. Gregory of Nyssa, everything created is created by a word. I developed this subject on the basis of the teaching of Holy Scripture, the Fathers of the Holy Fathers, and particularly of St. Maximus the Confessor, who says, quote, He who receives a commandment and carries it out receives mystically the Holy Trinity. End of quote. The Elder was very enthusiastic about this theological reference to the energy of the Divine Word, because he had experienced for himself that the Word of God is his energy. So, when I finished and I went into the sanctuary, he said, quote, You spoke as a theologian. It is a fact that the Word of God has energy and regenerates man. End of quote. This acceptance by the elder, a great father, with theological criteria and ecclesiastical experience was a confirmation for me of my preaching ministry. One day I happened to be nearby when the elder was coming out of his bungalow. He showed his pleasure, stretching out his arms to their full extent and telling me, quote, I have just finished a chapter of my book, and now I am yours. Do what you like with me. End of quote. A ah, wonderful statement, but also a moving and splendid image of the cross. I am yours. Do what you like with me. That was the elder. We had a significant meeting. Some of the things he told me were as follows. Nineteen seventy nine continued. Some of the things he told me were as follows Many fathers say that the Christian ought to study himself, to examine himself every day, to see the good things and the bad. This did not help me, however, whereas something else did. I used to say to myself, What does God want me to do today? I would set Christ's commandments before me and proceed to put them into practice, as the Apostle Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Philippians 3.13-14 Thus, apart from serious transgressions, which require complete, all-embracing repentance and confession, one should not analyze oneself nor examine one's thoughts to see where they come from or whether one has grace and how much. One ought not to spy on oneself, but to have profound repentance. To be sure, for the priest who works in the world, profound repentance is not possible and may not even be beneficial because then he cannot pay attention to others, so he is of little benefit to people. Profound repentance comes through humility and the action of divine grace. 
When humility is lost, everything is lost. The entire spiritual life is clear from Christ's Beatitudes, which begin with humility. Even theological knowledge can create self-centered satisfaction, in which case everything falls apart. How do we attain to humility and repentance? We have Christ's commandments before us, and we try to put them into practice. We realize, however, that we cannot reach the height of his commandments. Then we realize that we are sinners, and we have passions. We begin to repent, to weep. Grieving, we seek God's mercy. The Christian's life is very simple. When God bestows certain states of grace, one ought not to reflect on them, much less describe them, just as the awareness of one's sinfulness ought not to be shared with other people. Many years after the visitation of divine grace, particularly when one does not scrutinize it or spy on oneself, a personal knowledge remains, which is a taste of theology. The one who believes that he is deluded does not fall into delusion. In other words, every sin is delusion, as the state of temptation deludes the noose and it departs from God. So when we sin, we feel that we are deluded. Then we seek God's mercy without ceasing, and this sets us free from delusion. One ought to be moderate in all things. One must always act according to one's physical capabilities and the spiritual state one is in. One ought not to pay attention to oneself while prayer is active. Sometimes the energy of prayer ceases for various reasons, mostly due to inappropriate actions. Then contrite and penitential prayer is required. In general, we ought to live with a sense of sinfulness. This develops profound repentance, and so prayer is activated. One should not spy on oneself and observe the states of prayer inside oneself. When we pray intensely, our body is transformed as well. Although a monk is a natural human being, when he prays with penitence and mourning, he experiences the transformation of his body. Then many benefits come, such as discernment, peace, and so on. This is how we interpret the transformation of the body through, through theoria, a vision of God. The words, keep your mind in hell and despair not, were given by God to start Silouan in the era when Einstein was giving the world the atomic bomb, the theory that led to the atomic bomb. Thus, the consoling words, despair not, make an impression in our time because everyone is in despair. There is no better occasion for humility than when other people despise us. In this case, we should not even ask why they hold us in contempt. Other people's contempt helps us to be humble. When a thought produces pride, we should say, Death has fallen upon me. My murderers have come. This gives rise to repentance. When someone prays, he should pay no attention to anything, even the warmth produced in his heart. He should simply be in a state of profound penitence and feel that he is far from God. He should be like a train that keeps speeding towards its destination. He must find the right measure in asceticism. Tears are essential for prayer and the spiritual life in general. Not many tears are needed, but even a single teardrop with inner mourning of the heart. This mourning is very significant. Contrition is impossible without tears. Tears are a sign that the noose has been united with the heart in the Holy Spirit, and for that reason the fathers ascribe great importance to tears during prayer. When someone feels that his heart is saying the prayer and his noose, his attention, is elsewhere, this means that his noose is not yet united with his heart. The union of noose and heart comes about in the Holy Spirit in the first stage of theoria. From there, at moments when the one praying least expects it, and when the, his noose is pure, the theory of the uncreated light will come just as sleep comes gently. When someone prays and tries to concentrate his attention, sometimes his head hurts and sometimes his neck. This pain in his neck ought to be avoided because it causes disturbed sleep, various dreams, and so on. 
When someone has nightmares or feels disturbed, he should get out of bed and pray. And weeping, the soul is cleansed of these images. A powerful prayer is, Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. Someone who has noetic prayer should avoid preaching, lest he divulge the prayer that acts within him, because he will want to speak about what he is experiencing. I speak in general, and those who understand, understand. Prayer depends on the environment. The environment helps or hinders prayer, but it is also a matter of blood, of family tradition. It is significant if someone has the blood of praying parents, if his mother prayed when she was carrying him in her womb. Due to circumstances, nowadays few people are able to practice noetic prayer while they are working in the way that people used to pray in the past, even in the palace. The fathers tell us not to praise someone who prays even in the street. This is the grace of God, a gift from on high, and we should attribute it to God. The warmth and joy that we feel during prayer are respite on the difficult journey of prayer. They will be a consolation in the difficult days to come. Some theologians regard historical knowledge as important. However, because they are interested in this sort of knowledge, they do not find time for prayer. Knowledge of God comes through prayer. Through rational knowledge, we learn what the Father said about God. But through prayer, we learn what God himself says. We hear God's own voice. One should adjust prayer to suit the work that one does. It is possible to lose prayer in the desert and to find it in the city. Going to live on the holy mountain is no easy matter. It may even lead to self-esteem if someone held an important position in society and the other monks respect him. Repentance is a personal matter and a moment of grace. One must repent alone, by grace, living in blessed humility. When others humble us, we should say, They are doing me good. Glory to you, O God. When others praise us, we should say, Glory to you, O God, that people are gaining benefit. So in both cases he gains. When the heart does not respond to prayer by its movement and warmth, particular care is needed. One ought not to force one's heart in this state. One should say the prayer orally, because otherwise the heart may grow weak through pressure and bodily disorders may occur. The fact that the heart does not respond to prayer is due to various sins, which are committed even through thoughts. In this case, if one does not remember anything, one ought not to search out the cause, but to humble oneself, saying, Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. Although it seems then as if the heart is not responding to prayer, later on it will respond. We must preserve a contrite spirit, which comes from humility. Once I knew the truth, Christ, as the true God, I greatly regretted the time when I had been involved in Buddhism. I went far astray. Now I realize more than ever that everything outside Christ is a delusion, an absurdity. There's a great difference between East and West. A Westerner who is baptized Orthodox will spend many years in the Orthodox Church under the guidance of an experienced spiritual director in order to acquire a holy, entirely Orthodox mentality and ethos. Until then, he cannot and should not act as a teacher to people who are of Orthodox stock, who are born and brought up as Orthodox. This is why the union of the churches cannot come about. Discussions may lead to an acquaintance, which may help politically, but without harming orthodoxy. But the union of the churches is difficult or impossible. Those who talk about union of the churches are ignorant of the way non-orthodox think and of the exalted nature of orthodoxy. Some non-orthodox hate the orthodox. The proof of this is that if a Westerner becomes a Buddhist or a Marxist, his relatives do not reject him from the family. But if he becomes orthodox, they reject him. If this attitude did not exist, many Westerners would become Orthodox. 
when someone preaches, he should say that what his heart gives him to say and not what his mind tells him. The simple word that issues from the heart has energy and saves others. The sermons that are delivered ought to be convictions from the heart. Only then does even a simple word act in the heart of the hearers. When he feels emptiness in our heart and our heart does not give a word, this means that we have lost grace. Philosophers examine everything with their brain, their mind, which is why each of them has a different opinion from the others. Theologians who work cerebrally are the same. Monks, however, live in repentance, so there is communion between them on the basic issues. Thus they understand many of the spiritual states that people are in. Both experience and intellectual knowledge are required in order to put the spiritual life into words. The fathers of the church had both experience and knowledge. From the beginning, the church lived the grace that Christ brought into the world. Three centuries were required for it to acquire the terminology. Slowly, the church developed the terminology according to the problems that arose. But the church lived the life of eternity from the first day, from Pentecost. Staret Siloan was a great saint. His speech was calm. He spoke quietly, without gestures, peacefully. When I spoke to Staret Siloan, I would let him talk. I would only ask him something if I did not understand, but that happened only occasionally. Afterwards, I understood, understood him fully, particularly after his death, when I went into the desert. This is what usually happens with all those who have contact with saints. When I was in the monastery of St. Pantaleman on the holy mountain and Star Siloan was still alive, mentally I would kiss even the ground that he trod. I had such profound respect for him. When we want to help someone, God will give us a word to offer him. In general, we should pray to God to tell us what to say on each occasion. St. Siloan helped a young monk in this way. His father had brought him to the monastery as an adolescent. When this monk was 19 or 20 years old, he had doubts about whether God existed, so he wanted to stop being a monk and return to the world. His natural father begged St. Siloan to talk to him. Siloan went to his cell first to pray that God would enlighten him as to what to say. After praying, he received a word from God, and he went to the monk and said, Doubting thoughts occasionally come to me too. The monk, who thought highly of St. Siloan, took courage and asked, And what do you do then, Starrett? St. Siloan replied, I chase them away. So the monk, who respected the Starrett, listened to what he said, dismissed the thoughts, became a good monk, and died as a monk. For someone else, a different word would be required, because if someone were to say this to him, he might say, As such thoughts occur even to start Siloan, that holy man, it follows that God does not exist. This is why spiritual fathers must pray to God and receive the word that God gives, which is specific to each one. This means that we help other people personally. Start Siloan's words are for all categories of people even for those of other faiths. We have a word from Star Siloan to say to everyone. When a member of the clergy has profound repentance, he cannot do much pastoral work in the world. Because the pastoral ministry requires constant activity, which is impossible for someone marked by profound repentance. Serve your bishop. In order for you to receive grace, and for this service to be in God, he should say, Lord Jesus Christ, through my bishop, have mercy upon me, a sinner. If a young man is flippant and does stupid things, we should pray that God may bring him to his senses. But we should avoid, we should not avoid him. This simplicity helps a lot. The loss of divine grace causes great pain, comparable to the body's mortal agony but also to the fear of death. Great patience is needed then. One day I met him on the path. He was coming out of the main building of the monastery after hearing confessions and was on his way to his bungalow. 
I approached him, asked for his blessing, and told him that when I read his writings, I felt that he spoke about the light as though he had seen it. He stooped down to touch a flower in the garden, and as he did this without looking at me, he answered me in a natural and humble way. I have not seen the form of Christ with his body as Start Siloan did, now and again in a state of intense prayer without thoughts. One senses the nearness of God, that one is touching eternity. This is Theoria. You too have felt something similar. This shows the way in which he spoke and the fact that he concealed himself, praising others to excess. He went on to talk about St. Siloan, saying, Start Siloan is a great saint. In Russia, they present the book about Start Siloan to the best student. A Catholic seminary bought 200 copies of His Life is Mine. I found the opportunity to ask him about a debate being carried on publicly in Greece about the nature of the uncreated light. He was following this public discussion himself, and he told me, I observe that they speak about the divine light without having seen it. When I asked him to explain further, he said, If they had seen it, they would not talk in this way. Anyone who sees the divine light is transformed and behaves differently. I had a camera with me, and I asked if we could have our photograph taken together. He accepted readily. He called a monk, and as a souvenir of this meeting, I still have the photograph, in which we are standing in front of the green background of the trees at the monastery. It is the first photograph of the two of us. That summer, I remember that just seeing the elder made me feel very deep mourning. On one occasion, this happened more intensely during the midday meal in the refectory. One day, he put me next to him at table as the abbot of the monastery was absent and we ate fish. He turned to me and said, I am amazed. I am a dog and I eat fish. Do dogs eat fish? He was profoundly humble, and mourning never left him throughout his life in spite of his great experiences of the vision of God. It seems that he also transmitted this mourning to those who were close to him. On another occasion in the refectory, David Balfour, about whom I have written elsewhere in the book, was with us at the table. I was talking to him. At one point I glanced at the elder and I saw the following. He had a focused his gentle gaze on Balfour's face and tears were streaming from his eyes without convulsive movements of his face. Another time I saw during the meal in the refectory that he was inwardly tense and wept. Afterwards he was unable to speak. However, I do not know the reason. It should be mentioned here that when I spoke to Balfour at the monastery, he told me, at the monastery of St. Pentelaemon, Father Sophroni would weep and sigh. He was attacked by demons. He saw the uncreated light. I could not look at Start Siloan because his face shone. The only reason Father Sophroni wanted to go into the desert was that he could not stay at the monastery on account of his weeping and mourning. After meals, Father Sophroni used to expound to pilgrims the icons on the refectory walls. I remember that while explaining the wall painting of the Last Supper and interpreting the scriptural passage, now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. He said, Christ said these words after Judas had left. Thus we too feel that our words stop when someone is present who does not understand them. I have written elsewhere that the characteristic of the faces and icons painted by the elder is that their noose is in their heart and they, they are praying noetic prayer. Through iconography, the elder expresses the hesychistic tradition of the church that he lived in himself. Leaving the refectory one day, I was next to the elder and a lady asked him to pray for her. Out of humility, he pointed to me and said, Ask him to pray because his prayer is heard. He said this, of course, on account of the profound humility that was typical of him. I heard many monks and others talking about the beneficial presence of Father Sophroni. One monk told me, The elder does not have the peculiarities either of Russians or of the Greeks. 
He speaks to you and his noose is anchored in heaven. In fact, I discerned this on many occasions, as does anyone who reads his words. Another monk told me, Father Sofroni lets the spiritual life develop in a natural way. There have been circumstances in which he could have set fire to me with a match, but he let things happen naturally. Another monk told me in confidence, even now the elder sees the uncreated light, but he does not want to say anything about it in case he loses God's gift. This was perceptible from the inspiration that he passed on to those near him, from the atmosphere in which he celebrated, and from his living theological word. Despite of everything that has been written, no one should feel that the elder was awe-inspiring. On the contrary, although he inspired respect, he was at the same time very agreeable. Sometimes when the atmosphere was oppressive, he would tell a joke in order to lighten it and ease the tension. He never wanted to feel that someone he was talking to regarded him as a saint. In that case, as he told me, he felt horror. To make the visitor feel more at ease, he would praise him in various ways. For instance, one day he saw me and said to Father Zacharias, very important person. Once, when I met him and I told him about a problem that I had with a metropolitan, not Kalinikos, and he immediately showed concern. As he told me, he feared how I might react to the metropolitan's attitude, lest perhaps I would answer him back and lose grace because it is dangerous for someone to react against a bishop who has the grace of the episcopate before i left the monastery he said the following to me in another personal discussion 1979 continued experience of dogma is apparent in the ascetic and theological concept of the person the light of god is homogeneous, whereas the devil's light is uneven. All those who have been involved in Buddhism must repent completely, because otherwise this Eastern experience will leave something in their soul. Many spe people speak about love, eros, intense longing. Sermons about intense longing for God are dangerous, because people without personal experience of divine eros talk about intense longing for God in terms of human eros. The Father spoke in a different way. They had personal experience of divine Eros and simply took images from natural Eros in order to express it, as they did not have any other images to use in this case. They spoke from a different perspective and, and in, a, in a different atmosphere. The Russian Church is living Christ's agony in Gethsemane and Christ's cross in Golgotha. During this time of trial and persecution, the official church attempts to preserve whatever it can, and those who criticize its stance do not have an orthodox ethos. The orthodox ethos does not try to impose itself by violent means. The church does not deny the cross. At the time of the ancient persecutions, a group of Christians were being led to martyrdom. On the way, one of them tore up the emperor's decree for their arrest. The church did not canonize him as a saint, although he was martyred because his action was political. So our actions must not serve any political purpose. There is no room for politics in the gospel, as politics seeks authority, whereas the gospel preaches love, sacrifice, self-emptying, and the cross. I do not want the union of the churches to come about, at least at the present time, because the Roman Catholics will not change, but the Orthodox will be corrupted. As you have your bishop's understanding as regards prayer, there is no reason for you to leave for the holy mountain. You should listen to him and do whatever he tells you, so that you will have the right conditions for prayer and you will feel the grace of prayer. If the bishop is grieved by something, you will forfeit the preconditions for prayer. The two apostles, St. John the Evangelist and St. Paul, speak in different ways, but both are great. It is the same with St. Silwan and Elder Joseph the Cave Dweller. They were both great monks, but they lived in different ways. 
one in a Cenobitic monastery and the other in the desert. Elder Yosef was an extraordinary man. When God in the Holy Spirit inspires a spiritual idea in someone, it belongs to the Church and all its members. For example, the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom is not just his, but belongs to the Church. It is ours as well. Western religious culture ascribes great importance to outward bodily asceticism. Because of that, Westerners tire themselves out, particularly their brains and nerves, so even their foreheads are wrinkled. A good Orthodox monk lives with his heart, though without being released from asceticism, so his brow is smooth and he does not frown. The bitterness that one feels for someone else, even though it is justified, makes the heart sick and contributes to the loss of God's grace. Faith gives birth to fear, not fear to faith, as the fear of God is born of faith in God. The Orthodox experience faith in God, whereas the fear of God is the characteristic feature of Westerners. The Apostle Paul writes, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. 1 Corinthians 14.32 This means that God's grace in the prophets does not do away with their freedom. The opposite happens with the evil spirit, which abolishes the freedom of those in which it acts. The prophet is not grieved when prayer is interrupted in order to show love, because then he does not forfeit God's grace. The epistle of the Apostle Paul to the Hebrews expresses his personal life, particularly his prayer of repentance in the Arabian desert. It is an autobiography of the Apostle Paul. Prayer for others must be done correctly, not with the imagination. We should not attempt with our mind to imagine other people and to pray for them. But when our heart is gripped by pain for someone, then he is susceptible to prayer, and we should pray for him. If we have a list of names, we can read it once and, and then pray, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon thy servants. This does not stimulate the imagination. Anything done by force without love and freedom does not enter the eternity of God. It is not true that St. Seraphim of Serov said to everyone he met, Christ is risen, my joy. He said this sometimes to someone who was in need. St. Seraphim felt such repentance within himself that no one could sit next to him. He was on fire. At the moment, I do not want anyone to see the texts that I am writing. This is because on the one hand, I write openly, when I write about the spiritual life, I do not want to write abstractly and philosophically. On the other hand, when I write openly and freely on these subjects and other people read what I write, I do not want to lose God's grace, nor do I want them to come to meet a saint. Because of the way Westerners pray, they cannot understand the long prayers of Orthodox monks. They are tired after praying for half an hour because they pray in their heads intellectually. The Orthodox pray with their noose. Sometimes, someone who prays becomes clear-sighted and can foresee things. Often he does not realize it himself, as it is a natural state. Sometimes he also hears the voice of God in his heart. This should happen to him continuously. So, when on one occasion we hear God's voice within us, or something is revealed to us, we ought to humble ourselves and reflect that we should be continuously in this state, as was Adam before the fall. Sometimes I see that I am self-moving, or rather moved by something else. He was activated by the grace of God. Sometimes when someone who prays becomes angry, he feels as though his heart moves and changes position and place. When you say the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me, dwell on the words, my Jesus, when grace is active in you. It is natural for someone to feel love for Christ. It shows the action of a moderate degree of grace. We should say this a few times. Most of the time, however, we should insist on the phrase, have mercy upon me, a sinner. This sense of repentance is essential. 
two things are important during prayer. One is reaching up towards Christ. We should not examine anything else, visions, voices, or light, but have all our attention on the person of Christ. The other thing is uninterrupted mourning and profound repentance. We must not pay attention to anything that happens during prayer, not even voices. If a voice is heard within us during prayer and it does not produce compunction, we should pay no attention to it. The news should be fixed on Christ. When we pray a lot, we understand the distinction between acquiring knowledge from books and acquiring knowledge from personal experience. If in an action we are 5% wrong and the others are 95% wrong and we put right our 5% share of the wrong, then we do not notice the other's wrongdoing, and nothing is left for them. We should love the contempt that other people show us, but we should not boast about how patient we are. We should regard our slanderers as our benefactors. We are released from the captivity of thoughts through repentance, which is the action of God's grace and does not impose itself. Another way is not to accept bad thoughts. The purpose of Christian marriage is for people to reach unselfish love and to cut off their own will, and thence to reach God. Those who begin their spiritual life with contempt for the law of God will eventually be shipwrecked concerning the faith. In the beginning, noetic prayer cannot be combined with missionary activity. Later on, after 20 or 30 years, one can pray noetic prayer without being distracted by missionary activity. In paradise, Adam forfeited dialogue with God on account of sin. Christ, through his incarnation, attempted to conceive him to continue. Through repentance, the conversation that he had had with him in paradise, he shouts, Repent! God, however, has changed the terms of communication. In paradise, he told him, Subdue the earth. Now he tells him, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Matthew twenty twenty five to 27 In the beginning, man should have become lord of the earth. Now the rulers dominate the world. So anyone who wishes to be saved must become the servant and slave of all after the pattern of Christ. The terms have been reversed, and this is how repentance is expressed. When someone's soul is sick, this is clear from the fact that he is continuously searching for something. He thinks that he has forgotten to do something, and so on. Or he cannot sleep because of overtiredness, and his whole organism is disturbed. Then he should pray with the words, Lord Jesus Christ, heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. This is a very powerful prayer. Then great peace comes. One is unable to sleep either due to the visitation of grace or due to exhaustion. This is both a psychological phenomenon and a spiritual state. When there is no time for Jesus' prayer with the prayer rope, it is replaced by mourning and weeping. When someone prays and feels spiritually paralyzed, this reveals the action of grace. When our head hurts during prayer, we should carry on praying. It is better to pray painfully than with ease. When someone weeps while praying, the name of Christ sinks into his heart like an anchor. Then he moves and the anchor stays fixed. In other words, he moves with stability. Sometimes this grace wounds and crushes our One's very bones, the grace of God enters the soul and the body. When the Jesus prayer is said inwardly and noise is heard from outside, it is natural for the prayer to weaken. Sometimes, however, the Jesus prayer is more powerful than external noises. When grace abandons us, we should do what we used to previously, before it came when we did not feel its energy. In other words, we should live in repentance and the fear of God and keep his commandments. When we feel physical pain, all our attention is concentrated on the part of the body that hurts, and in, in a way our noose is beside itself. The same happens with repentance. When we repent, our noose departs to God.
When someone tries to pray and concentrate his noose, at first, his eyes may become inflamed. When, however, the noose in the Holy Spirit finds the heart, calm prevails throughout the body. When we suffer from captivity of the thoughts, when we are held captive by thoughts, the Jesus prayer is not enthroned in our heart, even if we pray for a long time. Not to hear and not to see what is happening around one while praying the Jesus prayer without losing awareness of reality is natural because it is a sort of ecstasy. The monastic life is not only a sense of grace. Someone who lives in the world, an old lady, may have this as well. The monastic life is also the transmission of the tradition from the elder, whom one will obey in order to receive the tradition, the spiritual life, which he preserves. Monasticism is to be found in the knowledge of Christ. There is salvation in the God-man Christ. Monasticism is not only withdrawal from people, but abstent abstentation from all thoughts. Bishops do not usually understand monasticism because they have not been through it. Theology is to be found in the essence of asceticism. A monk must have self-discipline. Obedience to one's elder produces contrite thoughts and even tears, even if one has only prayed for a few minutes. Discipline imposed by others does not help in repentance and does not help the soul to develop and become a person. Discipline is not the same as self-discipline, and obedience is different again. Those monasteries in the West that began with discipline have collapsed. Everyone hates us. However, it is necessary to, to disregard those who despise us. We must not turn against them. I place my hope for the existence of this monastery not only in our prayers but in the blessing of Star Siloan. Monastic life is the spiritual communion of elder and disciple, however difficult a state the monk is in. We must not lose the elder's blessing as long as he lives, and afterwards there will be no problem. If people see us in a state of despondency, they want to leave. If we are well, they want to stay. I said to a certain monk who was worried about his future, God who worked the great miracle of bringing you this far will take care of the rest of your life. When someone is preparing to go into a monastery to become a monk, he usually goes through fire. Everyone who has been through this fire... For that reason, we must understand and love those who want to become monks and are getting ready. When someone enters a monastery to become a monk, he should not reveal all his capabilities, because he will be continually under strain. If the elder gives him work, he should do it eagerly with obedience. One cannot, find, cannot found a monastery for women if one is hard and impatient. Such an undertaking requires patience, so that the women's psychology may be changed into a spiritual gift. Many women want to have the spiritual father exclusively for themselves, and they do everything to attract his attention. Great wisdom and discernment are necessary on the part of the spiritual father. Women want a certain protection. We should give it to them, but at the same time help them to ascend spiritually. Women often want psychological consolations. Discernment is required. The difference between spiritual and psychological love is as follows. Someone who is in genuine communication with his spiritual father has need of him, but he is not upset if he is absent. Prayer makes up for his absence. When the spiritual child is upset, this shows that there is a problem. In, the circum in these circumstances, we spiritual fathers ought not to despise that particular individual, but we should delay seeing him, not spend much time on him, and only deal with spiritual matters. Some spiritual fathers make extensive use of psychology. This seems to depend on the state of the people, because if someone were to speak as St. Simeon the New Theologian spoke, he would distress everyone and they would not tolerate him. The word of St. Simeon the New Theologian is fire. The spiritual guidance that we give Christians in accordance with our personal experiences must not be made into a system. The spiritual father ought 
by the grace of God, to set his spiritual children free from their captivity to the passions and help them to lift up their faces to God. Often, in order to reply to someone, instead of praying to God, I tell him something from my mind. Because if I pray and receive inner conviction from God and he does not obey, he will be disobeying God. That is to say, he will come into conflict with him. So I speak from my mind, so that at least people will be disobedient to me and not oppose God. The martyrdom of the spiritual father is that he will either be destroyed himself by taking risks, or his work will be destroyed if he goes no further than external laws and rules. We should talk to small children as though they were grown up, but adapting what we say to their level of understanding, and we should make sure that they develop as adults. In other words, we should not deal with them as small children. We shall not take either children or houses with us into the kingdom of heaven. We should therefore attend to our salvation and leave the children to the providence of God once we have done whatever we can for them and they do not listen to us. Man has physical, psychological, and spiritual elements. He is made up of two parts, and he has a soul and a body. When we refer to the spiritual element, we mean the grace of God that is an essential feature of the regenerated human being. In women, the psychological element is close to the spiritual, which is why they confuse what is psychological with what is spiritual, mistaking psychological things for spiritual states. In addition, carnal desire is channeled into bearing children and bringing them up. In men, the psychological element is close to the physical element, which is why they are usually aggressive. When we hear women's confessions, we see their hypostases to such a degree that we do not know what clothes they were wearing and have no sense of the anatomy of their bodies. We should do the same with men too. We must be free and treat them as people in God's image, as sons and daughters of God. When someone speaks from his heart, his heart usually becomes weary because it shares in bearing witness to the words. Unless we exhaust ourselves and feel pain, we do not cure others. We must take the other person's death upon ourselves in order to give him life. Then our heart is emptied out. The spiritual father's work is difficult because he should not say pleasant things, but point out mistakes and passions and cure people. This is the orthodox method. Usually this makes people aggrieved and angry. I am pleased that many people do not obey me, so I do not have responsibility. In order for someone to act as a fool for Christ's sake, it also has to suit his natural state to some extent, to be likened with his character. I do not bother with those who despise me, nor do I bother about what they say. Psychological illnesses originate from two causes, either from pride or from unfulfilled carnal desires that re some, someone retains in his soul. While staying at the monastery, I came into contact with many visitors and pilgrims. Some of them used to visit the monastery frequently, almost on a daily basis. Others would come on weekends. Many of them told me their various personal memories of the elder and his miraculous interventions. I was present at an episode. At one point during the day, the elder came anxiously out of his bungalow and made his way towards a caravan at the monastery where a visitor was staying. He went in and saw him in despair, ready to do himself bodily harm, and he prevented him. According to what I had heard, he had perceived that individual's state in the course of prayer. I left the monastery with impressions such as these, but my heart remained there, or rather I carried in my heart the personality and figure of the elder, and above all, his liberating and regenerating theology. End of 1979. 1980. In 1980, I visited the monastery in September. I had conceived the desire to be present at the Feast of the Holy Cross, the mystery of 
which the elder and every Orthodox monk experienced, as did every true Christian. I also wanted to be there for three important days, between the 22nd and the 24th of September. On the 22nd of September, the monks and pilgrims celebrated the elder's birthday ecclesiastically. On the 23rd, they celebrated the conception of the Honorable Forerunner, the patron saint of the monastery. And on the 24th of September, they commemorated Starat Silouan. It should be noted that Starat Silouan had not yet been numbered among the saints, but at the monastery they honored the day of his decease with the Divine Liturgy without troparia or a special service. As soon as I had arrived at the monastery, a day or two before the Feast of the Holy Cross, they told me that the elder, together with Father Kirill, had been invited to spend a week visiting a parish in Belgium, so I would stay at the monastery and celebrate the Divine Liturgy and the ceremony of the exaltation of the Holy Cross, 14th of September, and I also would celebrate the Sunday of All Saints Church, where many people came to worship. That year I felt particularly blessed on the 22nd of September when the elder celebrated the Divine Liturgy on his birthday. The elder was of the opinion that wherever we are, we ought to respect the traditions of that place and make them ecclesiastical. So at the festive meal in the refectory of the monastery, he spoke about the great value of our birth, as we are born to inherit paradise as persons and to be united with God. At the same time, he spoke about the great gift of our rebirth, which comes about through the mystery of holy baptism and the mystery of holy chrismation. All these things, of course, should lead man to deification through God's energy and man's collaboration. He also found the opportunity to stress that after his decease, they should keep the spirit that he had inspired at the monastery. That is to say, apart from the general typicon, there should not be a detailed timetable at the monastery, because a strict timetable, although it is helpful, at the same time creates a certain spiritual self-sufficiency and infringes upon freedom. And without freedom, profound repentance cannot develop. As far as I could grasp, the elder wanted to combine the life of the Cenobitic monk with the hermit's spiritual freedom and hesychistic life. He emphasized that profound mourning is the genuine spirit of orthodox monasticism, as he knew it in the desert of the holy mountain. In the afternoon of the 23rd of September at Vespers, and on the 24th of September at the Divine Liturgy, we had an intense experience of the presence and blessing of Star at Siloan the Athenite. Many pilgrims came from all over Europe on that day, particularly those who had benefited from St. Siloan's teachings. The fact is that many Westerners who become Orthodox have been inspired by the words of St. Siloan, which means that it was not official dialogues, conferences, or theological speculations that drew them to Orthodoxy, but the words spoken from experience by eyewitnesses of the living God. These three days were a unique opportunity to delight in two great spiritual figures who had experienced glorification. We rejoiced in the presence of Father Sophroni, St. Siloan's disciple, and Father Sophroni rejoiced like a small child in St. Siloan's blessing. In fact, he considered that the monastery of St. John the Baptist was founded on St. Siloan's words, prayers, and protection. On the 23rd of September, the eve of the decease of St. Siloan, a nun from Greece was professed. The elder took the view that monastic professions are not festive services, so they ought to take place in a contrite atmosphere of repentance and prayer. The monastic life is a cross and spiritual burial. A bright and festive atmosphere removes the monk from the essence of the monastic life. So the service of profession as a great schema nun was held in the evening with only the monks present, after all the pilgrims had retired to their rooms completely unaware. The elder's attitude and the way in which the prayers were read gave the impression that it was not merely a service taking place, but he was passing on a life that was his own. At the end of the service, he did not give a sermon or an explanation, but simply defined the essence of the monastic life and gave a blessing. He said, quote, Behold, 
Sister T. You have become a nun from the beginning of the church's formation until today. Just as the priesthood is passed on, so the monastic life is transmitted as apostolic life. This grace has come down to me, unworthy as I am. The monastic life is sacrifice and self-emptying, but for that reason, it is also glory. Whenever we feel deprivation for Christ's sake, we enjoy participation in the uncreated light of the triune God. Live in this way, and you will delight in what is eternal, starting from this life before death. Amen. End of quote. At that time, the elder gave his blessing for me to read the texts that he had written, which were included in the book We Shall See Him As He Is, and referred to mourning, repentance, the spiritual gift of the remembrance of death, and so on. Father Zacharias had translated them from Russian into Greek. I was struck with amazement as I read these texts. I felt I was reading writings by St. Simeon the New Theologian. I was truly intoxicated by the elder's words. Another incident, linked with the above, that I remember from that visit is that once I had read the elder's texts about the uncreated light, I went on to read the general epistles of St. John the Evangelist, and I perceived the depth of each word, as though the light of knowledge were shining out from it. The same also happened with the epistle to the Hebrews. The elder had said that the epistle to the Hebrews is actually an autobiography of the Apostle Paul and presents Christ as the great high priest whom he recognized on the road to Damascus. It also refers to the Apostle's repentance and weeping in the desert of Arabia, which was an experience of Christ's prayer in Gethsemane, God's chastening, and faith at its most profound. Following this analysis, I read the epistle to the Hebrews at the monastery as if for the first time, and as though I had acquired new eyes and a new perspective. The way the elder behaved with people delighted me. As soon as they saw him, they would surround him, and he would speak to them very pleasantly. Often he would express his joy by means of humor, laughing wholeheartedly. From this visit, I still have the photograph with the elder that is printed on the cover of this book. We were sitting in front of a small shed, which no longer exists, because later on St. Silouan's church was built on this site. It was one of those wonderful autumn afternoons just before sunset, when the atmosphere at the monastery was peaceful and contrite. I asked him for a personal meeting, and, and he, as usual, willingly agreed. This meeting took place as we walked along, and the discussion concerned our favorite topic, prayer. During prayer, the heart should open. This opening of the heart is expressed through tears and mourning. Then man is aware of the profound depth in his heart, and his noose enters this inner depth, and he finds the deep heart. The energy of noetic prayer may begin in someone when he is lying in bed. Then he ought to stay there and pray. It is not essential that one should begin praying after weeping beforehand. Prayer acts at any time and anywhere. The wind blows where it wishes, John 3, eight. Sometimes, when tears and the Jesus prayer have become intense, a severe pain is produced in the heart and the head with the thought, now you will die. Discretion is required. One should not stop the Jesus prayer completely, but reduce it a little, because if one stops it completely, it will probably be lost. Sometimes we do not pay attention while praying our daily prayer rule, whereas when we work and pray at the same time, we are very attentive. This happens because the spiritual life is often connected with the psychological state of the one who prays. If someone feels well psychologically and works, he prays as well. Or when he has mourning in his heart, he prays. Someone may have mindfulness of God without saying the words of the prayer. If we want to do something, we should wait until we receive strength from God to accomplish it. For instance, we want to go to the holy mountain. If we do not have strength to go, even if we go, it will be of no benefit to us. Often, for various reasons, the heart closes and does not open for prayer. This happens for different reasons in each case. 
In one, it is due to impertinence. In someone else, to idle chatter. In another, to self-esteem, and so on. Self-accusation and weeping are required. When someone lives in a state of inner tension, that is to say, when he prays inwardly, he sometimes becomes sensitive and irritable. There is a great risk that he may lose his temper over something trivial and even become very angry. Great care is needed. The monk lives with weeping. This is his natural state. There is nothing peculiar about this, as there is an abundance of divine longing in Eros. In someone who is visited by the grace of Christ, prayer becomes self-acting. The heart speaks. He will perceive it day and night. This is a special blessing. Then he ought to leave the world and enter a monastery. If he does not leave, he will quickly lose this grace. It is usual for someone to postpone going to a monastery because he thinks that he can retain self-acting prayer in the world, but it will quickly abandon him. Many sins can easily be committed in the world because many things happen that give someone energy and motivation. Praise from other people inflames pride, but it is also a consolation. In the monastery, however, praise and other consolations do not exist. So it is only obedience that gives the monk energy to pray. Anyone who is disobedient is lost. He fades away. He cannot pray and he has no life. When the time comes for someone to leave the monastery for the desert, he receives abundant grace of God and energy and nothing can hold him back. Then he will even climb out of the window of the monastery. The holy mountain can be a problem for those who have made some progress in the spiritual life. Two things can happen. They may be reduced to an ordinary state of conventional behavior and carelessness, or else, if they want to continue the program of their inner life, they will attract the envy of the other monks and temptations will arise. If someone has spiritual experiences, he does not need to consult many people because confusion will arise. He should obey his elder. As has been mentioned before, the elder was a man of prayer. His whole being was fiery prayer. He was possessed by thirst for God, which is why he spoke continually about this thirst. When one saw him, one realized that his whole being, his movements, his relations with others, his conversations and his words were the consequence of prayer. Thus he was a theologian in the highest sense, because according to St. Nilos the ascetic, if you are a theologian, you will pray truly, and if you pray truly, you are a theologian. This was also evident from the way in which he celebrated the Divine Liturgy. He regarded the Divine Liturgy as comparable with Christ's prayer in Gethsemane. Just as Christ prayed there for the whole world, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Matthew twenty six thirty nine. And his sweat fell like great drops of blood to the ground, Luke twenty two forty four. So the celebrant prays for the whole world. For the elder, the divine liturgy was neither a conventional procedure nor a simple prayer, particularly not an individual one, but a ministry to the people. The celebrating priest makes supplication to God for the whole world and live, lives Christ's agony in Gethsemane. In this perspective, he composed a prayer which he gave to the priests to read before the beginning of the Divine Liturgy. Quote, Jesus Christ, my Lord and my God, behold, I, unworthy priest as I am, dare to approach thy dread altar to perform my service. I beseech thee, everlasting King, who art from all eternity, turn not thy face from me, nor close thine ears to my lowly supplications. Do not disregard my intercession, for those redeemed by thy blood. No, nor reckon my boldness as sin. O oh my God, make haste for my help. Lord, make speed to help me. End of quote. When one reads carefully the liturgical prayers composed by the elder, which have been published, footnote C. Archimandrite Sophroni Sakharov's book on prayer, translated by Rosemary Edmonds, published by the Monastery of St. John the Baptist. 
One can perceive how he regarded the divine liturgy. The elder had a very profound sense of the magnificence of the mystery, and he prayed to the triune God for purification and illumination of the noose, for worthy participation in the body and blood of Christ, for the healing of our nature, which was crushed by Adam's fall, for participation in the uncreated light, and for entry into the everlasting kingdom of God. These liturgical prayers reveal the elder's theology as regards the divine liturgy and also the way in which he celebrated. The spirit of the divine liturgy pervaded the atmosphere of the monastery all through the week and was its deepest foundation. This is, this is what I felt when I visited the monastery and approached the elder, particularly when he was celebrating. I saw him as another Moses, who was ascending Mount Sinai to meet God and talk to him face to face. Before leaving the monastery, I found the opportunity in conversation to ask him about the Divine Liturgy, and he presented his basic teaching on it. The priesthood is not given to someone as a reward for his virtues, but as a gift for building up the church. One becomes a priest so as to be able to celebrate the Divine Liturgy and to sanctify people. Also, the priesthood has a social significance as the priest will also be concerned with construction work on the church building and with Christians who suffer. So he also needs to have qualities of this sort as well as spiritual ones. The Divine Liturgy took place once and for all. It is eternal. Every time the Divine Liturgy is celebrated, we ascend to its heights. If we live some aspects of the Divine Liturgy, we grasp its magnificence, as was the case with St. Seraphim of Serov who saw angels coming into the church during the little entrance. We merely attend the Divine Liturgy because we do not experience it, or until we experience it. The Divine Liturgy teaches us to live with the heart. By celebrating the Divine Liturgy, we, cre we keep Christ's commandment, Do this in remembrance of me. Luke twenty two nineteen and 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. That is why we say, Remembering, therefore, this saving commandment, this is not a psychological event, but a spiritual one. Every time we celebrate the Divine Liturgy, we obey Christ's word and penetrate into the mystery, the mystagogy, the liturgy of Christ. What God did once remains forever. This is what happens with the Divine Liturgy. Christ celebrated it once in the upper room at the Last Supper, and it remains forever. The Christian, depending on the sacrifice that he makes and how far he penetrates by grace into this spirit of the divine liturgy, receives grace from God and is purified of passions. In its perfection, the divine liturgy is supplication and prayer for the whole world. This is what is called the royal ritual or priesthood. In this way, man reaches the end of the ages. He does not wait for the day of the Lord, but this day of the Lord comes towards him. Thus he becomes without beginning by grace. The Divine Liturgy really was at the center of the monastery and of each monk's heart. Ascetic life and prayer led to the Divine Liturgy, and the Divine Liturgy provided strength and inspiration for asceticism, prayer, and repentance to continue. This was the profound truth of the monastery. 1981 in July 1981, I visited the monastery of St. John the Baptist in Essex again. It had become spiritually necessary for me to go there and benefit from the elders' theology and spirituality, but also from the hesychistic spirit of the monastery, as manifested in the church services and the whole of everyday life there. As soon as I arrived at the monastery, Father Zacharias immediately approached me and passed on to me the elders' love and his joy that I had come to the monastery again that year. He was very pleased that I loved the monastery. At the same time, he told me that the elder had ordered him to show me round that part of Essex. I saw the elder every day in the refectory. One day, on account of the strong sunlight and the fact that the elder's eyes could not tolerate brightness, I met him coming to the refectory wearing a broad-brimmed hat with obvious enjoyment. When I asked him simply, What sort of hat is that, Father? He replied, I found out on the holy mountain that monks are not lacking in originality. And he laughed wholeheartedly. I have written in introductory notes elsewhere that the elder was very fond of greenery. 
He wanted there to be many trees at the monastery. He asked us to plant various saplings on both sides of the narrow paths in the monastery garden. He wanted to walk under trees. While we were planting them, the elder came and expressed his pleasure at the work we were doing. He was so delighted that when we finished, he invited us into his bungalow to give us various soft drinks as refreshment. He was a great empirical theologian who behaved in a very simple manner. When we read the writings of the fathers, we see that God is described as simple. St. Gregory Palamas says that God's simplicity is connected with the non-existence of passion and not with the indivisible distinction between essence and energy. In the same way, someone who sees the uncreated light and participates in it is distinguished by his simplicity. I saw this very clearly in Father Sofroni. There was no split between the energies of his soul nor between his body and soul. One day I happened to meet the elder with some female students who had come to see him. They were asking him about various subjects and he was answering simply but with a theological word. He began by saying to them, The Greeks were always spiritual aristocrats. He said to a doctoral candidate, get a degree as a doctor so that you can go to Greece and say as many stupid things as you like. And he laughed. Referring to modern music, he said this, in the desert of the holy mountain, I used to hear strange music above a tree. And when I came to the West and rock music had been introduced, I said, I came across it 30 years ago. It was the same music. He also pointed out to them, in the Western world, people become Freemasons in order to become powerful. Someone said that she wanted to be more serious but could not, and the elder replied, psychiatric hospitals are full of serious people. He also said, converts are usually inclined to preach to us, and so they add salt and mustard to what they say. I also remember that he spoke to them about the cultural differences between the East and the West and stressed to them that the difference in culture had consequences within marriage. In other words, he spoke to them about relationships between young men and women and the problems of mixed marriages in a very apt theological and adroit way. I admired both his wisdom and his discretion. I talked to various monks and pilgrims. Someone told me, The elder sees other people clearly and is aware of them. Another said, The elder used to pray, Save, have mercy upon, succour and preserve thy servant, Hieromonk Porphyrios, and by his holy prayers have mercy upon me. And he would say, He is a great friend of ours. This shows that when people scale the heights of Pentecost and see the light, they are united with Christ and with one another. Saints recognize saints. One could benefit from every aspect of the monastery, from the monks, the pilgrims, and the atmosphere there. For example, one monk told me, There is a paternity crisis nowadays. Many people realized this in May of 1968 in Paris. There is a kind of individualism and a change in mentality that influences the whole of life. When a young man obeys his parents, he has fewer passions. It is difficult for orthodoxy to penetrate into the Western way of life and to be understood because Westerners have a different ethos. One day I met the elder on the stairs of the main building when I was coming down and he was going up. And he said to me lightheartedly, I am in a state of ascension at the moment. He meant he was going upstairs. I am pleased that you are with us. I always remember you. He was very courteous and spoke respectfully to everyone using the polite plural form in Greek. He took the opportunity then to tell me certain things. It must be stressed yet again that the elder was always ready to offer theological and spiritual words. His theological words reflected the radiance of his heart and were always ready to be spoken. The passage from the epistle was amazingly appropriate. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans chapter 10, verses 8 to 10. Every conversation with him opened the noose, and every word he spoke had energy. This is what he said to me there on the stairs. 
Repentance is linked with theology. There is always repentance in man, but it changes form. In the beginning, it is repentance on account of estrangement from God and the loss of divine grace, and afterwards repentance to find more grace. When someone repents, he receives grace from God. When he receives grace, the light, he sees his sins more until he reaches the light and himself becomes light. In the vision of the light, he sees his createdness, corruptibility, and mortality, and repentance grows. So repentance leads to theology and is inspired by it. Repentance never ceases. There was a monk who had prayer when he was working with his hands, but when he stopped working in order to pray, he lost it. This happened because he had a proud thought. We must pray with great humility and repentance. When prayer gives rise to, to a proud thought, usually one's nerves and noose are shaken. When someone is accused by other people, he ought to face it in silence. Because as St. John Climacus says, Christ's silence put Pilate to shame. When someone begins to pray, prayer itself will answer his questions. Otherwise, however much he hears about prayer, he will understand nothing. When someone has the energy of grace and loses his temper, he feels his heart changing place. Monasticism is a traditional institution. It is a tradition. When the Holy Spirit departs, monasticism will disappear. In our days, monasticism has become less of a tradition and is maintained as a human effort. A great temptation will befall the monasteries. There will be a greater shortage of people than ever before. We should not accept people with psychological problems into the monastery because the one with problems will be tormented and he will torment the other monks. When someone with psychological problems is obedient, the problems are curable. Incurable psychological disorders are marked by lack of obedience. People who are simple cannot understand others and are easily misunderstood. At the end of the conversation, before asking for his blessing, I asked him to pray for someone. He replied, I find it difficult to pray because I do not sympathize with him. We should pray for those for whom we feel sympathy. Then prayer is beneficial. One day he invited me to join him on his customary afternoon walk. This time he put me in the middle between Father Kirill and himself, and he held my arm. I was very surprised at this action of his. He said to me at once, I am pleased that you are with us. I regard you as some of our dearest brothers. In the course of the conversation, he said repeatedly, You're right. That is so. Something like that. Among other things, he said, Nowadays, many theologians, and he mentioned some of them, write about prayer and say stupid things. On the 23rd of August of the same year, as I recorded in my notebook, I met the elder to discuss specific issues. I kept the following notes from this discussion as follows. The Apostle Paul received the revelation from God through repentance and not from books. He received corroboration and confirmation of this revelation from the Apostles when he visited them. Through repentance, man enters the divine being. Then theology is a narrative. In other words, he simply narrates what he has seen, heard, and received. Those who philosophize talk about God as though he did not exist. However, God is being. He said, I am that I am. Philosophers and philosophizing theologians say that God is non-existent because they have not received a revelation from God and do not know God personally. The saints used to say that they had not begun to repent because as soon as they saw God who is without beginning, they realized that in God there is no beginning or end and they perceived their createdness and corruptibility. The Jews used to pray with their rational faculty. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was given to the apostles as fiery tongues, and they perceived another form of prayer, the prayer of the heart. For the first time, they prayed with their heart. God's revelations to man are momentary and inhypostatic. We see this in Paul, Moses, and Philip. God does not utter many words, but one life-giving word. 
This one word is conveyed by the prophet to the people using many words. Even the saints cannot argue with God when they wrestle with him. Never mind us. People wrestle with God because they do not know his will and they attribute their own thoughts, desires, and speculations to God. There is divine light and devilish light. Sometimes one also sees the natural light of one's mind. The philosophers, Platonists and other Westerners and Buddhists in the East behold the natural light of their mind, and sometimes they are even influenced by the devil. There's a great difference between them. The devil's light has a different energy. When the devil showed his light to star at Siloan, Siloan even saw his intestines. The natural light of the mind is an illumination from philosophical teachings. Then man feels that these illuminations come and go. The divine light, however, gives another kind of knowledge. It is the light of love, the light of Christ, a revelation of the triune God. It is a mistake to identify the natural light of the mind with the divine light, just as it is a mistake to identify the natural light of the mind with satanic light. Thus, the natural light of the mind may be regarded as satanic in accordance with the saying, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Matthew sixteen twenty three. At other times, the natural light of the mind is different from devilish light. The light of the angels is participation in the uncreated light. The light of Plotinus does not embrace the world with love. In the West, the culture is different from that of the Orthodox East. It is a culture of reason. They pray with their rational faculty and know nothing about the prayer of the heart. For that reason, when Westerners enter the Orthodox Church, many years must pass in order for prayer to descend to their heart and for them to assimilate divine grace. Patience is needed with any aberrations they may have. If someone wants to become Orthodox and after his baptism, he returns to his home country where there is no Orthodox liturgical environment or appropriate spiritual conditions for his development, he experiences confusion. Because people in the West live with their rational faculty, the so-called charismatic movement, Pentecostals, has appeared to enable them to understand the heart. We should not characterize this charismatic state that can be observed in the West as delusion because when we tell them that they are deluded, it is of no benefit to them. We should turn this current in the right direction and speak to them about orthodox hesychism. Those who become orthodox add vinegar even when they should not. The bad thing about those who belong to the charismatic movement is that they think that they are experiencing Pentecost and are therefore in a very exalted spiritual state. This is nonsense. The Apostle Paul spoke in tongues, but he placed greater emphasis on the charisma of love. People ask me why there is no charismatic movement in the Orthodox, and I reply, because the Orthodox Church has never lacked the prayer of the heart. In a female monastic community in Belgium, there are nuns who have charismatic gifts. They try to live by the gift of the Holy Spirit. In principle, regard this as good, but it should be cultivated correctly through noetic prayer. Start Siloan had a very strong and sturdy body, and he could break a plank of wood that the others could not break. But he had no carnal thoughts. His noose and his body were changed by the advent of God's grace. Communism is put into practice in the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, it is an impossible ideal. This is clear in the case of Anais and Sapphira. They wanted to keep some of their wealth for themselves, and the Apostle Peter told them, You have not lied to men, but to God. Acts 5.4 Nowadays, a saint cannot be a bishop because people cannot endure what he says. For that reason, bishops are needed who have more mediocre experience and administrative abilities because politicians today try to approach the church through the hierarchy. Therefore, they need to have administrative abilities and experience in order to keep the church out of politics. The best thing nowadays is to be a priest. A bishop told me, I am concerned about your salvation. And I replied, 
I am pleased that you are more concerned about my salvation than I am. There is a concelebrant at every divine liturgy. Each one participates according to his receptivity and receives divine grace. When someone argues with rationalists or others who only observe the outward forms, he suffers harm because he will either start teaching them, in which case he will lose humility, or else he will meet with resistance and his heart will be wounded. Star at Siloan felt the words, keep your mind in hell and despair not, like needles in his body. I would rather be murdered by worldly people than go along with them and acquire a worldly mentality. Sometimes a lot of work crushes the heart more than the scientific labor of prayer. There is a difference between ascetic humility and the humility of Christ. When the monk experiences Christ's humility, may God enlighten us to say it briefly, he senses an outpouring of love, but he also, as far as it is possible, has a sense of seeing the beauty of Christ's face, who is the beauty of the world. When other people distress us, we should often let it pass unremarked, without explanation, because the others may not have realized that they hurt us. And it is possible that if we ask for their forgiveness, they will think about it and it will cause a problem. Sometimes when grace withdraws, despair comes. Then support is needed, because in this state many monks even abandon monasticism. Very few people have been through profound repentance with great mourning. When someone lives the spiritual life, his, na his nature is united with divine grace. When someone rests and falls asleep saying the Jesus prayer, the energy of the prayer remains within him all night. What is said of St. Anna applies in this case, that she glorified God night and day. When someone is not at peace, it means that something is wrong. If someone prepares spiritually and marries, he will be at peace. When someone is at peace, then even if he has temptations, everything will be all right. When we observe ourselves and spy on ourselves, our noose departs from repentance. I teach the monks not to speak about the wrongs they suffer, but to keep silent. We ought to live as those who are crucified. This is orthodox spirituality. Our policy is that people should approach us without being afraid. Those who want to become monks and are dependent on their families ought to tell them. Otherwise, they should enter the monastery and inform them afterwards. In the second case, it will cause a shock, but they will soon calm down. I set up this monastery in this way. Circumstances imposed it on us. Couples come to stay from all over the world, as well as young men and women, who would not be able to stay here if they were only for men. This could not happen in Greece. In the monastery of Simonopetra, when I was confessor for a while in the 1940s, the old monks spoke to me against the young ones and the young monks against the old ones. I used to say to the old monks, don't expect to find perfect monasticism among the young ones as they come from this world. To the young monks I would say, you are unable to understand them because monasticism is another way of life. I told both young and old to be patient, and this way I tried to keep a balance. It is clear from church history that those monasteries survived which were founded by the labor and effort of the brethren. After that, those survived which were founded by emperors, and lastly, those founded by bishops. Faces change every day in our monastery. It is like what happens with the liturgical books. There is the prayer book that contains the services, and then there, there are the menea that change every month. Parents are to blame for 70 to 80 percent of their children's problems. It is easier to raise someone from the dead than to reconcile two women who envy one another. I want to behave with freedom and simplicity. This helps people to open their hearts. This presupposes that one is free from passions. It is impossible to argue with some pe simple people because they do not understand and we will suffer harm. Parents should bring up their children with discretion. They should not force them and should leave them free. They should buy them 
new clothes, and they should mix socially. They should take them to a restaurant, to a good theater, because otherwise they will react. Those who are suffering, wounded, or poor cannot endure much, so they are offended by the slightest thing. When you love someone sincerely, he will trust you because he realizes it. Then you protect him from temptations. From the day of the wedding, about ten years will pass before the couple achieves equilibrium. We should follow them discreetly. We should offer a spiritual perspective and not get involved in details. Only in difficult cases should we intervene. When the fear of God comes to someone, he sees the slightest impulses of sin within himself and he begins to repent and to mourn. Then a director, a yeronda, an elder is needed, as well as love and patience, for otherwise he will be crushed. One word from the elder ignites the fear of God. For that reason, one needs first to become proficient in practical things, to be firmly grounded in practice, so that one can endure states of fear. The English language does not have an orthodox atmosphere. For example, the word person means something neutral in the meaning of the Greek word for contrition and meekness is impossible to convey. The English language is not suited to orthodoxy. The battle against us is fierce. Everyone is against us, as are science and politics. I am not a pessimist, but I think we are living in the last times. Our own attitude should be that of the martyrs. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before his shearers, so he opens not his mouth. Isaiah 53, 7. When we respond to force with force, we achieve nothing. The silent attitude of the martyrs will ensure a longer-lasting victory. If we too exercise force on other people, we shall oblige them to prepare for a second greater attack. And to conclude from 1981, at the end of the discussion, he said, until we meet again, before I die. When we came out of the office after quite a long time, the abbot was waiting for him outside the, with the monks of the monastery. They obviously had work to do. Then the elder said, I was talking to Father Herotheus and we forgot the world. Before I left the monastery, I asked the elder to hear my confession. He called me to the office, which was also used for confessions, and I told him what was on my mind. His attitude was most venerable. After the customary prayer, he sat down on the chair and remained motionless, somehow settling his gaze and his noose on an icon without looking me in the face. I told him my thoughts in a few words, and he confined himself to giving some brief advice. Then he read the prayer for me in a most contrite manner. The confession was an initiation into mysteries. And while he was reading the prayer very slowly, the energy of his prayer was palpable. His basic view was that the mystery of confession is different from a discussion. The penitent states the core of the thought, sin or passion that bothers him, particularly during prayer, without going into details, and the spiritual father is left free to express the inner conviction or the first thought that comes to him after prayer. He also used to say that when someone asks his spiritual father and receives advice, he ought to adopt and accept this counsel as his own and try to put it into practice without telling other people what the spiritual father said to him. He often told me that this is one of the basic rules of the mystery of confession. When this rule is broken, all sorts of confusion arise and it also causes various people to react against the spiritual father. He also said that another rule relating to the mystery of confession is that the penitent must not reach the point of doing battle with his spiritual father. It was then that I discerned one of his great charismas. He told me, if you happen to have a certain temptation, and he told me exactly which one, do not waver or be discouraged. It is an attack by the devil on account of the successes that you have in your work. A few days after returning to Greece, that temptation did, in fact, befall me. If the elder had not foreseen it and told me about it in advance, I would have been very distressed. Father Sophroni was a great hesychist and theologian, but also a wise, 
discerning, and prophetic spiritual father. He had rare gifts of grace. 1982. In 1982, my usual visit to the monastery took place in August. By then, these visits had become the oxygen that I needed to take into my lungs in order to breathe. At one of our first meetings in the monastery refectory, the elder turned to one of the monks and said, Our relationship with Father Herotheus grows deeper all the time. Then he said to me, Now we have close communion with one another. I cannot leave you, nor you me. One day we met on the site where the construction of the new church had begun, and the elder said, It is a difficult thing today to build a church. All the demons will rise up. And he told me an antidote that he had heard in Russia. Quote, Someone went to hell, but he wanted there to be a church there, too, so he could pray. Despite his sinfulness, he loved God and wanted to pray. He began to measure the site in order to lay foundations. A devil asked him what he was doing. He replied, I want to build a church so that I can pray. The devil was uneasy because it was impossible for a church to be built in hell, and he tried to stop him. He did not manage. He summoned other demons. They could not do anything either. They reported it to their leader. Then many demons gathered, and they threw him out of hell to prevent a church from being built. End quote. And he continued, So we build churches to change hell into paradise, and if we do not manage to do that, we will succeed in not being accepted by the devil in hell. And he laughed wholeheartedly. When we met to talk, the elder said, Among other things, and what follows the sayings of the elder. The movement among some people, young people, in favor of anarchy is grand, but they stole it from Holy Scripture and distorted it. According to Holy Scripture, every power and authority will be abolished in the, in the future. After the second coming, no one will need other people, but the just will have communion with God and with each other. Every authority will be abolished. There will be no need for them to have knowledge about God, but they will have knowledge of God. Burdiev says that the different interpretations that people give is the privilege of freedom. This is not correct. There's one truth or there's no truth at all. Those who share a common life also share a common teaching. We should not write in a scholastic way, quoting the words of the fathers to lend authority to what we say. We should write with reference to Holy Scripture using a few patristic passages. This is what the fathers did, and this is what those who have knowledge of God do. When we have spiritual experience, we read Holy Scripture and the patristic writings, and we understand them. Those in the East who practice meditation also see some sort of light, but this vision, Theoria, separates them from all the rest of creation with a certain pride. This light is not divine but devilish, and created. By contrast, in orthodoxy, the theoria of the divine light transmits life to man and the love for whole of creation. Those who hate themselves, their passions, are the true theologians in the church. Unless someone hates himself unto death, he cannot be a disciple of Christ and a teacher of the people. Let us keep the orthodox faith. And, since we live in difficult times, we shall receive a greater reward than others who lived in earlier ages and kept the faith. In Christianity, we have a revelation of God and we struggle to confirm the revelation. The saints do this down through the ages. Otherwise, Christianity becomes an idea or a value. We rely on the life and teaching of the saints. When God gives someone the gift of speaking, he, he does not give the gift of curing physical ailments. This is because the gift of theolo theological words heals man spiritually, and someone who is spiritually cured does not also need to be cured of physical illnesses. When we talk about God, we should be gripped by fear and a sense of his presence. A young woman who practiced Buddhism came into contact with Protestants and began to read Holy Scripture and to pray. At once, the guru was unable to communicate with her and could not read her thoughts. This is even more the case when someone becomes orthodox. Then he will have greater power. 
I besought God, and he gave me the spiritual gift of understanding the divine liturgy spiritually in all languages. It's a strange thing. You celebrate the divine liturgy, and at the end you do not know in which language you celebrated it. You experience all the spirit and atmosphere of the divine liturgy. In the Old Testament, they usually prayed with their rational faculty. On the day of Pentecost, the experience of the heart was granted to the apostles. Then they burst out into hymns and prayer. This is the spiritual gift of speaking in tongues. The apostle Paul also had this charisma. However, he considered that the greatest gift of grace is the charisma of love. In the life of the church, which experienced this new life and became accustomed to it, the gift of speaking in tongues was transformed into noetic prayer of the heart. When some Westerners become Orthodox, they are radiant. After five or six years, however, they become as hard as stone. They wrestle with their nature and with their heritage. As man receives divine grace from his mother's womb, as happened with St. John the Baptist, why should he not receive divine grace when he is reborn in baptism? It is mainly the heart that perceives the sense of divine grace. The affliction, suffering, and contempt to which man is subject in his life are natural states. They are evidence of authenticity. We have to suffer in our life. It is here that Buddhism differs. Buddhists avoid suffering, whereas we pursue it, because it cleanses the heart from passions. Self-esteem brings carnal temptations. Strange things happen by the providence of God. He brings us to repentance through everything that happens, even through falls, as long as we have the humility to perceive these things. The ladder of perfection is outlined in the Beatitudes. Man begins from a sense of sinfulness and mourning and reaches the point of conflict with the world. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Matthew 5.10 This is natural. Then one theologizes. Self-sufficiency stops all spiritual progress. Man's noose and heart ought to not be fixed anywhere, either on people or things. Then everything is pure. If they become fixed, things begin to go awry. Sometimes pain during prayer and even the cessation of prayer are caused by a proud thought. God diminishes the grace of prayer. Then one ought to stop praying vaingloriously. This happened to me once with the gospel. While I was reading the gospel, I fell down as though dead. After that, I could not read the gospel for many months, although there was no problem with other books. In such cases, the way one prays has to change to prevent self-esteem. There has to be more liturgical prayer and less Jesus prayer so that we can fool ourselves and not be proud. When a proud thought approached from a distance and I recognized it because it caused disturbance in my heart, I would stop praying and say, My murderers are coming. I shall go to hell. Even if someone works miracles, he should say, God performed the miracle, but I shall go to hell. The lover of sensual pleasure who dwells upon sensual pleasure and indulges in it, even though he has not committed any carnal act, acquires a culture of self-indulgence and is worse than someone who has gone as far as the action. Because there is a chance that someone who has committed the sin may perceive his sin and repent, whereas the one who indulges psychologically and sensual pleasure, but does not repent because he does not realize that it is a sin. Also, those who have a culture of self-indulgence are unable to make a sincere confession because they find it difficult to tell the spiritual father and they suffer torments. In this way, however, the spiritual life does not develop. It is difficult to live in this world and not sin. It is necessary to live in the spirit of repentance and prayer. Someone should not think about anything that happens to him during prayer because Satan, too, can cause these things. The noose ought to be completely free. People who have been crushed by various illnesses usually do not have carnal energy. This shows the spiritual value of infirmities. The devil often appears to ascetics and accuses God. That is to say, he appears as a handsome youth and tells the ascetic, See how beautiful I am, and yet God condemned me. When someone receives God's grace and loses it, he goes through a particular type of despair. 
This is natural. It's normal. He must be very patient and pray a lot to God. When our noose becomes the noose of Christ, it changes direction. It sees things differently. When Christians and monks proceed with penitence, all psychological problems are cured. Once there was an earthquake at the monastery of St. Pantalemon. Then I stood in the doorway at, of my cell. Neither my soul nor body was frightened by the earthquake. Immediately afterwards, I ran to the church to die with the fathers if the earthquake continued. Nothing happened. I was fearless. When, however, I came back to open the door of my cell, my body was afraid, but not my soul. From this we realize that the soul differs from the body. When we read a patristic text, we ought to pray to that Holy Father that we may conceive the word in the same way as he conceived it. When someone lives in the spirit of repentance and mourning, he cannot do translations, preach, or read. When someone does not weep with his eyes, when he does not shed tears, it is good for him to have repentance in his heart. When we receive the first advent of grace, this experience needs to be verified by experienced spiritual fathers. Otherwise, something will go wrong. One feels a certain insecurity then. When someone prays and his neck hurts, this is usually due to stress. He should pray humbly and it will pass. Praying scientifically with tension and psychotechnical methods causes a headache. When, however, the heart is found, rivers of theology flow within. When I used to pray with repentance and much weeping, and a proud thought came from afar that the light would come, I would stop praying and say, my murderers are coming. And that thought did not approach me. At other times in that state, although I was experiencing profound mourning, I would suddenly begin to laugh, and immediately the proud thought would go away. I preferred to stop praying rather than accept a proud thought. When we put Christ's commandments into practice, we acquire grace to penetrate into the noose of Christ as far as eternity. When we lose the first grace, our unsatisfied passions, which remained inactive during the first period of grace, urgently demand satisfaction. Thus one is tormented, and many psychological and bodily illnesses are caused. Often these illnesses are not organic in nature. Patience is needed. They will pass. Many people, when they experience the first advent of grace, become monks out of the love that they have for God. Later on, however, when they lose grace, they become discouraged. For that reason, they ought not to become monks the first time contrition comes, because later they will be shaken and will not know how to cope. Weeping and godly mourning crush man, then he has no leeway for anything else. This weeping, however, brings peace, not despair. When a monk lives in a monastery in an idiorhythmic way, on the one hand, it creates problems for him because he does not make progress, and on the other hand, it wounds the whole brotherhood. Cassian, the Roman, said that there are two things that monks should fear, bishops and women. Sin may be committed with women, but there is repentance, which is not the case with bishops. In other words, when you fight with bishops, you cannot repent. A monk in a monastery should not deliberately seek the priesthood because then the priesthood will cause him many problems. He should wait for God to show him through the spiritual father whether he should become a priest. In the past, the fathers on the holy mountain did not send away visitors that came to them. If they could not offer them hospitality, they themselves would go far away to prevent people from finding them. At the monastery, we should receive everyone, because then God's providence will never abandon us. When someone begins to judge his spiritual father, or when a monk begins to judge his monastery, he suffers spiritual harm. Because I had begun to set up a monastic community for women, Metropolitan Herotheus continues, the elder gave me some general advice. We should proceed very gradually. We should not begin with many nuns. The first nuns ought to gain personal experience so that they can help and teach the others who will come. The nuns should receive people simply and humbly. In some monasteries they ask, why have you come? How did you come? 
Why did you not write to us? And many other questions. Then people stay in the monastery like corpses. The following ought to happen. They should receive people joyfully, then leave them to live as though they were at home, without asking them various questions about their life and their problems. This is what people today want. They see something genuine in this. And when they say, why don't you ask us about our life? We should reply lightheartedly, we do it out of laziness. We are lazy. When we behave like this, the pilgrims are set at ease. And then they begin of their own accord to seek advice. If I had have had success with the monastery, may God forgive me. It is because I do not make comments. When they break plates, I do not comment at all. Thus they gradually correct their faults. No one goes to the monastery to live, but to repent. Otherwise one stays in the world. The same happens as with universities. People do not go to the university to live, but to learn. When monks live in repentance without talking a lot, then even if they make mistakes, the pilgrims will sense the spirit of repentance and will benefit. When a nun's relatives cause problems for the monastery and the thought occurs to the nun to leave the monastery that it should not have difficulties on her account, this is a proud thought. In this case, the thought should be exchanged for another. I have caused difficulties for the monastery and this thought will bring repentance. As a spiritual father, when I used to confess monks under the age of 40, I was extremely patient because there was hope of amendment. After the age of 40, I read the prayer of forgiveness and I intervene if there is a particular reason. He also spoke to me about young people and psychological problems. Someone who is psychologically ill should learn to weep. In this way, he will be cured of his infirmity. It is natural for spiritual fathers to be interested in creating new Christian families and to help in this respect. Often, however, they do not do so because people are incapable of accepting the providence of God, and so they ascribe all their failures to their spiritual fathers. Spiritual anxiety ought not to be caused during the mystery of confession. A breeze of freedom ought to circulate between the spiritual father and the penitent. Many young people nowadays are unable to decide whether to break with the world or live with the world. This ambivalence is a very bad thing. Today, many people lose their reason and are full of psychological problems due to drugs and love of sensual pleasure. Young people today are very confused. They talk a lot, but their noose wanders about on the periphery and the central core the meaning is lost. Psychologists study the human being through the human being, that is to say, using human capabilities. In this way, however, people despair when they see their inner impurity. By contrast, when we see our inner impurity, the filth, in a spirit of compunction, it is different because it gives rise to prayer and hope in Christ. Father Sofroni had great spiritual experience, but also extraordinary social experience. He could guide monks on their journey to deification, but also people with families, young people and anarchists, enabling them to live better lives in society. His noose was pure and anchored in his heart, and his words were theological and pastoral. He was, in fact, the longest living elder in the Orthodox Church who had such experience, practical knowledge, wisdom, and discretion. This is how many people saw him. 1983. I visited the Holy Monastery again in June of 1983. It was impossible not to do so because my contact with the elder had become very close, as had my contact with the monks, particularly Father Zacharias, who was a precious spiritual brother. At that time, I made the acquaintance of a visitor who had practiced meditation in the past, and she told me how the elder set her free from this delusion. He did not advise her from the beginning to stop meditating because he realized that she would not have obeyed and would have left him. However, he told her not to use the words of the mantras for meditation, but to use Christian phrases, particularly the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. After a short time, she herself requested of the elder that she should stop meditating because she realized that she could not practice meditation and pray with the name of Christ. 
For two or three years, the elder expended much effort on her. But in the end, everything turned out well. He gave her this advice because he saw that if he told her that she was deluded, she would react. This case also shows how the elder exercised his pastoral ministry. At the first meeting that I had with him, he expressed his joy and said, according to the records, I am 87 years old, whereas actually, spiritually, I am younger. Because I had tried to put into practice various scientific methods for praying the Jesus prayer, which I had read about and heard from the fathers on the holy mountain, the elder told me, the noetic work that you did was superhuman. That is why you have tired yourself out. You need a rest. You should change the way you work. The body is slow to conform to the noose. It adapts to prayer to the extent that one keeps Christ's commandments, fasts, and so on. When the noose is in God, all the passions cease, whereas when God's grace departs, the passions are active. Celebrate the liturgy, hear confessions, and read the Fathers without tension. The soul takes in the meaning of what it reads. Although psychotechnical methods using the prayer rope, exercising force on oneself, staying awake, help in the beginning, afterwards they have risks, such as vainglory, banality, and so on. My principle is that one should have repentance and profound mourning. And he added, although you have worn yourself out physically with the way you pray, you have not suffered spiritual harm. Your soul has known the love of God, the living God, whom the knowledge gained at the theological college cannot offer. At the Divine Liturgy on the Sunday of All Saints, after Holy Communion, he told me, go out and speak. I replied, Father, I have not prepared. He said, but aren't you a Diocesan preacher? I replied, I am a preacher, but not a prophet, so I need to prepare. He repeated, go out and speak and I obeyed. I will if you give me your blessing. He blessed me, and I went out of the royal doors. He sat in a chair in front of me, a little to the right, first among the congregation. I began with the first sentence that came into my mind, prompted by the feast of all saints that we were celebrating, by the prophets, apostles, and martyrs. I explained that Christ was at the center of them all. They experienced Christ in various ways, and there was unity between them. The prophets were apostles and martyrs. The apostles were prophets and martyrs. The martyrs were prophets and apostles. And I analyzed why this was so. At the end, I explained that the monastic saints are successors to the prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and I expounded on this subject. When I finished, he came up to me, and in front of the whole congregation, he embraced me and greeted me enthusiastically. This shows how noble he was. One day we walked together from the refectory to his bungalow. Someone approached us and asked him to sign the Greek translation of his book, His Life is Mine, with a dedication. He said, I don't want to because that book is not mine. There are many explanations for this. One is that th these are revelations from God. Another is that it did not express him absolutely because it was written for the people in the West. He had been unable to include chapters on mourning, repentance, and so on, which he regarded as essential for an Orthodox book, because Westerners are unable to understand such matters. When we arrived outside his bungalow, he told me, I commemorate you in prayer, both you and the work you do. Not a lot, but I remember you. And as he went up the steps to his bungalow, he said, When you become a bishop, you should love monks. When the elder said monks, he meant genuine monks who are distinguished by the orthodox hesychistic spirit and respect the spiritual gifts that God gives the church and the charisma of the episcopate, which he too held in honor. He never allowed his monks to speak against bishops. On the contrary, he trained them to respect the spiritual life of the gift of the episcopate, regardless of any possible mistakes. In 1983, we had two discussions. The first was in the office at the monastery and the second while walking along as peripatetic philosophers. At the first discussion in the office, he said the following among other things. The hypostasis of God defies all definition. Even though it is intellectually unknown, 
it is known existentially, and man shares in it in proportion to God's self-revelation to him. The hypostasis personhood is the inner principle of being, its original and final dimension. Some theologians write about the ontology of the person. A philosophical formulation is required because the essence is not an objective principle, independent of the hypostasis. However, I write about the asceticism of the person, about the hypo hypostatic principle. The hypostasis personhood is a matter of God's revelation to man, not an object of speculation. The essence is not the primary or even the preferential movement that defines the person hypostasis in their mutual relations. The beginning of the persons of the Holy Trinity is the Father, who begets the Word and causes the Holy Spirit to proceed. The iconographer portrays the person, not the nature, which is why he writes the saint's name. An icon without a name says nothing. It is not an icon. Just as an icon of the crucified Christ without Christ's name, or the Greek words, he who is, in the halo, is not an icon of the crucified Christ. We are called through Christ's commandments to become like God so that the person hypostasis may come to light. When one person, when one becomes a person, one is never alone. The person does not know what loneliness is. He lives with God and other people. A hypostasis seeks another hypostasis. When we come near to the prayer in Gethsemane and we pray for the whole world, the person comes to light. Love is an existential content of the life of the person. In the desert, one acquires love for the whole world, precisely because there one experiences God's love. Thus one becomes a person, hypostasis, and loves all Adam. The created person, man, is not determined by anything. No one can know him unless the person wants to reveal himself to the other. We ought to live in an orthodox way, that is to say, to be aware of our sinful state. That is where prayer begins, since we are far away from God. Then prayer is not prayed with words, but as the reaching up of the hypostasis towards God. God is humility. Humility is God's self-emptying, kenosis, his love. Ascetic humility is not the same thing as Christ's humility. Ascetic humility requires a struggle and contains an element of comparison. Christ's humility is a natural condition. It does not entail comparison, and it is linked with self-emptying. God's revelation to us opens our horizons to Christ's commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves. God's revelation to a human being results in him changing his life, and this whole theoria imbues the world, as human nature is one and common to all. Sometimes even the historical circumstances of life change through a regenerated human being, as happened in the case of Moses. An imaginative noose is incapable of theology. There are two reasons for this. Firstly, because theology is an em empirical science and not the product of reason and imagination, as imagination is a post-fall phenomenon. Secondly, because God is beyond reason, incomprehensible, uncreated, and without beginning, and we cannot understand him with our rational faculty. God is revealed to us. For this, a pure heart is necessary. Thus, someone with an imaginative noose cannot theologize. The All-Holy Virgin, our Panagia, said to the Archangel Gabriel, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Luke one thirty eight. These words, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, are an acceptance of the cross. The All-Holy Virgin participated all through her life in the, the cross of her son. Star at Siloan is, a, is in the company of the great saints, like St. Anthony the Great, Abba Piman, and the rest, because he experienced hell, but he also saw Christ. The monks at the monastery of St. Pantaleon on the holy mountain attached no importance to St. Star at Siloan. They used to say that they had many others like Star at Siloan. Also, after his decease, they gave various people any of his personal effects that they requested. So, today at the monastery, they have none of Star at Siloan's personal things. 
Four nuns in a Catholic monastery asked to take the name Sulawani. Afterwards, others wanted to as well, but as this was impossible, they took the name Sophronia. This shows the influence of St. Siloan's words, even on non-Orthodox. The heresy of the Philoquy has an effect on the nature of Westerners, and that is why it is difficult for them to become Orthodox. The Apostle Peter shuts the gates of paradise from the West, meaning the heresy of the Western world. We now enter paradise from the East. In the Catholic Church, although outwardly they appear to accept the Fourth Ecumenical Council, in reality they have a different perception. Perhaps they did not understand the First Ecumenical Council either, and for that reason they fell into the heresy of the Philoque. A Catholic priest told me, For you Orthodox, the dogmas are a path to God, whereas for us, the new dogmas are obstacles, so we should discard them. We should not think, what do the Roman Catholics do so I can avoid doing it? That is wrong. Our criterion should not be the Roman Catholics, but what God wills. Generally speaking, the Protestants are naive. Among the Protestants, the Evangelicals are the best. They are naive because they say that they believe in Christ as God because Holy Scripture says so, but they do not have the depth that the Orthodox have, the profound personal knowledge of Christ, and they do not know how to do battle with their thoughts. It is possible in the Orthodox Church for there to be translations of the New Testament with mistakes, but they do not cause problems because there is life, the Divine Eucharist. Among the Protestants, on the contrary, who regard Holy Scripture as the source of faith, one translation error alters their whole mentality. For a Muslim to become a Christian, he must wait until he receives great grace, so that he is prepared to be martyred for Christ. If he has not received this grace, he should wait. Someone passed successfully through Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and black magic. In all the religions, he practiced magic at the same time. As soon as he became orthodox, he wanted to practice magic in parallel, but he was unable to do so. He realized from this that magic is the foundation of all the religions, and that the religions are dead, their leaders are dead, whereas Christ is the living God. Exorcisms need to be read for many years for those who have been involved in magic. This is what the early church used to do. Buddhism possesses some truths, but it possesses a human truth that goes as far as nothing. Through self-concentration or meditation, it leads man towards the non-existence from which we were created. This is a sort of existential suicide. Christ leads us to deification, to communion with the triune God. Some say that Buddhism has nothing to do with demonic possession. Those who talk like that, however, know Buddhism from books and speak theoretically. In practice, it is different. Some say that they reach a state of calm through meditation. Outwardly, this seems like a good thing, but these people are in the grip of arrogance and end up struggling with carnal desire. Even if they break with Buddhism, they will still struggle with carnal desire. This shows the devilishness of this method. Anyone who reads various books on psychological or Buddhist topics will never be able to acquire a clear sense of orthodoxy. When people who were atheists say that they came to orthodoxy from atheism or existentialism without an intervening period of repentance, something is wrong in their lives and they will not turn out well. People want members of the clergy to be near to them, but this is not beneficial. The glory of members of the clergy does not lie in acquiring a good name in the world, but in experiencing kenosis and self-emptying. Persecution is the rule in the spiritual life. There are usually two great passions for members of the clergy, love of pleasure and remembrance of wrongs. Salvation is difficult for members of the clergy, much more difficult for bishops. Great spiritual fathers who have the Holy Spirit transcend the outward forms without violating them. Lesser spiritual fathers, however, ought to observe the forms. 
The same happens when a text is translated from one language into another. Someone who knows the language very well grasps the meaning of the words, whereas someone else who does not know the language well translates word for word. It is the same with spiritual fathers. The prayer of monks supports the whole world. This happens because man is made in God's image. The fact that he is in God's image is revealed, above all, in pure prayer. The manifestation of God's image shows the success of the purpose for which the world was created. If someone does not pray, he lives the failure of his creation and his existence. The monastic life means pain. The things that I have been through in my life are dangerous because when someone believes that he has received God's grace, he can be deluded. Many have fallen into delusion. When someone lives the monastic life with pain, he will one day reach the point of saying, it would have been better had I not been born. So great is the pain. But the pain is a great gift. It is a privilege. Someone asked me if I advised him to become a monk. I replied that I could not advise him. He asked, why could you not advise me? Perhaps you regret becoming a monk. I replied, I do not regret becoming a monk. But when the grace to be a monk comes to someone, he immediately leaves for the monastery and does not need advice. Physical illnesses in monks are different from those of worldly people. Usually they are not apparent to doctors. Sometimes it is good that there are illnesses because they help spiritually. Some people asked Father Porfirios about the way our monastery functions. He replied, it is more difficult, therefore also more perfect. And it really is so. We do not want to transgress the canons of the Holy Fathers, but here in England, it cannot be otherwise. Circumstances and God's will imposed it on us. In the other autocephalous churches, the same thing could not happen, but here we cannot live in any other way. On the worldly level, it is considered clever for the pupil to correct the teacher and contradict him. On the spiritual level, however, for the disciple to contradict the elder is stupidity and spiritual death. Monasteries today will cease to be theological. Pious people will live in them, but not theologians. Piety is not the same thing as theology. When people enter the monastery to become monks, they usually have a lot of passions, and a long period of struggle has to pass in order for them to be cured. The Jesus prayer is not enough to cure them. The monk's obedience and the spiritual father's patience are also required. Some monks have powerful bodies, and often their bodies and their passions express themselves through disobedience. Usually abbots who acquire worldly renown and are honored by the world are very hard and unfeeling toward their monks. They pay no attention to them at all. When someone is despised, he is free. This happens in monasteries as well. When they despise someone, he can live hesychistically. When someone is regarded as important, he is judged strictly by the other monks, and he too is careful not to lose the good opinion that others have of him. So he's not free. When I was on the holy mountain and the young monks misbehaved, the older monks used to say, whatever next, now we say, it could be worse. Psychological love is different from platonic love, eros, and divine love, eros, is different again. Some people interpret St. Ignatius' phrase, my love and eros is crucified, wrongly because they mix it up with human eros. However, those who criticize them also make mistakes. Nothing good comes of criticism. If we want to say something, we ought to look closely at what exactly the other person meant, what he wanted to say. It is better to write positively. We should correct the other person's mistake in a positive way. In general, we, sh we should say that eros, intense longing, is the fruit of knowing Christ through theoria of the divine light. In other words, man knows Christ through theoria and loves him. It follows that eros for Christ is of a different kind. I have been through a lot in my life. The things that I write in the book were first written by God in my heart. The Holy Spirit acts secretly in man's heart. 
He does not want any kind of compulsion or obligation. He does not want to burden us with our gratitude. Often he does not show himself clearly because in the natural state in which we live, after having been deluded, even the light fragrance of gratitude compels and obliges the other person. We should read patristic books in a simple way so that the prayer develops without attempting to understand them or remember them. Then our heart will grasp the meaning of what the fathers say and it will become life. I have not read many contemporary theological books I did read a little in Paris. I suffered much pain. Only much later did I realize that everything that had happened to me, the remembrance of death, fear, repentance, and mourning, was a preparation so that I would grasp Starat Silouan's word. Christ said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15, 24, because at that time they were ignorant of Christ's universality were unable to understand him. Divine grace brings man to new birth. It even changes his voice and makes it better for communicating the truth. Regenerated human beings pass on the empirical truth in the appropriate voice. In someone who has been born again, anger becomes strength and impetus. Repentance is expressed in the initial stage by abstaining from passions and not satisfying them, later on as unrestrained reaching up to God. The noose is pure when it cleaves to God. Then we pay no attention to temptations. It is like what happens with cat, with cars and dogs. When we pass a dog, it keeps barking, grows tired, and stops. Thus, in temptations, our noose ought to be fixed on God and not think of anything else. This is how temptations are dealt with. The proud man is turned in on himself. When he comes out of himself, he is distorted and is capable of going as far as committing a crime. The spiritual birth of a human being resonates loudly throughout the world, like an aeroplane when it breaks the sound barrier. Love for God creates holy audacity. Fear of God is a charisma. It is not the work of man. For decades I prayed like Christ's prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. It is terribly painful to pray with tears for the whole world and to be aware that other people are not interested in their own salvation. At one time my chest hurt from the heartbeats. My heart was melting like wax. However, when the doctor did an electrocardiogram, he told me, you have the heart of a small child. Sometimes my heart beats very strongly as though it were going to break without suffering any harm. Psychological fear is different from spiritual fear. Psychological fear leads to despair and paralyzes man. Spiritual fear inspires man unto death. The fear of God is not like the animal instinct. For quarter of a century I wept on the holy mountain for my sins and for the whole world. Someone dreadful, something dreadful happens in the Christian life. Sometimes God seems not to be satisfied by man's struggle, as though he did not hear his cry. This is how self-emptying is experienced. There were times when I lost prayer and was unable to even pray with my lips. If they despise us and persecute us, we ought not to speak at all, but to be silent. We should not even make excuses, because an excuse prompts a new accusation. Silence heals. Those who have the grace of God within them usually weep and repel people. This state, however, is natural for the saints. The history of the church, which is written by the saints, sets out the course of the spiritual life. In broad outline, it develops in the following way. We attempt to keep God's commandments, and we see the passions killing us and preventing us from keeping them. This causes unbearable pain. This pain increases when it is linked with abandonment by God. We suffer in both soul and body. Then we experience Adam's fall, and repentance begins, which opens up our depths more clearly. Purification of the heart begins with profound mourning. Then we receive new energy and reach theoria of the light. Thus, when we become nothing, dust, we become the material for our new creation. 
When they praise other people, we ought to rejoice. Zosimas, Father Zacharias, has taken my own words, my own teaching. It does not matter who is glorified here on earth, but who will be glorified in heaven. When there is a lot of love, a little hatred destroys it completely. When, however, there is a lot of hatred, and subsequently there is a little love, the hatred is not reduced. A monk wanted to work under obedience outside the monastery and thought that perhaps his absence would cause a problem in the monastery. I told him, we are not saying that we don't want you, but we can also do without you. In the beginning, karate can appear to be good as a form of gymnastics, but ultimately it takes man's noose outside orthodox asceticism and theology. It depends on the ideology with which it is linked. If people tell you that they cannot sleep, then tell them to pray and they will sleep. Many people, when they are in the first period of grace, the first love, want to sell their property and their homes, leave their work, and live in poverty. But we must be careful and lead them with discretion. We should leave people free and not restrict them. In particular, we should not exploit their emotions, especially their sense of gratitude. Many passages in Holy Scripture speak about man's right and left hand. The right hand is the heart. The left is the reason. The proud thought, the left hand, drives grace away from the heart, the right hand. That is to say, the left hand reason attempts to analyze the knowledge of God that the heart experiences. In particular, it tries to articulate it in order to help those making their confession. But then the light is lost for a long time. This is why Christ said, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Matthew 6, 3. Childbearing is a serious issue. It is the bishop's task to guide people. Or, as Patriarch Athenagoras used to say, we should leave it to priests who exercise the pastoral ministry, because people nowadays cannot practice complete abstinence. But neither can they cope with a lot of children. The concern of the pastoral ministry is to cure people. This ministry involves the cross. Bulgakov used to say that in some way unknown to us, God asks the human being before he is born whether he wants to be born. There are some elements of truth in this theory because many children today, for various reasons, do not want to be born, and there are miscarriages. It is difficult to live in the human race today. For many years I have prayed for the whole world and its peace, but there is no peace. And when someone speaks about peace, he is regarded as a communist. I do not read newspapers to see what is happening because nothing right happens. Everything outside Christ is absurdity. There is a difference between psychological psychology and life in Christ. Psychology attempts to deliver man from guilt complexes, whereas in life in Christ we experience grief, pain, on account of being far from God, and we do not stop repenting until this grief is transformed. The second discussion that year took place while we were walking along. I met the elder and Father Kiro. The elder was holding two walking sticks, and as he was in the middle and had us on his right and his left, he gave us each a stick so that the three of us would present a balanced appearance. He was a painter and observed everything. He also loved aesthetics. As I have referred to his artistic ability, I ought to mention that he himself supervised icon painting at the monastery in detail, even the shade of the colors. Also, he designed the carpet that was to go into the church and arranged for nuns and various ladies to make it. He was very attentive to priestly vestments. He wanted them to be clean, bright, and without glittering scenes. He himself took care of the purchase of the material and the sewing of the vestments. He did not like anything shoddy or garish. As we were walking along the road, we saw some children playing with a ball. The elder recalled with much laughter, because I loved football when I was little, my father used to say, I have two boys and a footballer. In the discussion, he said, among other things, the following. 
The view that man was created for the God-man, Theanthropos, can lead to some negative conclusions, namely to the idea of man's great worth and making a god of him, since man was the reason for the God-man to be. The cross is the self-sacrificing love of God, who was crucified of his own volition. For that reason, self-sacrificing love is called a sign like the sign of Jonah. We live Christ's cross by practicing his commandments. When we are spiritually stretched, we are crucified. This happens through repentance. After theoria of God, someone is, in, is different from what he was before. The same happens to someone who meets a saint. His entire life changes. The whole of the West was influenced by St. Augustine. Augustinian theory is rather psychological. It deals with God psychologically. In Greece, today, there is a noticeable trend towards psychology, which is why St. Augustine is studied so much. St. Augustine may be a saint, but his work was subject to exploitation. People in the West lost their inspiration for God. Thus, science developed. When someone returns to God after an intensely pleasure-loving life of fleshly indulgence, and he wants to take Holy Communion frequently, before his body has been transformed, his body reacts as though it did not accept the energies of Holy Communion. Thus, physical illnesses are caused. Discerning guidance is necessary. Unceasing prayer is activated at the beginning of the spiritual life. Although someone prays, there may not yet be dispassion. It is only in theoria of God that everything changes and the whole man is born again. Worldly sorrow is a substitute for repentance. We must take up Christ's cross voluntarily, of our own free will. Otherwise, we will carry other crosses against our will involuntarily. Erotic love captivates man very powerfully. In the beginning, the solution is to escape, then to turn to God. Bodily purity is preserved when the noose is kept clean and when the relationship with the spiritual father is as it should be. We wage the spiritual struggle, not because the kingdom of God can be bought for a price, but in order to keep Christ's commandments so that our will may be tested and the virtues may become our inalienable possession, so that we may remain forever. Someone may reach the first stage of dispassion, but be subject to fluctuations and sudden changes. Stability will come later. At the beginning, God gives us a perception of the spiritual life and many years must pass for us to assimilate it. Apart from other reasons, we fast with the idea that we are created in God's image, but have been distorted by sin. And now we want to become images of God. Animals do not fast because they do not have a rational hypostasis and freedom, but only nature. Thus, fasting is a privilege. Someone who is accustomed to telling lies does not trust anyone. Later, he reaches the point of not even trusting God. And then he loses his faith. One must free oneself from inner psychological sorrows in order to work spiritually. It is preferable for us to free ourselves of those who regard us as a source of temptation. Today, many people pray with their imagination. We ought to pray when we eat. All foods have God's creative energy in them. With prayer, we multiply the material nourishment so that it will help us. Food gives the body energy. We need it in order to work and also to have strength to pray. In those who pray, the energy from food is converted into spiritual energy. In people who do not pray much, the excess energy from food is converted into passion and greed. In that case, fasting is necessary. Usually, when priests hear other priests' confessions, they do not give them advice. They simply read the prayer and nothing more. Those who present the work of Dostoevsky as the highest criterion of orthodoxy do great harm. Dostoevsky had a great mind. He reached the point of mourning, and so he grasped certain profound concepts. But he was unable to free himself from certain passions, drinking, and so on. He is a great writer who comes near to the truths of the church, but he is not its spokesman. In conclusion, 
from 1983. In all his discussions, Father Sofroni usually took as his starting point his, the his theory about the person, hypostases. He would move on to noetic prayer and other issues connected with the spiritual struggle, and he would deal with many contemporary issues. His words were revel revelatory and theolog theological, and issued like rivers of living water from his heart. They flowed without ceasing. I followed the stream of words with close attention in silence. And when the spiritual torrent came to an end, I would go to the cell and write down the revelational words of eternal life. 1984. In January 1984, my ever-memorable elder, Metropolitan Kalinikos of Edessa, Pella and Amphalopi, was taken ill and I had to accompany him to London for an operation on his brain. The operation was not successful and it left him semi-paralyzed. It was the first time I had visited London in winter. It was very cold and there was freezing fog. It made a particular impression on me that the fog froze on the trees and looked like fine snow or frost. I stayed in London with Metropolitan Kalinikos, who was in St. Bartholomew's Hospital for almost a month. At weekends, I went to the monastery to church to renew my strength. The elder and the fathers of the monastery supported me with great love. The elder himself actually came to the hospital to see my metropolitan and told him, we love you because you love monks. The ever memorable Kalinikos replied, I don't do anything special. I love myself as I too am a monk. Metropolitan Kalinikos of blessed memory passed away on the 7th of August of that year. And I did not, of course, visit the monastery that summer. In October, there were elections for the post of Metropolitan in the metropolis of Edessa, and with the arrival of a new Metropolitan, many things changed in my ecclesiastical life. Thus, my customary visit took place in 1985. 1985. Every year was important as far as my visit to the monastery was concerned. It was impossible for anyone to visit even for a few hours and especially to meet the elder, without benefiting spiritually. Someone told me that he had heard Elder Porfirio saying, It is a blessing for someone to see Father Sofroni even for a few minutes, because he has great power. Elder Porfirio understood how powerful Father Sofroni's prayer was, because this prayer issued from a heart set on fire by the experience of profoundest repentance, impetus toward God, and the illumination of divine light. Father Sofroni himself taught that one must first live the fire of hell, which is God's uncreated purifying energy, and then, at a certain moment of deep repentance, this fire of hell changes into the uncreated light of the kingdom of God, which is God's uncreated deifying energy. This vision activates the hypostatic principle and contributes to man's regeneration. Particularly that year, I gained great benefit, on the one hand because I was in need of following the death of my elder, and on the other hand because I had been deprived of the monastery the previous year on account of that event. The father showed me particular love, but I also found the opportunity for more discussion. As the reader will see, that summer I had four conversations with Father Sofroni. As soon as he saw me, he said, I am pleased that you did not become Bishop of Edessa, because you would have been tied down. Elections had been held in the metropolis of Edessa, and I had come second out of the three candidates in the second round. The elder had a very great respect for the grace of the episcopate, but he was also aware of the difficulties and temptations. To be sure, at another meeting he told me, the new metropolitan took your place. That place was yours. He also repeated this to other people who passed it on to me. I did not ask for explanations, however, nor did I ever take any interest in that subject. At our first meeting, he said, among other things, In our time, the teaching of three fathers, St. Gregory Palamas, St. Maximus the Confessor, and St. Simeon the New Theologian is needed more than ever before. Reading Holy Scripture purifies the noose. 
The Apostle Paul, who experienced profound repentance, writes of Christ, Now this he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lowest parts of the earth? Ephesians 4, 9. For us the words, he descended into the lowest parts of the earth, is profound mourning, the descent into the hell of repentance. Although all the apostles and fathers have the same revelation and experience, they do not express themselves in the same way. For example, the Apostle Peter was not so rich in conceptual images as St. John the Evangelist or the Apostle Paul. Divine grace does not abolish people's particular gifts. When a priest commits a carnal sin, his priesthood is deafened. That is to say, his priesthood is not active. He celebrates the mysteries, but he himself does not benefit. One must keep hold of the priesthood because it would be awful if something happened and one lost it. If someone does something bad, the priesthood has no power. We realize this from the fact that he is unable then to help people. Then in some way, the priesthood is deafened. In other words, he cannot hear people and help them. Pride and vainglory produce a rebellion of the flesh. In the addresses that we give at monastic professions, we should not refer to the subjects of brides, bridegrooms, and divine eros because these spiritual concepts become distorted in some way, especially in women. Some spiritual fathers retain their spiritual children through their psychological power, their reason, and their spiritual gifts, but they leave their spiritual problems unsolved and do not help them. Spiritual fathers who have inner spiritual priesthood, that is to say the grace of God, give their spiritual children effective help so they can deal with their spiritual problems. From the social point of view, we ought to feel that we are spiritual orphans because we do not belong in this society and our homeland is elsewhere and here we are orphans. At our second meeting, he began in a friendly way to create a pleasant atmosphere. He told me, there is only one Herotheus. Your pen is strong and swift. My first books had been published then. Also, sermons had been published in the periodical Voice of the Lord, as well as some articles in ecclesiastical journals. The elder perceived that we had the same spirit as regard theology and asceticism, so he said with very great humility, The two of us have closely related ideas, but you write more richly and more vividly. He was courteous and noble, and he always found a way to lavish excessive praise on the one to whom he was speaking. I have recorded his words for that reason. In discussion, some of the things he said were as follows. I once wrote about the unity of the church according to the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. When Evdokimov read it, he said, what does he know about the Holy Trinity as he's not married? It is absurd for people to think or to link knowledge of the persons of the Holy Trinity with knowledge of human relations within marriage. Theoria means having the flame of God. Westerners agree with the Muslims on the subject of God's essence. They regard it as impersonal. Many people are mistaken about the so-called darkness of God. They think that the darkness is ignorance of God, whereas it is knowledge that transcends human knowledge. It is light that transcends the light of the mind and the light of human knowledge. We Orthodox live Christ in the Divine Liturgy, or rather Christ lives within us during the Divine Liturgy. The Divine Liturgy is God's work. We say, it is time for the Lord to act. Apart from anything else, this means that it is the moment for God to take action. Christ celebrates the Liturgy. We live together with Christ. The Divine Liturgy is the way in which we know God and the way in which God is made known to us. Christ celebrated the divine liturgy once, and it passed into eternity. His deified human nature passed into the divine liturgy. In the divine liturgy, we know Christ specifically. The divine liturgy that we celebrate is the same divine liturgy that Christ performed on Monday, Thursday at the Last Supper. Chapters 14 to 17 of St. John's Gospel are a divine liturgy. Thus, we understand Holy Scripture in the Divine Liturgy. The first church lived without the New Testament, but not without the Divine Liturgy. The first forms of words, the hymns and scriptures, are in the Divine Liturgy. In the Divine Liturgy, we live Christ and understand His Word. Just as Christ purified His disciples through His Word and said to them, 
You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. John 15.3 And he washed the disciples' feet with water at the sacred washing of feet. So too the first part of the divine liturgy purifies us so that we can then sit at the table of love. The aim of the divine liturgy is to impart Christ to us. The divine liturgy teaches us an ethos, the ethos of humility. Just as Christ sacrificed himself, so we ought to sacrifice ourselves. The divine liturgy typifies the one who became poor for our sake. In the divine liturgy, we try to humble ourselves because we sense that God, who is humble, is there. Every divine liturgy is theophany. The body of Christ is revealed. Every member of the church is an image of the kingdom of God. After the divine liturgy, we must continue to portray the kingdom of God by keeping his commandments. The glory of Christ is for every member to bear his fruit. This is not the explanation for his words. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. John 15, 8. God gives many charismas. Even simple ascetics can cure people in many ways, such as through prayer. But when God gives a special gift, he also gives discernment at the same time so that we will not under, undervalue the spiritual gifts of others, particularly the charisma of priesthood. Many people want to take Holy Communion, but they do not know how they can also benefit from the spirit of the divine liturgy because this too has much to offer. Many are displeased because their spiritual father has deprived them for a time of Holy Communion, whereas in this case they ought to benefit spiritually from the spirit of the divine liturgy. In order for someone to partake of the most pure mysteries, his noose must be at peace and free. He must be completely at liberty. Someone can face illness when his soul is at peace. For someone to find out what noetic prayer is, he must become acquainted with it before the age of 30 or 35, because after that, other problems begin, and it is not easy for him to engage in noetic prayer. I saw Birdiev on Easter day, Pascha, singing with the choir like a little child. Later, I saw him on the train, concentrating deeply on his thoughts, shaking his head to grasp ideas. I realized that those whose work who work with their brain have inconsistency in their life. What they think is different from how they live. There is a split between their mind and their heart. First one receives God's grace, then grace withdraws, and one passes through God's chastening. However, everyone has to go through this training, because even if one were to receive grace without the appropriate training, it could go wrong and contribute to his condemnation. One must pass through humility. Without freedom, it is impossible for someone to keep a spiritual gift or for his spiritual life to develop. A monk ought not to give many explanations. He should say little and not start up long conversations for no reason. The whole of contemporary life seems to go with the tide. Everyone is carried along in the same direction by force of circumstances. The monk is called to go against the tide. Monks sense that they are weak. And they are also looking for many things. For that reason, they want constant supervision. In the world, we are always finding out new things. In the monastery, repetition is the mother of learning. We pray with all our heart for your monastery. Spiritual guidance demands great patience. We ought not usually to talk to married people about the value of monasticism, because then they will become confused and do not esteem marriage. We should teach them that marriage is a way to salvation when one lives in accordance with the gospel. We should not have high expectations of those who make their confession. At first, they tell us a few things about themselves. We should confine ourselves to what they say. Later on, they will open up and say more. It takes a long time for people to open up. Someone who has a clear vision of everything is clear-sighted. As a consequence, if a spiritual father does not have clear vision, how can he help those who make their confession? Someone should not stop at the prayer of absolution. He should open his heart and understand inwardly that God has forgiven him. Women are very demanding. Their spiritual father must have great discernment and patience in order to direct them. Married women ought to be very attentive to their husbands. 
They should be at home and take an interest in them and in their children. We live in an age when no one can speak against wars because he is regarded as a communist. At our third meeting, he referred to his favorite topics connected with the empirical knowledge of God. Among other things, he said, knowledge of God is empirical. It is similar to what happens in the theoretical sciences. First, there is the theory, and then there is confirmation. The opposite also happens. In the church, we have the theory that God revealed to the prophets, apostles, fathers, and saints. Subsequently, we say, let me see whether it is true, and we begin to follow the same path. We pray, and thus we sense the grace of God and confirm what the fathers say. In the West, people read a lot and also turn to Eastern religions, and now some practice the Jesus Prayer because they want to inquire empirical theology. God does not promise joy, but a cup. He calls us to suffer for his name, because thus we shall also experience his glory. God is hypostasis, one essence, three hypostases. It is the same with man. He is potentially a hypostasis, indestructible, but he also needs life. This comes about in Christ. When man is united with Christ, the hypostatic principle is activated, and he becomes an actual person, an actual hypostasis. The hypostasis is unique and not transferable. God predestined those whom he knew beforehand would accept his call and his gifts of grace with gratitude and thanksgiving. Christ's self-emptying is presented most eloquently in the 12th chapter of the Apostle Paul's Epistle to the Hebrews. The expression uncreated light that the fathers and St. Gregory Palamas used provokes some people nowadays. We can use the expression divine light, which means the same. There is a pre-eternal self-emptying of God the Father as he begets the Word, and a self-emptying in time through the incarnation of the Word. Christ's kenosis, his self-emptying, and his total abandonment to his Father freed man from death. Something comparable happens to us too. Our total abandonment to God and our total self-emptying, which is linked with the formation of Christ, leads us to deification. Christ underwent sufferings because he kept his Father's commandments and so came into conflict with the world. The same must happen to the one who is called by Christ to live his life. The theory that some theologians expound is disproportionate to their spiritual experience. They develop high-flown theories without possessing corresponding experience. This creates a psychological problem for them. Deification means that in every situation in our life we react as Christ reacted. If we want to begin a conversation with God, as soon as our noose turns to God, he will immediately give us a spiritual concept. There is a difference between Buddhism and Orthodox asceticism. In Buddhism, they try through divestment to reach nirvana. They convert contemplation into mystic theoria. They see the created light of their mind. This happened even more in Plotinus and Neoplatonism. The fathers knew about this, and we can call it the darkness of divesture. But they go beyond this and reach theoria of the uncreated light. Then they experience that the light comes from a person and not from an idea. They are aware of a personal relationship with God, and at the same time a great love for God and the whole world develops to the point of martyrdom and self-hatred. People who become orthodox through philosophical reflection or aesthetics in moments of intense concentration elevate this reflection into mystical theory. They see the light of their mind and fall in love with it and themselves. This light is neither devilish nor divine. When they take it for divine, it becomes demonic. As St. James, the Lord's brother, says, quote, This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. James 3.15 When one makes a god of earthly, non-spiritual wisdom, it becomes demonic. It is only when someone sees the divine light that he sees the difference between the natural light of the mind, devilish light, and the uncreated light. In the desert, my noose was caught up in rapture on many occasions. 
On account of repentance, however, I did not want to recall these times to mind. In the desert I did not think of anything. I simply repented of my fall, of having sought perfection in Eastern mysticism, outside Christ. When, however, I became a spiritual father, I wanted to help people who had experienced something similar and were asking for confirmation of their spiritual state. Then I tried to see what was happening in me without saying anything to others. This often had consequences for me. On the holy mountain I lived repentance to the point of madness. I knew eternity negatively at first, from the experience of eternal damnation. God's revelation to St. Siloan, keep your mind in hell and despair not, means condemning oneself to hell, hating oneself completely. Then one feels the flames of hell piercing one's body like needles. Later, when one sees the uncreated light, one changes completely. No one can see the divine light and stay the same as he was before. In In any event, anyone who sees the divine light understands what eternal damnation is. Dogmas are essential for the spiritual life. Without them, the spiritual life is distorted. So we are not fanatical when we stay with the dogmas, the dogmatic statements of the fathers of the ecumenical councils. When we meet someone against whom we are prejudiced, we change direction. And when we meet someone whom we like, we run up to him. It is the same with dogmas. We have an aim and we run to achieve it. If we lose the aim, we have no strength to run. When someone keeps Christ's commandments, he is not only obedient, but he is united with Christ and acquires the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit is called the Comforter because he consoles those who suffer pain on account of sin and who repent. The Christian life is a magnificent path. For that reason, no one sets out on the path on his own. He needs helpers. Thus, the All-Holy Virgin was sent to Elizabeth, and the Apostle Paul went to the other apostles in Jerusalem so as to receive confirmation. The fourth meeting took place as we walked along the lane outside the monastery. The subject of the discussion revolved around psychology in relation to the spiritual life. The elder had profound knowledge of the spiritual life because he had attained to theoria of the uncreated light, and he could distinguish between psychological and spiritual things. He often used to say that real repentance is of a spiritual, not psychological nature. It is an energy of God. Throughout the years he had lived in the Western world, he had confessed and direct many people who had psychological problems or were being treated for such problems. He was therefore extremely familiar with the subject. The points recorded below are indicative of his views. The study of psychology in Greece started with the Christian brotherhoods. In the past, psychological views were a major force and used to influence people. Now, as far as I can see, their influence on people has been reduced to some extent. The dissemination of the tradition of the Holy Mountain helped to bring this about, together with the niptic teaching of the Church, which changed people's noose. The observations of psychology with regard to human beings are significant because they explain that beyond the rational faculty, there is something more profound. Psychological analyses, however, are infantile compared with the teachings of the fathers of the church. Although the observations of psychology are significant, the therapeutic method that it offers is awful. Psychoanalysis does not cure man, rather it confuses him even more. We ought to make a distinction between neurology and psychology. Neurologists contribute greatly to physical health because they administer certain drugs that restore man's social balance. But even they do not cure. They simply sedate man's energy. Curing man begins with curing thoughts. Physical change comes about through curing thoughts. Although it is true that neurologists restore man's equilibrium equilibrium through drugs, they do not cure him. There's a great difference between the Orthodox and Western traditions. Psychology is adjusted to the Western tradition, so it differs enormously from the Orthodox tradition. The view that everything psychologically is also spiritual, and everything spiritual is also psychological, is deadly danger. It is very dangerous for us to regard people's psychological problems as spiritual states. 
Such a view is blasphemy against God. The exact ought, opposite ought to happen. That is to say, we ought to make a distinction between spiritual life and psychological life. In all our years at the monastery here in England, I have never met anyone who was cured through psychoanalysis, although it is highly developed in Western societies. However, to be fair, neurologists and doctors who give drugs to patients are more humble than psychoanalysts, and they help people to become socially balanced. They also help those within the church when they have problems of a neurological nature for various reasons. The spiritual problem, namely, that man is far away from God, also has consequences for the body. Man's soul easily orientates itself to a new direction through repentance, but his body, if it has suffered harm, is slow to adjust to the new state. Christ's words apply here. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. In this section, sit in this situation, the body, which has been tormented by sins, may be helped by drugs, but the final cure will come from the soul's good health by the grace of God. St. Gregory Palamas lived in a crucial period when the seeds of psychology and psychoanalysis were already in existence, and it is important for us to study his theology. Orthodox Hezekiah is the unerring method for curing man. Unfortunately, those who confuse the spiritual life with psychoanalysis hold important positions within society, and their opinion is heeded more. In someone who is psychologically ill, it is not simply his so-called subconscious that is sick, but his noose, which is the eye of the soul. When we pursue the spiritual life, we do not need psychoanalysis. Neurology helps with hereditary problems. The psychology of psychiatrists has another perception, clearly different from orthodox teaching. Their anthropology is different. In any case, discussion about the relationship between psychology and orthodox theology will be beneficial. In conclusion, for 1985, that year I gained particular benefit from the elder with regard to three issues. The value and depth of the divine liturgy, his teaching concerning Buddhism and the Eastern traditions, and the relationship between psychology and the spiritual life. These three subjects were, of course, interspersed with the elder's theory about the person hypostasis and exposition of his personal concerns. All these issues helped me in my pastoral ministry. On one occasion, I left the monastery loaded with gifts, spiritual concepts, which came from someone who had struggled hard in his life to acquire experience of them. The elder was accounted worthy of unusual gifts from God, such as the revelation of I am that I am, mindfulness of death, walking the tightrope over the abyss, swinging above the fire of hell, the sense of the createdness as a fall, and so on. Not only did he live through ex exceptional experiences, he also expressed them in unique and simple speech. I left the monastery intoxicated spiritually. As time passed, I entered more deeply into the elder's teaching and he revealed to me more secret paths in the spiritual struggle, sacred Hezekiah and Orthodox theology. However, as the Holy Fathers teach, after a great gift, temptations follow. This happened with the disciples. After Mount Tabor came the trial of Christ's passion and cross, and after Pentecost they suffered persecutions and temptations. When the sun appears, the shadow follows. More or less the same happened in my case too. No sooner had I returned to Edessa than the new metropolitan forbade me, on a trivial pretext, to celebrate the divine liturgy at the monastery of the Holy Cross in Edessa, where I served as spiritual father. Father Sofroni heard what had happened and telephoned me. At first he gave me strength to bear this temptation, and subsequently he tried to urge me to satisfy my earlier longing to go into the desert of the Holy Mountain and engage in sacred Hezekiah. His basic reason was, of course, to prevent me coming into conflict with the Metropolitan, because that would have caused me great spiritual harm, and to enable me to keep my spiritual freedom. The Elder had a profoundly ecclesiastical mentality and patristic consciousness. I asked the Metropolitan for leave, and I went to the Holy Mountain in order to make the relevant decision. I stayed there for more than a month, 
from the end of July until the beginning of September 1985 at the monastery of Stavron Akita, in prayer in Hezekiah, enjoying the kindness of the fathers of the monastery. I committed the matter to God and the Lady Theotokos, and I repeatedly discussed the issue with Father Paisios. Father Paisios agreed with Father Sofroni, but since he saw that the nuns at the monastery would find themselves in a difficult situation, he urged me to make one last effort to stay in Edessa and to do what the Metropolitan wanted, and in the end God would reveal his will. The time I spent then on the Holy Mountain as a brother of the monastery of Stavron Okita was very significant. I prayed and I calmed down. The idea of writing the book Orthodox Psychotherapy was born there, and I began to write it after my return to Edessa in the spirit of the teaching of Father Sofroni in the atmosphere of the Holy Mountain. After a year, however, I ascertained that it was impossible for me to remain in Edessa, and I left, as did the sisters of the monastery later on. Apart from Father Sofroni's advice, I also had the commandment given to me by my ever-memorable elder, Metropolitan Kalinikos of Edessa, Pella, and Amphilopia, before he died, quote, if the new Metropolitan does not want you, ask his blessing and leave. Never quarrel with a Metropolitan, as you will not have God's blessing. I've written all this to show that Father Sofroni oversaw the course of my life with a noble love. This book is not the place for further details on this subject. All this trouble that I was going through did not allow me to visit the monastery in 1986 and 1987. I went through the trial and testing in the light of what I had been taught over so many years. In this situation, to a greater or lesser extent, I lived through a period of withdrawal of grace after having received so many blessings. Such a time is without doubt more fruitful if one faces it with fortitude, patience, and faith in God. 1988. The beginning of 1987, I left the metropolis of Edessa, Pella, and Almopia. I served at first as diocesan preacher in the metropolis of Thiva and Lavadia, and from August of the same year, I was diocesan preacher in the Archdiocese of Athens. In January 1988, at the decision of the ever-memorable Archbishop Seraphim of Athens, I went to the Balaman Theological College, St. John of Damascus in Tripoli, Lebanon, to teach Greek language initially, and later the course on Orthodox ethics. From Lebanon, I sent a letter to the elder to tell him about my life there. In July 1988, I had the opportunity to visit the monastery of St. John the Baptist, Essex, again, after three years. As soon as the elder saw me, he said, we are grateful that you went to the trouble and expense of coming. I replied, I do it for a return. He answered, you are a good merchant. I said, would that I were a merchant of good things. He said, the fathers tell us to be merchants. Also, as he had recently read an article of mine on Star at Siloan in the Journal of the Holy Synod, the Ecclesiastical Truth, he told me, I liked your article in Ecclesiastical Truth very much. It is very good. And he added, you should write theologically about Star at Siloan. Because my departure from Edessa was connected with the new Metropolitan and the Elder had advised me to go to the Holy Mountain, he found the opportunity to tell me, I have no objection. I thought that you could go into the desert of the Holy Mountain and, and write theologically. But you have chosen another path. I have no objection. I pray that you may become great and preach. He was noble in all his actions. I asked that we should meet, and he arranged for the meeting to take place at five o'clock in the afternoon, as I wrote in my notebook. It is significant that he did not come to the refectory that day, lest he tire himself and not have strength to talk to me. In the afternoon, we talked for about an hour and a half. At the end, he said, glory be to God that we had time and strength to talk. Among other things, he told me, Christ's humility is different from ascetic humility. No saint has spoken about Christ's humility as a characteristic of Christ in the way that St. Siloan did. St. Siloan saw the divine energy of humility at the moment when Christ appeared to him, and then his body was filled with grace. 
Afterwards, however, he lived God's abandonment for the whole of his life. The greater the theoria of God, the greater the pain and grief. There is a difference as regards the meaning of the person, not only between Christians and Muslims, but between Christians, that is to say, between the Orthodox and Protestants. As God is person, the human being is also a person. We can speak of the human person since he is in God's image. The Holy Spirit gives revelation to man when there is pain in his heart. Then one distinguishes the divine from the diabolical. St. Siloan is a universal saint. All regarded him as their own. Patriarch Demetrios, who included Star at Siloan in the church's calendar of saints, is our dearest patriarch. Many people have written letters to congratulate me that Star at Siloan has been numbered in the company of the saints. Everyone who reads his writings is pleased, but if one looks more carefully at Star at Siloan, one is filled with fear. Some people say that Star at Siloan was like all monks, St. Siloan had a great experience that few understand. How do the saints speak is a fundamental question. This is clear from the discussion that Star Siloan had with Stra Straconicos. The saints do not speak psychologically and philosophically, but say what the Holy Spirit gives them to say. Then there are no mistakes. When we speak of ourselves, we make mistakes. St. Siloan used to say that even if God were, were to take someone to paradise every day, he should say, God does this on account of his love and not on account of my virtues. When the heart has tears, it can distinguish whether something is from God or from the devil. Otherwise, we ought to keep God's commandments. God's commandments are an expression of God's life. The words, keep your mind in hell and despair not, are very significant. I have written this exhaustively, but few have understood. It is an experience of the church that many fathers live, but to a different degree. St. Siloan lived it to the highest degree. Having one's noose in hell is the only way to make the passions stop. When one's noose leaves hell, the passions act. This is where the essence of asceticism lies. Few people nowadays are real ascetics. Human psychology uses a different anthropology. It is more or less heretical. It is dangerous. It is bad that it is used by spiritual fathers. To a certain extent, it helps those who have no experience to understand other people, but it does harm. Spiritual things also have psychological repercussions, as can be seen when one looks at the Orthodox and the Latins. But psychological things are not spiritual as well. And in conclusion, from 1988, after the discussion... We went from the old building as far as his bungalow, arm in arm. He told me that in September he would be 92 years old. On the way, he told me something very humorous, and he laughed heartily. However, because he was a great hesychist and a monk who strove hard, he immediately said, we laugh, but we ought to weep. What a monk told me once is typical. On one occasion in the refectory, the elder wanted to laugh at something and he stopped himself. But even when he laughs, his laughter is constructive. Sometimes he laughs because he sees that we are joyful or to lift our spirits when we are downcast. When I left the monastery, he gave me some boxes of chocolates to give to people he knew. And he asked me to pass on his blessings to everyone he knew, saying, give my best wishes to everyone, particularly to the nuns. I am interested in Siloani, Makrina, Fotini, and Afi. Of Sister Siloani, he said, May Siloani resemble Saint Siloan. In any case, she now has the protection of the saint himself. Finally, I asked his blessing, saying, Remember us, Father. He replied, We remember you whether we want to or not. 1991 in 1991, I met the elder for the last time alive at the monastery. He was 95 years old. When I had met him, he was 80 years old, but he was in good physical condition. Now he had aged. He walked with difficulty and used two walking sticks. He fell asleep in the Lord two years later. I asked if we could have our photograph taken. It is a photograph that shows us 
in front of the entrance of the new father's house at the monastery. Then I photographed him on his own, holding two walking sticks. It is a very fine photograph and one of his last. After a meal in the monastery refectory, I found the opportunity to approach him because he always gave us gifts and spiritual desserts, living his life in continuous self-emptying and dividing himself up to satisfy others, he said a few important words to me. Among other things, he said, we live quietly here. There's a lot of hum humidity here. A tree in front of the refectory needs many tons of water on a hot day. That means that there is humidity in the ground. In the same way, through mourning, we ought to put down deep roots in order to reach eternity. This is the essence of the monastic life. As usual, I asked to see him privately. He accepted, and our meeting took place, as I recorded in my personal notebooks on the 16th of July, 1991. First of all, he expressed his joy that I had come to visit him again, and he began the discussion from my book, Person and Freedom, which had already been published. The elder was particularly interested in the person hypostases, because by the revelation of God, he had himself ascertained that God is not an idea, but person hypostases. So he would always read what was written on the subject of the person. He told me, quote, I read your book, Person and Freedom, using three lenses, because I do not read now, but I wanted to read it. You express things well. You and I agree, but the reality of the person transcends philosophical or any other analysis. You are astute. You put the part about philosophy first, that the fathers are not philosophers, and afterwards you went on to the ascetical analysis of the person. He added, you are half my age, and you have written so much. And immediately afterwards, he said for my instruction, there is an antidote that says that a thief and a writer found themselves in hell. There was fire under both of them. At some point, the burning fire under the thief went on, whereas that under the writer increased. The writer asked, why is this? It's unfair. And they told him, it is because the evil that you did with the books you wrote continues in the world, whereas the evil done by the thief does not. Then I asked him, will the same befall me? He answered, no, this does not apply to you. People benefit from what you write and are saved, but you are harmed by the devil's aggression and people's hatred and envy. And he went on, I admire you. You write so many books, one book a year. Where do you find the time? You have a monastery as well. He meant the birth of the Theotokos Monastery in Af Renfrio near Thiva. I told him, I go to the monastery every Saturday. He asked, do the nuns live on their own? I replied, yes, there is Abbas Fotini to take care of them. He said, it's a good monastery. Subsequently, I told him, I am invited to various conferences to give talks, and then I publish them. That's how the books are written. He answered, but even that needs ability. You have a charisma. We should write in a positive way as you do. Feeling uncomfortable, I said, I write a lot of books, but they are all probably nonsense. He replied, no, you do not write nonsense, but you write intermediate theology. He considered exalted theology to be the personal revelation of theoria of God, as we see in his writings. I then asked him about a personal matter. At that time, there was a suggestion that I might be elected Metropolitan of Larissa, although some Christians in Larissa wanted Metropolitan Theologos to come back. He told me the following. I cannot judge. I do not know the situation, nor do I want to get involved. It would be difficult for you as far as prayer is concerned. How would you function in such circumstances? Bishops seldom write theologically. It is preferable for you to write theologically in a cave, like St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, and to benefit the church in that way. If you write two or three good books, it is of great benefit to you and to the church. I rejoice that God gave me the priesthood and defended my monasticism. I am not indifferent to you. After that, he began to expound various subjects to me. Before he began, he said to me in a self-emptying and self-accusatory way, don't pass on whatever absurdities I tell you. I am an old man and I talk nonsense. To conclude 1991, St. Gregory Palamas 
taught us that we partake of the divine energy. Negativism, as taught by some people, does not help us to understand God. When writing the book, I could not say we shall see him as he is, is not, but as he is. It would have been senseless for me to say we shall see him as he is not. Prayer ought to be prayed hypostatically. We do not say personal prayer, but hypostatic prayer. The Holy Fathers discovered the word hypostasis. Westerners are unable to interpret it, and they confuse it with the essence. We should use the term hypostasis more than person, because person can also be understood psychologically. You have found the asceticism of the person. Stay there. Speak about ascetic and niptic theology. Leave the others to write philosophically and psychologically. Polemical theology does not help because we do not know the concepts that other people use. Concepts can be understood according to each one's experience. The name-worshipping monks of the Caucasus knew that divine grace acts in the heart through prayer. However, because they did not know the theology of St. Gregory Palamas, they could not express the fact that this experience is the divine energy. The Hezekiah of the Holy Mountain does not really help someone to write. That is why I left the Holy Mountain, because I had to write about Star at Silouan. You write because there is a pastoral need for you to write. When I was living in a cave on the Holy Mountain and I had a disciple, Father Paul, a partisan came and asked me for money, food and clothes, and that my disciple should carry them. I gave him what I had, but I did not give him my disciple. The disciple is an elder's greatest asset. The greatest asset for the monastery is the person, not money or things. I am sorry about those spiritual fathers who assert that the spiritual life is not enough and that psychology is also necessary. Contemporary monks ought to, to learn not to speak from their mind, their reason, but to say whatever the Holy Spirit gives to their hearts. Praying is the easiest thing. The most difficult thing is to give advice on practical matters. The theological school in Athens is changing its perspective. The theological school in Thessaloniki is better. I see a change of direction now in Athens as well. The Apostle Peter's statement that the earth will be burnt up can be accomplished more easily today with nuclear weapons. We live in ap 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 apocalyptic times. Today, peace is very difficult. The end will come suddenly, but then redemption will also come. We live in the last times. The judgment may happen even now. Remembrance of death immediately brings contrition and dispassion. However, this dispassion fluctuates. It is not perfect dispassion, but even this is something. It is the beginning of spiritual life. When someone is making his way toward God, after his death, after his departure, from the natural state of the body, he will hurtle like a rocket with great impetus toward God. When man reaches up continuously toward God, at his death he will rush with dizzying speed toward God like a rocket. This was our last discussion. As soon as he had finished what he had said to me, he said, I am very pleased that you came. And we left arm in arm in the direction of his bungalow. I asked his blessing and he blessed me, praying inwardly. Two years later, on the 11th of July, 1993, the day I was baptized and became a Christian, he ended his life in peace. I went to the monastery the next day. I reverently and prayerfully kissed his hollowed hand in the coffin, and I took part in the funeral service with intense joy and sorrow. God counted me worthy to know a saint and a great father of the church with extraordinary experiences and amazing gifts of grace. It was a particular blessing to me that such a saint loved me and conversed with me, revealing many mysteries of the kingdom of God. On the day of his funeral service, a monk told me, I rejoice greatly because there is a saint in paradise who knew me and loved me, so he will pray for me. I have a saint whom I know in the company of the saints. That is what I feel too. During the funeral service, I thought about the last words that the elder had said to me the last time I met him before he died, that when man's soul reaches up toward God after it leaves the body, he will hurtle like a rocket with great impetus toward God. 
he will rush with dizzying speed toward God like a rocket. Elder Sophroni was as distinguished throughout his life by this impetus. He lived, as St. Maximus the Confessor says, ever-moving stability and stationary motion. Surely his soul would have moved and will move with dizzying speed toward God. Christ said, The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Matthew eleven twelve. Elder Sophroni strove with great force to take the kingdom of God. Chapter 3, Various Words of the Elder In the file that I had made up from my visits to the monastery of St. John the Baptist in Essex, my meetings with Elder Sophroni, and the various words of his that I have set out above, I also found a separate collection of the Elder's sayings, which did not form part of the discussions that I had had with him on particular dates. These are words that the Elder addressed to me from time to time, or that I had heard him saying to others, or that some of the monks and nuns, that being Father Kiro, Father Raphael, Father Zacharias, Sister Magdalene, mentioned to me as the Elder's words. They really did express the spirit of the Elder. Most of these sayings were passed on to me by Father Zacharias, with whom I had a strong fraternal friendship, which I still maintain. Sometimes we had long discussions. It was he who passed on to me various orders, requests, and wishes from the elder as he was continuously with him. At various times, Father Zacharias would say during our conversations, the elder says on that subject. I recorded these words in a special notebook. In any case, the elder once told me, Zacharias has taken all my teaching. And I was convinced that he was reporting the elder's words accurately. I set out these words to round off this second part of the book, and also so that we can look at Father Sophroni's oral teachings. As follows. The aim of marriage is for the couple to collaborate with God so that they will give birth to sons and daughters of God. Prayer is needed when choosing. In order for them to make a good choice, much prayer is needed that the suitable person may be given for this purpose. When someone marries, he does so in order that his wife may be his helper for salvation. He must show love, and they must struggle for their salvation. Today it is a privilege not to have children. Parents suffer martyrdom. When the children grow up, society takes them. Parents idolize their children. They live their whole lives in them and identify with them. This is a mistake. Through marriage, the husband takes the wife as a helper, so that they may achieve perfection. Children are gifts from God. Often the children bring anxiety and the noose is distracted from God. Nature itself, that is God's creative, life-giving, and providential energy, will bring it about that there are not many children. It will grow weak and it will not be possible for many children to be born. When people marry and God gives children, they should glorify God. If God does not give children, they should be calm and not worry. It is not a matter of giving birth to beings for historical reality, but of giving birth to persons for the reality that transcends history, that they may enter paradise. Many give birth to children who become fodder for hell. Married couples must learn self-emptying, kenosis. They must give away to one another. Then they learn to accept another's existence in their own existence. The upbringing of children begins from the day of the wedding. The couple ought to live with prayer and the fear of God. When a mother prays when she is pregnant, the embryo feels the energy of the prayer. When a child is conceived, the parents ought not to be angry. When it is born, they ought to pray. They should also pray when they have the child in their arms. Whatever the mother does, she should do it with prayer. She should make the sign of the cross over the child when it is asleep and pray for when she breastfeeds it or gives it food. The fact that many children nowadays have unkind instincts is because they were not breastfed by their mothers. When a woman asked whether she should feed her baby with her own milk or with cow's milk, I replied, who gave birth to it, you or the cow? The aim is not simply that the infant should partake of the most pure mysteries, 
but that it should live in an atmosphere of prayer at home. The atmosphere of the home should be one of prayer. The parents ought to inspire the children with their love for Christ and the All-Holy Virgin. When the children are small, they ought to be rules at home, which should gradually give way as the children grow up. Then they are given freedom. We should also give them presents. The children may feel that they live in a rather old-fashioned way when they live life in the church. The important thing, however, is for the children not to become atheists. Atheism is worse even than carnal sin. The aim in bringing up children is that they may acquire personal love for Christ and the All-Holy Virgin. We ought not to advise them simply to become good people. Also, we have to help them in, to stay in the Orthodox Church, not merely to avoid sin. The fact that they stay within Orthodoxy is a great thing and may be the cause of salvation, even if they've made some mistakes in their lives. Children ought to be inspired by love for Christ and for the All-Holy Virgin, our Panagia. Constructive leisure activities are essential for those who live in the world. It is preferable for children to get out of the house rather than to stay at home and watch television. If we want our children to live in modern cities in the same way as we lived in the past, we will drive them mad. These are children who seem all right when they're small, but when they grow up, they lose their reason. It is preferable for children not to partake of the body and blood of Christ rather than to partake under compulsion from their parents without wanting to themselves. If the mother prays during the child's conception, pregnancy, and birth, she gives it spiritual birth as well as physical birth. She gives birth to a spiritual being. There were many atheists in Russia, but the worst atheists were the children of priests. We must make sure that we bring up children in such a way that they do not regard orthodoxy as difficult and burdensome. Parents ought not to neglect their children much on account of services and sermons. Also, many Greek parents in England do not allow their children to go around with English children. This is a bad thing. The child has to learn how to live in a community with different people. The general view on bringing up children is as follows. Care is needed prior to marriage. The choice of a suitable spouse must be made with prayer. The couple ought to begin their life with zeal and with prayer that God may enlighten the children that they be, will be born so that they will become his own children. As they bring up their children, they ought with discretion to give them freedom and allow them to go on their way. We should not use the word forbid, even as regards leisure activities. How they behave in secondary matters is less important than whether they love Christ. So that they may love Christ, we ought not to talk to them psychologically and theologically in stilted language, but to pray inwardly in our heart. When the parents have God's grace within them, the child senses it. There should be open discussions within the home. Also, the atmosphere of prayer ought to prevail, not just an atmosphere of words. We should form our children. And formation, according to the church, means giving form, the form of Christ. It is good for children to have contact and meetings with lots of young people, because in this way they will realize that relationships within, with the opposite sex are not confined to the carnal level, as happens in marriage. In the past, matchmaking was prevalent. Now, personal acquaintance predominates. It is not so important what happens, but whatever happens must be done with prayer. Freedom does not mean do what you like, but do what you like within limits. In other words, we discuss with the children. We do not express surprise and amazement at every bad thing they do. And in some secondary matters, we leave them to do as they like. If a child wants to go to a party, we should tell him or her, pray and do whatever God enlightens you to do. And we should add, I shall not hold it against you if you go to the party after praying. In this way, we develop their sense of responsibility and their relationship with Christ. We teach them to pray to God about everything they do. Freedom plays a major role in bringing up children. We should pray God to give inspiration. God enlightens everyone, especially mothers, and gives them inspiration. This is the only way we can bring up children. Some people speak about marital priesthood and assert that in the married life one lives the threefold dignity of the Lord. 
This is speculative theology. The threefold dignity of the Lord, prophet, king, and high priest, is lived through repentance. Otherwise, all those things that are said are a theology of the passions. In the Old Testament, God made known his will negatively through the law, the Torah, through not and no, thou shalt not kill, and so on. The people were tormented, lost hope because they could not put it into practice, and they cried out, Come, thou Messiah, save us. In this way, the law became a tutor to bring us to Christ. In the Old Testament, childlessness was considered a curse because all women wanted to become mothers and grandmothers of Christ, the Messiah. In the New Testament, things have changed because now we live the Messiah, Christ. God did not create masters and slaves, but sons in relation to a father. All those who become sons of God by grace afterwards also become spiritual fathers of Christians. God glorified the All-Holy Virgin and kept her in silence. The mystery of the Theotokos is a mystery of silence. For that reason, God did not enlighten people to talk about her natural life. However, the church glorified her. A saint's word opens the hearer's noose. And with this word, he can preach a whole sermon. God's revelation is not visions, but the advent of divine grace, which comes in stages. Christ said something once, and this word remains forever. We realize this from the saints as well. They heard a word once, and they kept it for the whole of their lives. In this way, we also comprehend the energy of God's word. For someone to do missionary work in an orthodox way, he has to have the Holy Spirit within him, but he must also assimilate the culture of the place where he is. Then he can make a contribution. No one can bear to live with a saint because the saint's word is fiery. The saint ascends the cross with his whole life. He is crucified. And the one who lives with him cannot bear this life of the cross. There are no writings by female saints. This is not because there are fewer holy women than men. There are more holy women, but female saints lead a hidden life. They are able to keep their life secret. The All-Holy Virgin received great grace from God. We do not have revelations that come from the All-Holy Virgin, but we know that she had great grace. The Church and all who pray to her are aware of it. Also, women did not need to reveal their experiences in order to guide their flock. All those who have left us, a few of their words were abbesses, eurondisses. But male saints, too, would have kept silent, and we would not have their writings, had it not been for them as people with responsibility and shepherds of the church to guide their flocks. God's covenant with human beings is his call to each one. Accepting the call is keeping the covenant. Priests share in Christ's martyritic priesthood. The Pope exercises his authority from a high position. Orthodox priests share in Christ's self-emptying in the martyritic priesthood of Christ who was crucified and went down to Hades. The trials that the saints underwent are greater than our own trials because their hearts were sensitive and everything in their lives took on larger proportions. Christ's cross transcends any human martyrdom because Christ was sinless. We inherit death and we strengthen the power of death throughout our lives with our sins. Christians will always be misunderstood by those around them. We should also respect the freedom of non-believers and atheists and not judge them. Then they too will leave us free to do our work. In Greece, they are prone to gossip and easily take offense. But at the same time, they have intuition and they understand that the other people have good intentions and mean well. This is because Greece is an orthodox country. When someone has a rule from his spiritual father not to take Holy Communion, but he takes Holy Communion because he thirsts for it, then, apart from being disobedient, he does harm to his soul because afterwards he stops thirsting for Holy Communion. If, however, he obeys his spiritual father, he will continue to thirst for Holy Communion. This thirst is beneficial. Just by keeping the word of one's spiritual father, one receives grace from God. When someone has passed through Buddhism, he needs to repent and weep a lot. Otherwise, a certain pride will remain in him as a residue from his previous life. 
carnal sins, fornication, are forgotten through repentance and are easily cured. Psychological and spiritual sins, pride, heresies, experimenting with Buddhism, are not easily cured. It is the same with culture. A monk who spends his time on cultural pursuits shows that he has no experience of repentance. If he had repentance, all his past interests, including culture, would be left behind since the grace of God would be before him. What do the words keep your mind in hell and despair not mean? They mean nothing to us, but Starat Silwan understood them as a great consolation because he was going through the period of God forsakenness. That is why he said, I received the weapon of my salvation. It was like a triumph. Hell means the withdrawal of God's grace. This is God's chastening. For Starat Silwan, the way out was, do not despair. God abandoned the Apostle Peter during the time of trial in order to prepare him for greater grace. He received so much grace from God that even his shadow cured people. The grace of God that comes to the saints is so great that the soul is unable to keep it. For that reason, they should leave the world and the monastery. This happened to St. Seraphim of Serov. When someone who is married does not honor spiritual virginity, purity of heart, and does not exercise it, he does not live well even as a married man, because married life is nourished by this purity of heart. Godly despair is different from worldly despair. Godly despair is linked with profound repentance, abandonment by God. The difference between something psychological and something spiritual is the difference between what is human and what is divine. Everything in the spiritual life is the fruit of human collaboration and divine grace. God arranges sufferings and trials for the proud man so that he might be saved. To someone who is physically strong, he gives an illness to stop him indulging himself. Afflictions crush the heart, and this crushing produces prayer. Man is a microcosm. He repents. He becomes holy. He receives the whole world, and thus a small creation takes place. We are all murderers to varying degrees, when we are emotionally in favor of a state that fights against another state, we too participate spiritually in the killings that take place. Practicing virginity requires obedience. A monk is not protected from various temptations when he lives with his mother and sister, but when he has the blessing of his elder and is obedient to him. The essence of obedience is that someone opens his heart, his hypostases, his personhood and accepts the will of another hypostasis. This enables him to acquire knowledge of all created being. When someone is completely obedient to his elder, his heart opens up and he inherits the elder's riches in a very short time. This is not something psychological, but something that comes about in the spirit. This means that if the disciple receives a grace from God during prayer, his mind immediately turns to his elder and he says that this happened by the prayers of the elder. This is spiritual obedience and love for the elder. Through this process, obedience to the elder deadens the passions. This is the only way to deaden and transform the passions. Often impertinence becomes a burning fire. Simplicity, not impertinence, is needed. The Apostle Paul expounds the charisma of love in his epistle to the Romans better than in the epistle to the Corinthians. The prayer, against thee only do we sin, and thee only do we worship, has great theological significance. We worship God, but we are also unable to live with him. He is a mirror that reveals our ugliness. Thus man grows spiritually both downwards and upwards. Prayer ought to take place in the dogmatic framework of ecclesiology and the gospel. Otherwise, prayer cannot act. And even if it acts, at the time of temptation, it, it departs and is lost. We must be familiar with the whole of God's training. There are many degrees of humility. The first is the recognition of sinfulness. Secondly, man compares himself with the perfect law and sees that he is worse than everyone else. Thirdly, he accepts charismas as 
gifts from God. Fourthly, he sees the humility of Christ. Keeping Christ's commandments is for all Christians. The monastic life is a technical method to help us keep Christ's commandments better. So we do not preach monasticism, but Christianity. I do not like talking about intuition, but about the heart's awareness and inner conviction, which is the working of divine grace. We should not oppose the evil one with words, because opposition increases evil. As Abba Dorothea says, the good swimmer passes under the wave. Someone ought not to humble himself before those who do not humble themselves, because they will perceive it as a weakness and will go on to strangle him. When those who are born again in the Spirit meet someone humble, they humble themselves even more, whereas those who are not born again, when they meet someone humble, take the opportunity to impose themselves on him. Five minutes of prayer when the whole body is in pain are more precious than a whole night of praying with bodily ease. It is preferable to do only a little spiritual work, but with peace in our heart, rather than to attempt a lot and lose our peace of heart. We should prefer to have a little of all the virtues rather than one virtue to perfection, because in this way, one's noose, will, and desire are purified. The soul acts in the whole body, so man needs to be wholly cleansed. We should not only talk about prayer, we should also know how to keep ourselves from hopelessness. Usually people fall as a result of pride or despair. These two are man's greatest enemies. Each one has a particular way of life that is unlike any other. All, however, lead to God and end with him, just as the spokes of a wheel are connected with the hub. Even in spiritual drought, God sends us consolation, as he knows our weaknesses. It would be to our advantage to live our whole life in spiritual dryness, but to struggle. In other words, if we could reach Christ through being utterly abandoned by God, through emptying ourselves completely, as happened with Christ on the cross, then man would also have great glory. We shall have glory depending on how much we empty ourselves and how much pain we endure. Nothing, either spiritual or material, belongs to us but to God. It becomes ours when we offer to God. Through the prayer that we say before the meal, we offer up the material th good things to God, and then they become ours, because God gives them back to us so that we can live. Freedom is not political independence, but that the evil one has no authority over us. Not all the saints received the same grace from God, but all filled the vessel that they offered to God. Sometimes reading patristic writings makes the spiritual life difficult. For instance, a certain Christian has a spiritual experience. If he reads a patristic book, he begins spying on himself, trying to fit himself into the corresponding categories of the spiritual life, according to what he's read. Thus the left hand consumes and destroys whatever the right hand does. Great simplicity is required in the spiritual life. Illiterate old ladies whisper prayers to God and have faces like children, whereas educated people speculate and their faces are troubled and aggressive. Sometimes it is good that agitation arises between the brethren, because on the one hand they escape from despondency, and on the other they become humble. Once someone receives God's grace, the war, the battle begins. He receives great grace and his body must also be transformed. The carnal mentality draws the soul downwards, but at the same time God's grace draws it upwards. This is a difficult moment. Someone can be led astray from the right or from the left. The psychological pain is great, and it can strike him at the weakest point of his body, his heart, or his brain. Then obedience to a discerning yet unto is necessary. Our own will must disappear from within us. One interpretation of the Apostle Paul's words, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Colossians 3.16, is as follows. When we hear or read a word of God, we feel it by grace to be food for our heart. This is spiritual, not intellectual, remembrance of God. Man's formation and transformation means that he takes the form of Christ's servant. The passions of worldly sorrow is a great passion that preoccupies people today. 
Unfortunately, we retain sorrow within us and we caress it until it kills us. One must fight against the passion of sorrow and cure it. One should not listen to one's own thoughts because the devil and the satanic spirit work through thoughts. If someone heeds his own thoughts in trivial matters, the devil will gradually gain power, strength, and domination over him. Then he will cast him into major delusions. If the devil tells him to do something and he obeys later on, he will even tell the man to commit suicide, and he will obey him. A Roman Catholic asked me why, why we Orthodox repeat the Jesus prayer so often. I told him, we repeat it because we are slow on the uptake and do not understand. When, however, we understand something, we never leave it. The angels sinned in eternity, whereas human beings sin in time. Western Christians force themselves to pray, and this creates pressure in the brain. The Orthodox pray with ease, because this prayer takes place with the grace that exists abundantly in the Orthodox Church. Long services usually make inner prayer difficult. After a long vigil star service, Star Siloan said, we killed the donkey, that is the body, but we didn't do anything. Fasting helps spiritual progress less than prayer, particularly inner prayer accompanied by mourning. Fasting a lot without discretion sometimes creates problems in prayer. It is easier for people to keep burning charcoal in their hands than grace in their hearts. They perceive divine grace as a consuming fire. What is needed is humility and self-accusation and for them not to receive divine grace in a festive manner. People in the West are unaware of the mystery of the divine abandonment of God's chastening, which is why they fall into despondency. This mystery of divine abandonment and self-emptying is repeated again and again in the life of Orthodox monks, but they know what this mystery is and how to deal with it. Self-emptying leads to glory if one is able to endure. God's commandments are the manner of divine life. Man cannot keep the commandments of God to the full, so he needs grace. Prayer accomplishes this. Sometimes when someone keeps God's commandments and lives the ethos of the crucified Christ, he senses God's grace without praying, or he prays out of love. The aim is not to pray without ceasing when it is done mechanically and formally. The aim is our communion with God, which is also achieved through prayer. The fathers did not ask for many words. They received one spiritual word, left for the desert, and lived for many years with that word. They attempted to put it into practice, and they were nourished by it. We say, and we want to hear, lots of words, but we do nothing to put them into practice. When someone talks a lot, he becomes spiritually weak. Simple people are moved by the slightest thing, and this gives them energy. However, they may also complain and grumble about the slightest thing, and this exhausts them. Someone who has obedience and love can adapt himself to any situation. Many people have unassailable ignorance. As a layman, I was very sensitive. Someone was contemptuous of Holy Scripture and thumped his hand on the table. I was in pain for two weeks. Afterwards, however, I stopped being sensitive because this energy, too, was transformed. People in the West live with their brain. Their lives are centered on reason. So, if scientists were to invent a machine, they would be able to read people's thoughts and direct them. All those, however, who live with their heart, within which God's grace acts, and who pray in their heart, have the sign of the cross in their heart, and no one is able to control them spiritually. They have freedom of spirit. In the cave of the Holy Trinity near the monastery of St. Paul, I prayed ardently and wept aloud because no one could hear me and I had freedom, whereas in Karulia it was difficult for me because I had neighbors. The 12th chapter of the Apostle Paul's epistle to the Hebrews describes the spiritual fact of God's chastening. Sometimes this chastening from God comes about through the Jesus prayer, sometimes through weeping, and at other times through God forsakenness. God trains man in many ways and offers him more perfect knowledge to prevent him experiencing a fall. 
as did Adam when he was first created. In this way, his progress toward God will be steadier. The following state occurs in those at the start of their spiritual life. Something they say or a sin they commit causes them great agitation. We ought to be slightly contemptuous of these forgivable little everyday falls in order to make some other gains. It is better to be at a low level and peaceful rather than high up and anxious. When the heart is on fire for the Jesus prayer and for various reasons it cannot pray, it is like a dormant volcano. When someone cannot rebut his thoughts, he should at least tell them to his elder. Even then he will benefit. When someone reaches a certain spiritual state and has grace from God, he begins to be taught by God. Then everything instructs him. God sent St. Anthony the Great to the shoemaker to learn self-accusation. Even though St. Anthony had grace and was superior to the shoemaker, which is why we commemorate St. Anthony and not the shoemaker. Also, someone who is spiritual is taught by the whole of nature. When someone who has hidden, unconfessed sins hears a spiritual word, he feels pain somewhere in his body. Divine grace also reveals his state to him in this way, and if he wishes, he can escape from this spiritual misfortune. When someone prays in a particular way and encounters various obstacles, and at some point he is unable to pray in that way, if he has inspiration, another path will open up, another way will be found, and he will acquire greater knowledge of God. When we speak about asceticism in the Orthodox Church, we do not simply mean bodily ascetical practices, although these two are essential, but the soul's resurrection from the passions, love toward God and the quickening of the soul by the Holy Spirit. When Starz Siloan died, I felt like an orphan for one week. Afterwards, I felt differently. When someone prays in his heart, he is given sometimes a word. This word begets other words. Thus his noose is opened and he grasps the meaning of the whole of Holy Scripture. Every word of revelation encompasses the entire meaning of Holy Scripture. When someone begins to live according to Christ, the community rejects him. Then he acquires another community because we Christians also have our own community. We lose nothing even in this world. My greatest trial when I became a monk was that I had to abandon art because I thought that through art I would draw near to the eternal. The eternal, however, is approached through prayer, the renunciation of the wealth of the mind, and above all through theoria of God. The experience gained by living and practicing asceticism in a monastery enables a monk to live in the desert as well. Otherwise, he cannot put the desert to good use. When someone departs for the desert and a thought about something, hurting a brother torments him, this thought will give him no peace. Spiritual virginity even cures lost bodily virginity. Abba Zosimus, who had both bodily and spiritual virginity, bowed down before St. Mary of Egypt, who was a prostitute from an early age. The spiritual virginity that St. Mary of Egypt acquired cured her completely. Spiritual virginity is of great worth, greater worth. Spiritual virginity means keeping Christ's commandments. When one's noose cleaves to God through prayer, everyone, whether married or unmarried, can acquire this spiritual virginity. Monks who do not have spiritual virginity are wretched because they neither have children on the natural level, nor do they transfer existence to paradise. If people have the idea of being saved and they manage it, how will we monks whose aim is to be saved not manage it? For a monastery to make progress, it must have either an elder or pilgrims. Pilgrims help monks to reduce their passions because the monks have to offer them something, to show love and to sacrifice themselves. It is very beneficial when every week one pilgrim is regenerated at the monastery. The Holy Fathers make a distinction between mourning and weeping aloud. Mourning means compunction. Sometimes the one who mourns breaks into loud sobs, which are of a spiritual and charismatic, not psychological nature. This is weeping aloud. In this case, the desert is necessary so that no one will hear him weeping. 
Then the monk is unable to stay in the monastery. Weeping aloud increases tears. The parents of monks realize the benefit of their child's dedication to God at the hour of their death. No one ought to ask for this priesthood, whereas one ought to ask for the monastic schema because monasticism is the search for repentance. When I was a monk at the monastery of St. Pantolaemon, I did not want any thought of ordination to the priesthood or diaconate to enter my mind, nor did I want to suggest that I be ordained. When the abbot suggested ordination to me during the service as they could not put the deacon's stole on me, I moved my arm to help them. Afterwards, this troubled me a lot, in case a desire for ordination had perhaps existed within me and I had expressed itself in this way. Priesthood brings many temptations. When someone goes forward or begins on his own, he cannot overcome them. Martyrdom in the monastic life and in the Christian life in general consists in how one will live through the successive stages of Christ's life. In order for the monastery to function well, it must have a discerning spiritual father or a good tipikon and good organization. Otherwise, it will turn into a gypsy camp. Brian Chananov complains in his autobiography about the severity with which his first elder treated him. In this way, he sapped his strength for prayer. For that reason, the elder ought to take care of his spiritual children in every respect. A monk said, I am very sure about the things I say from the elder's words. We live as though we had nothing in our minds, and when they ask us, we have something to say. Sometimes one becomes spiritually weaker after a talk. This happens when one speaks many times a day with energy and intensity. The Holy Fathers do not usually speak in detail about matters to do with marriage and married couples. When someone lives in repentance, he finds the solution to many problems. When someone has the fear of God, he is enlightened to deal with more specific problems. People will have to answer to God for the word they say to people which is beyond them. We ought to speak when forced to do so. Then we too force God, who cannot be forced, and he gives us a word of freedom. We must respect other people's freedom. Nothing done by force endures in time and eternity. When a spiritual father encounters a response from someone, he loves him because both of them benefit. Therefore, it is not wrong for there to be a special love in the spirit and gratitude between spiritual father and disciple. When we accept, accept the spiritual father as a gift from God, or when, when gratitude and thanks, thankfulness to God for the spiritual father arise in prayer, then we love him in the spirit. When someone wants to change his spiritual father, he must first seek his blessing and so leave in peace. He should never refer anywhere to complaints or things that happened in the past. If he complains and mentions various events, the devil acquires power over him, whereas otherwise the devil's fire goes into the air. In the French Revolution, someone said, Give me a letter from someone and I will cut off his head. In other words, he would find a pretext to put him to death. For that reason, the best we can do in such cases is keep silent. Spiritual fathers have a difficult task because they must continually point out their spiritual child's mistakes. This stirs up a reaction and causes hatred. When we speak about things that we do not know personally and that are beyond us, we place a barrier, a wall in front of us that prevents us from experiencing them. The death of an innocent man imperceptibly changes the whole world for the better because the energy of the innocent man benefits the whole world and cures injustice. We ought not to make vows to God. However, if we make them, we must fulfill them. St. John of Kronstadt was once invited to cure someone who was allegedly paralyzed. It was a trap because they wanted to murder him. When St. John realized the deception, he said, Let it be, Lord, according to thy word. And the allegedly paralyzed man became actually paralyzed. Subsequently, St. John prayed and he became well. When someone pretends to be ill, God allows him to become ill. 
There's only a slight difference between geniuses and madmen. By praying for two weeks and studying patristic texts, intelligent people can write a whole book about prayer and think that they can pray. When someone knows earthly pleasures through art, he feels disappointment and bitterness. This is because one pursues art in order to grasp the eternal, but this cannot be achieved through any human work. The soul knows that eternity is not to be found there, so it feels pain. When someone receives a spiritual gift, he usually attracts other people's envy. Then he feels the need to hide it. So without realizing it, he becomes a fool for Christ's sake. The subject of foolishness for Christ's sake is a very subtle one. Some have understood this task to conceal the riches of their spiritual gifts, and so as not to provoke people's envy. We must turn psychological states into spiritual phenomena, into weeping. There's a method which Christians ought to know. We, we are aware of a trial, of contempt on the part of others, or an unjust attack. Then our heart is embittered by this injustice and produces various thoughts that affect our whole life. Prayer stops at once. The therapeutic method is to leave aside the brother who has wronged us and to begin a conversation with God. We say, my God, it's my fault. I am unworthy to be loved by people. Then repentance and weeping begin, and this cures the negative psychological phenomenon and makes it spiritual. We see this in the life of Christ. The apostle Peter was preventing Christ from going to the cross, but Christ had steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, to Golgotha. His crucifiers were howling, but he had his noose turned toward God's will and praying to his father. He did not engage in a dialogue with people, but with God. In this way, he became healthy. We become healthy and are cured. This is a kind of struggle with God. The Philokalia does not write much about the scientific method of prayer, but it writes a lot about the atmosphere of prayer and about keeping Christ's commandments. Some Westerners only translate those parts of the Philokalia that write about the technical method of prayer, and so they present it as a sort of Christian yoga. This is a mistake. Mindfulness of death, as lived and described by the fathers, is not an external awareness that one day we shall die. Elderly people have this as well, and they mention it often. Rather, it is a charismatic state. It is the consciousness of inner deadness. Man sees that he is inwardly destitute of God's grace and that he has passions. He knows that God is the God of the living, but he is spiritually dead and has lost God. This is what people experience in the West, which is why they say that God is dead. God has not died, but man has died to God. When by grace man sees this inner deadness, he also sees deadness in the whole of creation. He feels that everything is lifeless, dead. He sees death everywhere. This causes profound suffering. He gives himself over to weeping and seeks life, the living God, his resurrection. This is a charisma, a spiritual event that gives birth to prayer. When this gift is absent, we use external things to give us a sense of death, such as pictures of graves and bones and so on. Christianity is so great that one refuses to believe it, as happened after Christ's resurrection, they worshipped him, but some doubted. They did not doubt out of lack of love, nor out of disbelief, but out of a sense of greatness. At the second coming of Christ, the just will be amazed, but the sinners will also be amazed, the former because they did not ex expect to be saved, the latter because they did not expect to be condemned. If mindfulness of death purifies man, how much more does death itself, that is to say the coming of death, when it is accompanied by repentance. All our life long we go through the tribunal, the judgment. The customs houses about which the fathers write are symbols of reality. The fathers understood them as follows. After the fall of man, the soul is nourished by the body. In other words, it finds refreshment and material pleasures. After death, however, these bodily passions that used to divert the soul no longer exist because the soul has left the body and they choke and stifle the soul. These are the customs, houses, and hell. 
Abba Dorotheus says that hell is for someone to be shut up for three days in a room without food, sleep, or prayer. Then he can understand what hell is. When someone acquires mindfulness of death, he understands how senseless it is to acquire and accumulate material possessions. At the second coming, the just will say, When, Lord, did we do this? When did we do that? They will not know what good they have done because they passed through all the dryness of this present life with patience and faith. They put their trust in the words of Holy Scripture. Paradise is the grace of God and His kingdom. God continuously sends His grace and calls us in this life. Those who despise God and drive Him away will see at His second coming what sort of God they drove away and they will be burned up. Those who live in God now will be in raptures then. We have such a rich God who has such great grace, but all the same we live in such poverty. We are upset by the slightest thing. This is a wretched state. We ought to be joyful all the time. Our life should always be a daily surprise. Not a day passes without God giving us a new sense of eternal life. In conclusion, at the beginning of this part of the book, I mentioned the various concerns that I had in the late 60s and early 70s about how theology could be combined with the ascetic life and with ecclesiastical administration and pastoral work as a whole. As I have already noted, in Elder Sophroni, I actually encountered all these three forms of ecclesiastical life in harmony. He was a divinely inspired theologian, a genuine hesychist, and a true father and shepherd. I think that everything recorded above has made this extremely clear. God gave me the great gift of knowing Father Sophroni, but the elder also emptied himself to disclose the wealth of his heart and his entire theology to me. In the simple remembrance of my heart, I retain his whole blessed personality, and I always pray to him and ask for his supplications. I also keep three dedicated dedicated inscriptions that he wrote for me in copies of his books that he gave me. These inscriptions reveal his heart's riches and his theological noose. They also show his artistic gift, which did not abandon him to the end of his life, as well as the steadfastness of his hand. The first dedicatory inscription was written in his book, His Life is Mine, which he gave me at Pascha in 1977. To the very Reverend Archimandrite Herotheus, in testimony to the fraternal bond of love in Christ, Archimandrite Sophroni, Holy Pascha, 1977. And the second dedication was written in his book, We Shall See Him As He Is, which he gave me in June, 1989. To the very Reverend Archimandrite Herotheus, with great respect and most ardent blessings, signed Archimandrite Sophroni. 1989. The third dedicatory inscription was written in the Greek edition of We Shall See Him As He Is, which he gave me in September of 1992, a few months before his death. It should be noted that he was then 96 years old, and the steadiness of his hand is obvious. To our dear brother and co-celebrant, the very Reverend Archimandra Herotheus, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Romans 1.12 Signed, Archimandrite Sophroni, 26 September 1992. Elder Sophroni passed away on the 11th of July, 1993, and I was accounted worthy by God to be present at his funeral service. Afterwards, I wrote about the funeral, but also about some elements of his personality in an article. A few extracts will be cited here. Quote, this new patriarch of divine grace to the new people of God finished speaking, closed his sweetest mouth, which refreshed generations of tormented and distressed human beings, and drawing his feet up into the bed was added to his people. Lying on his simple, austere bed in his very lowly room, he stretched out his feet and was added to his fathers. To his elder, St. Siloan the Athenite, whom he loved so much and glorified throughout his life, and to all his fellow ascetics in general, whose confessions he heard and whom he directed spiritually. 
Elder Sophroni fell asleep in the Lord on the 11th of July of this year, amidst his spiritual children, following a painful illness, and of course, after overcoming death within the limits of his personal life. His funeral service took place on the 14th of July in an atmosphere of joyful sorrow, where tears and rejoicing, pain and consolation were closely linked. I am not like Joseph, but I too fell on my father's face and wept over him and kissed him, while at the same time singing, Christ is risen, the acclamation and hymn of triumph. The funeral service of the ever-memorable elder was truly an initiation into mysteries. One saw a great patriarch in the midst of the spiritual children whom he had brought to new birth. One saw his sacred remains in his simple coffin. The general impression was that his hand, which we venerated, was like amber, his fingers like bright sparkling beads, for it literally shone as through the illumination were coming as though the illumination were coming from within. His fingers were the color of ripe quince, glistening like gold. I can confess that never until now have I seen such sacred remains. I also sensed those near me praying ardently, more in entreaty and supplication than for the repose of his soul. Someone told me that the prayer to the elder ascends to God with great intensity. I am certain that she who said this to me had had many experiences of prayer. The people of God who had been regenerated by his theological word kept vigil beside him for three whole nights. The elder of blessed memory was, moreover, the consolation of all our brethren who are tormented and suffer in a foreign land. His funeral service was contrite and festive. The interment was, interment was carried out on the basis of instructions that he had left, which reveal the ethos of, his holy, of this holy man. He spoke of his wretched soul, and in his profound humility, he advised them to follow the teaching and words of St. Siloan. There was no reference to his own words, nor did he give any counsel of his own. Representatives of all classes and categories of people were gathered together to receive his blessing and his grace, because we believe that he was among the greatest elders of our time. Father Sophroni's death reminded me of the words of the prophet Isaiah, Blessed is he who has seed in Zion and kindred in Jerusalem, Isaiah 31.9. We rejoice exceedingly because we belong to the Orthodox Church, that prolific mother of fair offspring, who bears such children who are a blessing for the whole world. We rejoice because we have kindred in the Jerusalem on high and seed in Zion. The ever-memorable Father Sophroni has been united with his fathers in heaven, with the church triumphant, but he has also left on earth for us his teaching, his writings, his life, and the children to whom he gave new birth. In this case, too, the words of the king and prophet David apply. His seed shall be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Psalms 112 to 2, verse 2. The power of his theological word, which was printed in books but also on hearts of flesh, is most mighty and effective as long as a generation of the upright can be found, people willing to put it into practice. Then it will rebound to spiritual blessing. Father Sophroni says somewhere in his book that charismatic prayer for the whole world is like a flash of lightning that shines everywhere on earth. We could say the same of the elder's own existence. He was a bright presence on the planet earth, shining and radiant with the grace of God that he had within him, because throughout his life he offered up prayer and profound repentance and theoria, we believe that he does the same now, much more so now, as the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I humbly seek his favor and blessing. During his funeral, I vividly recalled the image of the ascent of the prophet Elijah and Elisha's cry, Father, O Father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. Fourth Kings Two, seven. Elder Sophroni of blessed memory, through his being and his word, truly was and is the chariot and horseman of the Israel of grace. For that reason, I bring my simple and humble reflections to a close with the heartfelt cry, Father, O oh Father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen, bless us and the word, the world. I mean... 
Encomium by Metropolitan Herotheus of Nafactos and St. Vlasios for Elder Sophroni the Hesychist and Theologian. Father, give the blessing. Divine wisdom has great power to attract. Thus Solomon the wise says, I loved her and sought her from my youth and desired to take her as a bride for myself, and I became a lover of her beauty. She glorifies her noble birth by living with God, and the master of all loves her, for she is the initiate of the knowledge of God and one who chooses his works. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 2 to 4. This inhypostatic wisdom of God is the Son and Word of God, who was revealed without flesh to the prophets and is revealed in the flesh to the apostles and saints in the last days. The friends of God, down through the ages, became lovers of this wisdom and cherished her, and sought with heart and soul the wisdom that sits by your throne. And although they were weak, short-lived men with little understanding of judgment and laws, having been filled with the Holy Spirit, they longed for the only beloved and sought the ultimately desirable. The theology of the Orthodox Church, which is identified with theoria of the uncreated light and knowledge of the wisdom that proceeds from this, is true wisdom. Theology as empirical knowledge, as the unknowing that is above knowledge, as knowledge that is the type of the age to come, for it takes delight solely in the mind's meditation upon the mystery of, of things to come, to use St. Isaac the Syrian's words, is the fruit of Hezekiah according to God. Thus Hezekiah is the precondition for what is called orthodox empirical theology. According to the great luminary of Caesarea, Hezekiah is the beginning of the soul's purification, whereas according to the saint of the latter, it is the science of thoughts and an unassailable mind. According to St. Gregory of Sinai, the beginning of Hezekiah is attentive waiting upon God, which, from which come illuminative power and vision, theoria, and its final goal is ecstasy and the enraptured flight of the noose to God. According to St. Gregory Palamas, the shepherd of Thessaloniki, Hezekiah is forgetfulness of things below, initiation into things above, the laying aside of conceptual images, for what is better. This godly Hezekiah was greatly loved by those who longed for divine things, who hungered and thirsted for the things of heaven. The lovers of this wisdom thirsted for it like deer running to springs of water, according to the king and prophet David. As the deer longs for the springs of waters, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for the strong and living God. When shall I come and appear before the face of God? Psalm 42, verse 2 to 3. This state of extreme hunger and thirst brings unbearable longing, that is to say, divine eros. This divine love is the spark of divine yearning hidden within us, which is in us by nature. And when it is lacking this, is the most unbearable of all evils, according to St. Basil, the teacher of sacred mysteries. According to the third saint named after theology, Simeon the New Theologian, Hezekiah is an undisturbed state of the noose, the calm of the free and rejoicing soul, the untroubled and unwavering stability of the heart, theory of light, rapture of the noose, pure converse with God, a vigilant eye, noetic prayer, union and oneness with God, and finally deification and painless repose in great ascetic labors. The luminary of Caesarea, the great and truly royal Basil, felt such unendurable yearning in his life and beheld such wondrous beauty that he asks, What is more marvelous than divine beauty? What longing of the soul is as intense and unbearable as the longing given by God to the soul that has been purified of all evil, which says with true sincerity, I am wounded by love. The fruit of this Hezekiah, which by God's grace kindles the longing of divine eros, leads the deified, not to bring about deification, which is inappropriate for human beings as it belongs to God, but to undergo deification, to behold the uncreated light of God, which is invisible to those whose noose and heart are blind, but visible to the deified as far as this is possible for them. Therefore, the great luminary of Caesarea proclaims again, 
The lightning flashes of the divine beauty are completely unutterable and indescribable. Speech cannot express them, nor hearing receive them. This beauty is invisible to bodily eyes and perceptible only to the soul and mind. If ever it shone around the saints, it left in them the sting of unbearable longing. Simeon, the new theologian, having fallen in love with this wisdom, said, quote, Seeing you, I am wounded deeply within my heart. I am unable to look at you, but I cannot bear not to look at you. Your beauty is inaccessible, your form inimitable, your glory incomparable, and who ever beheld you, or who could ever see you completely, you, my God, but I behold you as a sun, and I see you as a star, and I bear you within my breast like a pearl, and I see you also as a burning light within a vessel. End quote. Hence, orthodox theology is based on experience and is not speculative analogy, which only exists in the rational faculty, and is wisdom that does not ascend, descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic, James 3.15. Hence the rivers of the spirit that flow from the changed hearts of the deified. Hence the unadulterated interpretation of Holy Scripture. Hence the unerring guidance of the faithful. Hence the spiritual gifts of healing. Hence the saints who undergo divine things without thought. As St. Gregory Palamas says, Hence the ultimate object of desire is the grace of theology. As St. Diodocus of Photiki says, Truly, total purity is the foundation of theology, according to the saint of the latter, and according to Gregory, the shepherd and theologian of Thessaloniki, there is knowledge about God and his doctrines, a theoria which we call theology. Briefly stated, the lovers of God's wisdom loved and love the wisdom, according to God, that rises them through divine arrows to the height of theoria from which the grace and energy of theology also comes to the worthy. And the oversight of human souls is accomplished by the power of the Spirit through the mysteries in the Church. Many spiritual lovers and exact theologians have been revealed within the Church, who became imitators and friends of God and made many people his friends. Among them is the blessed hero monk, our father Sophroni, the hesychist and theologian. He lived chastely on the holy mountain, although his family came from Tsarist Russia, and he proved to be in Christ a spiritual giant in our days in asceticism and Hezekiah, in profoundest repentance and insatiable prayer, and at the height of orthodox theology truly experiencing in the spirit the way of the Lord, which is the mystery of his inexhaustible self-emptying to the point of descending into Hades, then living the resurrection and his holy ascension, in his mortal flesh. Having first sought God in the impersonal contemplation of Eastern religions, he devoted himself to unrestrainable repentance on account of this lapse. Thus he was accounted worthy of a rare divine revelation of the true God in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of Righteousness perceptible to the noose, who revealed himself in his infinite love. And in return for what he had suffered, he came to know his love and his hypostatic existence. Subsequently, he gave himself over to unrestrainable repentance, which crushed everything, even his bones, as well as to unending and insatiable reaching up to Christ, who can save man from death. This repentance was not of human origin, but came from the All-Holy Spirit and from personal vision and knowledge of the triune God in the person of Jesus Christ. St. Gregory, Bishop of Nyssa, says, the enjoyment of the soul that is united to God is insatiable. The more plentiful it takes its fill of beauty, the more intensely does it abound in longings. Hence the unrestrainable impetus of repentance, which is the continuous regeneration of fallen man. This blessed man experienced with conscious perception and assurance the charismatic state of mindfulness of death. In his search for the insatiable satiety of divine mercy, he left for the holy mountain, abandoning his activities in Paris, his art, and his theological studies, in order to study the mysteries of the spirit in the schools of Athos. At first he lived as a monk in the monastery of St. Pantaleon and learned 
the godly wisdom of the Holy Father Siloan the Athenite, which was akin to his own experience. Later he was led out into the desert, not to be tempted by the devil, but in order to live the mysteries of the Spirit, which had been bestowed upon him in his mortal flesh by God, according to his supreme love for humankind, in uninterrupted repentance, insatiable longing, and absolute Hezekiah. The region of the holy mountain, called Dread Kurulia, received the athlete of Christ, who knew the Lord of glory, who could distinguish the difference between uncreated and created, and who was seeking unceasing perfection without end. Although the place was dread, it dreaded the labor and toil of this holy man, his diligent unceasing prayer by day and by night, the weeping and lamentation that issued from his entire being, his spiritual repentance to the point of self-hatred, as he prayed with the psalmist, my tears were my bread day and night, when they said to me each day, where is your God? Psalm 42, 4. Because streams of tears are more eloquent than any orator, according to the ascetic saying written on the tomb-like monastic schema. What is said of the Hezekist St. John the Sabaite could be said of him too. He lived there as a Hezekist in a cave for six years, the blessed elder Sophroni for longer than this, removing himself from all human contact, desiring to converse with God in Hezekiah and to purify his mind's sight by protracted philosophy, so as to reflect with unveiled face the glory of the Lord, and making every effort to advance from glory to glory by the longing for higher things. On the holy mountain and in the desert, there he experienced the unrestrainable energy of repentance according to God and for God, which had been kindled by the vision of the living God, knowing his inexpressible love for humankind and his infinite mercy. This blessed elder's repentance was divine, not human in nature and form, and recalls the words spoken by St. John of Sinai, a penitent is the maker of his own punishments. Thus the God-loving elder experienced by grace the flames of hell, being the creator by grace of his own punishments. He was unsurpassed in the path of profoundest repentance and could repeat with the psalmist, The pains of death have surrounded me. The pains of Hades encircled me. And my soul draws near to Hades. I am counted among those who go down into the pit. I am like a helpless man free among the dead. The soul that is crushed and refined by true repentance like dough or flour is in some way united and, so to speak, mixed with God, through the water of unfeigning mourning, from which, lighting the Lord's fire, blessed, unleavened, and lowly humility is baked into bread and becomes firm. Hence the elder's words coming from true praxis and exact repentance are substantial bread for the nourishment of those who wish to enjoy the bread that came down from heaven, which is Christ. From the published writings of this ever-memorable great elder, we can discern in a mirror dimly the God-pleasing struggle of this Hezekist monk with a keen sense of humor who surpassed the human measure, not only of the mortal body, but even of this finite human himself, this finite human existence, who not only desired to separate himself from all evil, but to be courageously unyielding, as the divine Dionysius the Areopagite says. Thus he acquired no little experience. In him was repeated to the extent that this is possible what the Apostle Paul says of Christ. For both the Apostle and the Elder had the same experience, the former in the desert of Arabia and the latter in that of Kerulia. Who, Christ, in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Hebrews 5.7 the blessed elder, too, offered up prayer and intense supplication in the desert of dread Kurulia with many tears and boundless mourning, and therefore he was heard by God and granted abundant spiritual gifts, particularly the charisma of theology, which is the greatest gift of all. Truly, life in Christ is not moral and religious life, but communion and union with Christ and through him with the triune God. What happened in Christ comes about to some degree in Christ's friends, as well, who are united with him. Paul, the great apostle of the Gentiles, 
says, It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Galatians 2.20 The friends of Christ lived this life, as St. Gregory the Theologian says. As we died in Adam, so we shall live in Christ, being born with Christ and crucified with him and buried with him and rising with him. For I must undergo the good reversal, and as painful things came from the more pleasant, so must more pleasant things return from the painful. Those who are united with Christ are born with him, crucified with him, descend to Hades with him, and rise again with him, becoming in Christ agents of salvation for the people and figures of indestructible life. When someone lives in Christ, no human or material passion lives in him, not pleasure, grief, anger, fear, cowardice, excitement, arrogance, insolence, resentment, envy, vindictiveness, avarice, nor anything else that defiles the soul by its contact with it, according to St. Gregory of Nyssa. Since God is love and beloved, who moves and thereby moves toward himself everything receptive of love, according to St. Dionysius the Areopagite and St. Maximus the Confessor, the one who loves God and is beloved of him longs incessantly for the ultimate object of desire, because God moves and is moved as thirsting to be thirsted for, and long to be longed for, and loving to be loved. For God is the ultimate desirable. Such a one is changed for the better, as his noose is caught up into the kingdom of heaven. As St. Maximus the Confessor says, his noose is caught up by the divine and infinite light, and he is not aware of himself, nor of anything else at all, but only of him who through love has brought about such radiance within him. This was the path, unerring and sure, but very difficult for the uninitiated and the weak, that blessed Sophroni followed by his prayers of his spiritual father, St. Silouan, with whom he shared the same spiritual experience and revelation. He was united with Christ. He lived his prayer in Gethsemane for the entire world. He was crucified with him, and he followed him to Hades, undergoing blessed and hallowed, self-emptying and tasting the flames of hell in his mortal flesh, not as a created event, but as a theological and a spiritual one. He saw the light of Christ's transfiguration and resurrection, and he knew Christ's divine ascension. The saint with the noose of an angel, Dionysius the Areopagite, says, We are persuaded that the divine Jesus is of transcendent fragrance and fills up our noetic faculty by distributions of divine delight that are perceptible to the noose. Therefore, too, he who is drunk with the love of God in this world, which is a house of lamentation, forgets all his sorrows and afflictions and becomes insensible to all sinful passions by reason of his inebriation, according to St. Isaac the Syrian. Blessed Elder Sophroni was also inebriated with this spiritual and sober inebriation on the holy mountain, and he became a spy of the uncreated commonwealth of the revelation, not of any abiding city, but of the city to come, the kingdom and reign of God. Being in a state of spiritual and vigilant intoxication, he moved to Europe, to Paris, and then to the United Kingdom, living the kingdom of heaven without ceasing in spiritual inebriation. Having beheld God in his uncreated light, the words of St. Simon the New Theologian, the elucidator of divine and heavenly things, were repeated in him as well. Quote, he who has the light of the All-Holy Spirit within him cannot bear the sight and falls prostrate to the ground. He cries out and shouts with amazement and great fear at seeing and experiencing something beyond nature, reason, and thought. He becomes like a man whose entrails have somehow been set on fire. Consumed by the flames and unable to bear the burning, he is, as it were, outside himself and cannot control himself, but pours out an ever-flowing flood of tears, which refreshes him and kindles yet more the fire of his longing. Thus his tears become more abundant and cleansed by their flood. He shines with a greater brilliance. Then entirely on fire he becomes like light, and the saying is fulfilled, God is united with gods and is known by them. Of them, per 
because perhaps he is already united to those who are attached to him and revealed to those who have known him. End of quote. This hallowed man was very greatly blessed by holy God and was counted worthy not only to pass through Christian asceticism and reach its ultimate height in profoundest repentance and contrition, but to climb the holy mount itself, the mount of divine vision, and to see the glory of the uncreated light in the deified flesh of the word. Thus he became a pure empirical theologian, according to the words of St. Gregory the theologian, who said, To philosophize about God is not for everyone, but for those who have been tested and are past masters in theoria, and more importantly have undergone, or at least the very least are undergoing, purification of soul and body. As befitted the name Sophroni, which means chaste in Greek, he lived chastely, justly, and piously, experiencing and awaiting the kingdom of God. But he also made many others chaste, who came from every race, tongue, and nation, thus becoming a universal teacher and escorting many to the bridal chamber adorned for the marriage of the Lamb of the Revelation. This Holy Father, greatly revered by holy men pleasing to God, such as the ever-memorable Elder Porphyrios and many others, has left us with the memory of a saintly ascetic and the gentlest of fathers, a discerning elder and a great theologian, who lived the Church's sacred tradition concerning the Orthodox way of speaking about God, but who was also remarkable for the virtue of discretion, which according to the saint of the latter is the knowledge which is within by divine illumination, and which can enlighten with its lamp what, it dark, what is dark in others. Through his God-pleasing way of life and his exalted theology, he also became a spiritual magnet, drawing a host of people, both from academia and secular learning, and from among members of the church of every age and condition. He became a teacher of all in word and deed, in conduct and love, in a variety of teachings and unceasing prayer. The writings of this blessed father, particularly the book, We Shall See Him As He Is, which has been translated into very many languages and brings about spiritual changes and conversions to the Orthodox Church, demonstrate the truth of the statement that he possessed supreme knowledge of the spiritual mysteries of life in Christ in his own extraordinary way. Because this ever-memorable man had a capacious noose and reason, as well as many different intellectual gifts, he became in our time an exact teacher of this noetic, hesychistic, and deifying work in life by reason of the experience he had gained from the coming and concealments of God's grace. For he proved to be a true teacher and theologian of the self-emptying life of Christ, the path of keeping his commandments, the mystery of the ways of salvation, spiritual mourning, the light of God and its discernment from every other light that comes from the devil, the hypostasis of God, and many other great teachings of the true empirical theology of the Orthodox Church. I knew this apostolic father in person for 17 years, and I delighted and still delight in the streams of his theological teaching. From him I heard apostolic words, I saw proof of the evangelical life, I sensed his God-pleasing way of life as far as I was able to bear it, and thus I glorify God for this great gift, which was kept in store for me, unworthy as I am. In truth, we saw his fatherly and pure love for us, which was kept safe in the hidden treasure house of his heart. I loved him greatly, and I was more greatly loved by him. Rather, he first loved us, 1 John 4.19. Hence I repeat the words of the bishop whose name I share, Bishop Herotheus of Euripus, writing to Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, For I am tormented by my longings and affections and loves for you, clinging to your love as the fond ivy clings inseparably to the trees, winding itself around them. The decease of this Holy Father was truly a saintly consummation in the Lord, in extreme old age. By his intercessions, may God have mercy upon us and save us. Amen. Appendix Timeless Revelance. Timeless Revelance. From 1976, when I visited the monastery of St. John the Baptist in Essex for the first time, 
the personality of Archimandrite Sophroni Sakharov, the former abbot of the monastery and spiritual father of the monks, made a great impression on me. I found in him the elements of a great father of the church who was living in our time. As was to be expected, from then on I continually referred to him in my talks and in written texts. I used him as an example of a human being who, after having had various adventures and particularly after having been involved in Eastern mysticism, came to know God personally. By way of an appendix, I shall refer to texts that I have written from time to time and which have been included in my books published to date, so that the reader can look them up and complete the picture given by the present book. 1. The Elder of the Monastery In 1976, when I returned from England, I wrote an article entitled An Orthodox Presence, which was published in the periodical Parish Priest and later in the book Time to Act. This piece presents the whole atmosphere of the monastery, set out in five chapters. 1. Orthodox Monasticism. 2. The Elder of the Monastery. 3. The Brethren of the Monastery. 4. Everyday Life at the Monastery. and 5. Life at the Monastery on Sundays. The second of these chapters refers to Father Sophroni and will be summarized here. First of all, it explains that in Orthodox teaching, an elder is someone who has suffered divine things and learned divine things, and because he has extensive experience of the spiritual life, he's able to cure monks and different people who turn to him. Next, a few biographical details of Father Sophroni are recorded from his birth, his move to Paris, and his ascetical life on the holy mountain. The article quotes the introduction written by Rosemary Edmonds for his book, His Life is Mine, which she translated from Russian into English. Rosemary Edmonds, an English woman who knew French and Russian, was an official translator for the president of France, Charles de Gaulle, during the Second World War. She had also translated books by Dostoevsky into English. Impressed by the personality of Father Sophroni, she was baptized Orthodox and translated many of his writings into English. In her introduction, she sets out Father Sophroni's quest and his personality. What she writes at the end of her text is significant. Quote from Introduction to His Life is Mine. The hours celebrating the liturgy give the day its sense and heart. He lives the liturgy not in abstract fashion, but by commitment and loving in the very thick of human suffering. He is full to the brim with awareness of God. Often he gives the impression of a man in touch with unknown modes of being, who sees light deep in the silence. He is clear, merciful and severe in his judgments, which st stimulate one to new insights. He has the hard and gentle eyes of an ascetic. For him, Creation is another word for hope. If a man possesses only what he gives away, the author of this book is blessed indeed. End of quote. In my short presentation, I also recorded two characteristic features as I saw them of Father Sophroni. The first is that Father Sophroni is a bearer of the Orthodox tradition because after great asceticism and experience, he acquired a patristic way of thinking, dogmatic consciousness, and he brings the spirit of the fathers into our era. The other is that he has great love, which is essential for handing on that tradition. It is well known that in order for someone to receive the tradition, he must search out a bearer of the tradition and submit himself to him. And for someone to pass on the tradition, he must be familiar with it, and there must be people who wish to receive it. In this article, I also describe my first impressions of the discussions that I had had with Father Sophroni and of the way in which he celebrated the liturgy. 2. Living Theology In July of 1992, I wrote an analysis entitled Living Theology of Father Sophroni's book, We Shall See Him As He Is, when this was published in Greek. I had the particular blessing of reading it at Father Sophroni's suggestion in manuscript when it was being translated from Russian into Greek by Father Zacharias. I remember that during the summer, when I was reading the text, I felt I was reading writings by St. Simeon the New Theologian. Having become familiar with the spirit of the book, not only from having read it previously, but also from discussions 
I had had with Father Sofroni, I wanted to tell Greek Christians about the precious treasure contained in it. In this article, written while the elder was still alive, I gave particular emphasis to five points. The first point referred to the fact that we shall see him as he is, is the elder's spiritual autobiography in which he confides to members of the church the gifts bestowed on him by God. This spiritual autobiography describes the illuminations of the Holy Spirit in the Father Sophroni's heart, which are recorded with extreme humility and self-accusation. The Holy Fathers were often compelled during their lifetime to use their spiritual experience to bear witness to the Church's teaching for the benefit of Christians. The second point is that the book describes the extraordinary experience that the Elder acquired, beginning with the charisma of mindfulness of death and going as far as theoria of the uncreated light. It describes remembrance of death, holy mourning, and how it is distinguished from psychological mourning, the divine light and how it differs from demonic light and the Church's teachings on the advent and concealment of divine grace. The third point is that it presents in a unique way the teaching about the hypostases of the triune God through the experience of the uncreated light. The fourth point that is underlined is that the book analyzes many different subjects, such as the grace of mindfulness of death, the fear of God, spiritual mourning, the quest for the unwavering, the privilege of knowing the way, the summation of our spiritual life, spiritual liberty, divine inspiration, self-emptying and God-forsakenness, love to the point of self-hatred, the uncreated light, the hypostatic principle in the Godhead and in the human being, liturgical prayer, liturgical language, the prayer of Gethsemane and the prayer in which God is revealed as truth. What is significant is that these issues are analyzed through the mature and living theological and ascetic word of Father Sofroni. The fifth point underlies the value of the language used by Father Sofroni, which does not allow the reader to read hurriedly, but helps him to pray. Finally, I glorified God for this new gift and expressed my gratitude to Father Sofroni for the help he gives our nation by offering us this living testimony. I wrote, reading this book, I easily reached the conclusion that Pentecost is the highest degree of the revelation, and also that in every age there are those who participate in Pentecost. There are always witnesses to the revelation. I believe that this book, which is the fruit of ecclesiastical experience, will be adopted by the Church as its own, as it is an expression of its life, and that it will use it to nourish those who hunger and thirst for God's righteousness. 3. Elder Sophroni's personal participation in the mystery of the cross. This was one chapter of a long title, a longer text entitled The Mystery of the Cross and the Teaching of the Apostle Paul in Relation to the Experience of Elder Sophroni, which was originally published in 2001 in the volume Paul, First After the One, by the Publications Department of the Communication and Educational Service of the Church of Greece, and later in my book, Orthodox Monasticism as the Way of Life of Prophets, Apostles, and Martyrs. This text sets out the meaning of the mystery of the cross according to St. Isaac the Syrian and St. Gregory Palamas. As is well known, the mystery of the cross is the uncreated grace and energy of God that created and directs the world, but also saves human beings by reconciling them with God through the power of Christ's cross and resurrection. It then explains how the mystery of the cross is understood in the teaching of the Apostle Paul, namely that the mystery of the cross is participation in God's energy that purifies, illumines, and deifies man. After that, it sets out Elder Sophroni's personal participation in the mystery of the cross. In other words, the personal experience of the cross and resurrection as Father Sophroni lived it. It refers in particular to repentance, This is the path by which the kingdom of God comes and the way leading to the revelation of God which brings awareness of eternal life. A few extracts from Father Sophroni's book, We Shall See Him As He Is, are cited, which show that the elder lived within the limits of his personal life the repentance and vision of the kingdom of God that the Apostle Paul experienced. 
For this reason, Father Sophroni in his writings interpreted passages from the Apostle Paul in an amazing and original way. This was because he had the same experience as the Apostle Paul, as he too had sought God outside Christ, had shown great repentance in the desert, and had lived the kingdom of God. 4. On Prayer, the new book by Archimandre Sophroni. In January 1994, I commented on the elder's book on prayer, which had been published then in Greek. Prayer is the principal distinguishing feature of Christians, as it is connected with man's spiritual rebirth and his union with God. It is linked with many spiritual states, such as repentance, weeping, self-accusation, grace-filled despair, and the knowledge of God. Commenting on Father Sophroni's book on prayer, I wrote that this book is a special blessing from God because it is the author's spiritual experience and not a collection of patristic extracts. I emphasize that in an age when many people do not pray and others want to pray but do not know what true prayer is, this book by Father Sophroni is a real bombshell that explodes all the poor imitations of the Christian life that we have created and all the corrupt interpretations of Christianity. At the same time, however, it is a very blessed bombshell that opens up the horizons of our spirit. It shows us what Christianity is. Thus, this book creates a new world. Father Sophroni is a real teacher of prayer because he experienced prayer in its truest form. His book is divided into three parts. The first part refers to prayer and is divided into specific chapters, such as prayer and ever new creation, prayer the way to knowledge, prayer overcomes the dead end of tragedy, and on the painful prayer by which man is reborn into eternity. Prayer leads to the knowledge of God and makes man thirst for eternal life. Father Sophroni stresses in particular that prayer is painful because on the one hand man is reborn slowly, and on the other hand his life on earth is extremely short. Second part of the book discusses the Jesus prayer the dogmatic value of the name of Jesus, as the elder experienced it within the limits of his personal life and the asceticism of prayer. In the third and final part, Father Sophroni describes the spiritual life and the work of the spiritual father. In analyzing this book based on experience, I underlined the value of prayer for the departed and the sick, according to Father Sophroni. In conclusion, I wrote, when someone reads this book, it gives him inspiration especially if he knew the elder in person. His noose clings for days and hours to the atmosphere of the analysis of these experiences. His noose is captivated by obedience to Christ. He feels great love for Christ, who became man and sacrificed himself for us to make it possible for us to live this life, but also love and admiration for Father Sophroni, who did not hesitate to step into the abyss of darkness and of Hades, who burned for years on end in the fire of hell, and thereafter enjoyed the theory of paradise. He prayed powerfully and wondrously while living on earth. In fact, he was a fiery prayer for the whole world. I believe that now he prays much more. We too set our hope on these supplications of the saints. These supplications are our hope and our consolation. 5. From the morning watch until night. In February 2003, I spoke in the Cathedral of the Holy Protection Vale in Edessa at the invitation of His Eminence, Metropolitan Joel of Edessa, on the subject, From the Morning Watch Until the Night. The talk was published in the book, Hezekiah in Theology. This talk was divided into three parts. The meaning of the verse from the Psalms, Elder Sophroni, and Elder Sophroni's Prayer at Daybreak. Following an analysis of the verse of the, from the Psalms, from the morning watch until the night, according to the teaching of the fathers, the talk goes on to present the figure of Father Sophroni, who was remarkable for his great impetus toward God and his continuous inspiration. According to the analysis of his disciple, Archimandrite Zacharias Zacharu, Father Sophroni's fundamental teaching was that man ought to ascend from the psychological level to the ontological or spiritual level. There are two ways in which this ascent comes about, the ascetic path and the charismatic. 
The elder also used to speak continuously about inspiration and actually said, quote, one cannot live as a Christian without inspiration. If an artist, a true one, lives night and day with the images of his art, then we Christians should be still more attentive. We must go further than artists in our efforts to live according to the spirit of the gospel. This presentation is followed by an analysis of Father Sophroni's prayer at daybreak. This is an important text written by the elder while he was living in the desert of the Holy Mountain in Dred Kurulia and is about hallowing the day. It is a prayer that has within it longing for rebirth and yearning to encounter Christ. In this prayer, we see the personal relationship between the one praying and God, as well as profound self-accusation, a plea for God's blessing on the whole day, the healing of the will, and eschatological prayer. It is clear from the text of this prayer that the way in which a Christian prays reveals the degree of his spiritual life, but also the transformation of his whole being. 6. The Theology of Elder Sophroni In September 2000, I commented on the book by Akomendred Zacharias Zacharu, Christ, Our Way in Our Life, a presentation of the theology of Archimandrite Sophroni, which is based on his doctoral thesis submitted to the Faculty of Theology at the University of Thessaloniki. This is a very significant book because it is an authoritative presentation of Father Sophroni's theology. I emphasized three points in particular. Firstly, Father Zacharias knew Father Sophroni personally and was with him every day, so he is an authoritative commentator. At the same time, he himself has inspiration, and he has studied Father Sophroni's theology from that perspective. The second point is that the, this book, Analyzing Father Sophroni's Theology, is a gospel for every Orthodox Christian, particularly for every monk, as it reveals what the spiritual life is and what it means to be a true monk. This is essential because in our time there is a confusion on many issues. The theology of Father Sophroni is expounded faithfully. The third point is that this book is a hymn to the lively theological message of Father Sophroni, but also a summary and distillation of his great theology. Father Sophroni lived the experience of the prophets, apostles, and fathers to the most intense degree. It should be added that this presentation of Father Sophroni's theology is divided into the following subjects. The hypostatic principle and its realization the kenosis of the Lord in the salvation of man, separation and restoration, the mystery of the ways of salvation, monasticism, the path of hesychism. From the th psychological to the ontological level, prayer is the fulfillment of creation and keep thy mind in hell and despair not. This book by Father Zacharias serves as a good introduction to the study of all Father Sophroni's writings. 7. The Chariot and Horsemen of the Israel of Grace The elder fell asleep in the Lord on the 11th of July, 1993. When they informed me of his death, I felt the urgent need to be present at the funeral service. Immediately afterwards, I wrote an article entitled, the Chariot and Horsemen of the Israel of Grace, which was published in the journal Ecclesiastical Truth and was later included as a chapter in the book Interventions in Contemporary Society. The title of the, the piece is taken from Holy Scripture and refers to Elisha's exclamation when he saw the prophet Elijah going up to heaven. Father, O oh Father, the Chariot of Israel and its horsemen, 4 Kings or 2 Kings 2.7. This quotation was used because Father Sophroni really was the chariot and horseman of the new Israel of grace in our age. I wrote in this text about the death of Father Sophroni, which was comparable with the death of the patriarchs and fathers. For that reason, I also called him the new patriarch of divine grace to the new people of God. I then referred to the funeral service and its contrite and festive atmosphere. I wrote, one saw his sacred remains in his simple coffin. The general impression was that his hand, which we venerated, was like amber, his fingers like bright sparkling beads, for it literally shone, as through the illumination were coming from within. 
His fingers were the color of ripe kints glistening like gold. I went on to refer to Father Sofroni's spiritual biography, his experience of hell and paradise, and I urged readers to study his writings, which are full of spiritual wisdom. Among other things I wrote, I retain many memories. I heard patristic words from his mouth. I tasted eternal life. He initiated me into the depths of orthodox theology. I felt profoundly moved by his love, which often burnt me, but also introduced me to the inner mysteries of the spiritual life. How could anyone forget the lively theological discussions as we walked along? How could anyone forget the sweet theological words in his office, which you felt pouring over you like honey? How could anyone forget his divine liturgies full of contrition, especially when one concelebrated with him? How could anyone forget his humility, which made one speak in front of him and then embrace him? Father Sofroni had deep humility, limitless love, great nobility, and exalted theology. I have never heard such a profound analysis of the value and importance of the Word of God. To acquaint readers with Father Sofroni's personality, I recorded some of the things I discovered during my long contact with him. Firstly, I ascertained that Father Sofroni combined theology and spiritual fatherhood very harmoniously. He was a great theologian whose theology flowed from divine vision, but at the same time, he was a spiritual father who regenerated people in the light of what he knew. Since he was a God-seeing theologian, he also had the gift of bringing spiritual birth to his spiritual children. The next thing I realized was that Father Sofroni took an interest in things that were of concern to people, such as bringing up children and so on. But his noose was on another level, attached to God and free from all imagination. He directed people from another perspective. He came down to the human level and in some way experienced self-emptying and incarnation, but subsequently he raised people up to exalted levels. In this way, we understand the purpose of the incarnation of the word, which was God's self-emptying and man's deification. A third discovery was that Father Sofroni was a Catholic, a universal theologian. His theology was not fragmented. He did not have a theology of his own, but he was inspired by the theology of the Holy Spirit, which has fullness and is the theology of the church. He would speak about noetic prayer, but at the same time about liturgical life. Thus, noetic prayer did not detract from the divine liturgy, nor did the divine liturgy replace noetic prayer. These two liturgies reinforced each other. That Father Sofroni was deified is clear from his written word which is preeminently paternal and regenerates people from the fact that he is not enclosed within national or any other divisions and from the fact that his prayers were very powerful and even accomplished miracles. At the end of this piece, I quoted the prophet Isaiah's words, Blessed is he who has seed in Zion and kindred in Jerusalem, Isaiah 31.9. And I expressed my joy that we belong to the Orthodox Church, that we have kindred in the Jerusalem on high and seed in Zion. I also stressed that the strength of Father Sophronius' theological message is truly a mighty seed on earth. According to the words of the king, prophet David, his seed shall be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Psalm 112.2 8. Elder Sophroni on the 10th of March, 1994, a few months after Father Sofroni's glorious decease, the theologian and journalist Manolios Melinos invited me to the Church of Greece radio station to speak about this great figure. During the discussion, I was asked various questions about how I met Elder Sofroni, about his wanderings in Buddhism before God revealed himself to him, his move to the Holy Mountain from Russia, his life in Paris, the asceticism that he practiced on the holy mountain, the uncreated light, his relationship with St. Silouan, what exactly is meant by the experience of hell and paradise and how the elder lived it in his personal life, and about my own experience of acquaintance with him. In answer to these questions, I also set out his biographical details, but mostly I described the spiritual experience that he had acquired and which he taught. 
At the end of the discussion, I was asked to say a few of the things that I had heard from him. Among other things, I mentioned the hypostases, his teaching that the one who beholds God can pass on the experience, so that theology becomes narrative, and that we ought not to spy on ourselves. The value of the divine liturgy, love for monasticism, and keeping the commandments of Christ. Because the day when the discussion took place was Clean Monday, the first day of Great Lent, I was asked what Father Sofroni would have said if he had asked him to say something on that day. Naturally, I answered that he would have spoken to us about repentance, which is a basic element of the Orthodox ethos. 9. The person as truth in the teaching of Elder Sofroni. The teaching about the person is an important element in Father Sofroni's theological and ascetical life. God person is truth, as opposed to the transcendental concept of God, and man is a person as regards his salvation and his deification. Father Sofroni spoke a lot about the person. This was the outcome of his personal searching and experience because in his early youth he had sought the supra-personal absolute in Eastern mysticism. The moment came, however, when God revealed himself to him as person with the words, I am that I am. Thus he arrived at the theology of the person as the unique truth through the experience of revelation. It should be also noted, although he used the term person, he always linked it with the hypostases and referred to God more often as hypostases. When Father Sofroni referred to the person hypostases, he would emphasize three points. The first is that God person, Theanthropos, reveals himself to man. The second is that God's revelation is connected with man's rebirth. And the third, that the person is expressed as love. In the teaching of Father Sofroni about the person hypostases, we also discover some interesting personal points contained in various expressions that, that the elder uses frequently, such as the hypostatic principle, the suprapersonal absolute, the darkness of divestiture, the darkness of ignorance, suicide in the metaphysical sense, with strong crying, and the dawn of the resurrection. Father Sofroni spoke and wrote about the person hypostases in God and in man as truth, because for him the truth is not what a thing, an idea, or something impersonal, but who the person hypostases. This knowledge is the fruit of revelatory experience. Thus, the person as truth is not interpreted in a philosophical or psychological way, but on the basis of divine vision and revelation. This teaching about the person as truth is significant because it is expounded by Elder Sophroni, a God-seeing ascetic, who beheld God through hesychistic and niptic experience. With the exception of the last, all the above are summaries of texts that I have published in various books currently in circulation. These summaries cannot, of course, cover all the content, and the reader can refer to the books that have been mentioned above and study the texts in full. The aim of this synopsis was simply to mention and put on record what I have written about them. These pieces show that I have had Elder Sophroni continuously in my mind from 1976 until today. I had gained great benefit from his words, and this was a way of encouraging my readers to acquaint themselves with the Elder and his theological message. Although I constantly spoke and wrote about him, at the same time I used to stress that I had not repaid my debt. I therefore promised that I would make a more thorough study of him and his teachings. In one of my articles I wrote, Of course, what is set out below does not exhaust the subject, and for that reason later on, I may perhaps publish a more detailed analysis of everything that I learned from his prophetic and theological mouth. The publication of the present book fulfills this promise.